Okay, folks, good evening and welcome to whatever today is, May 1st edition of the 25th City Council. All of our councils, councilors are present or will be with us shortly. Uh, Councilor Pena will be joining us by Zoom uh, later and she'll be excused if uh, we have any votes on the record until then. But as a reminder, because we have a Zoom uh, attendee this evening, we'll have to do roll call votes on all of our votes and so we'll work with our clerk to be sure that we can get those counted. Madam Vice President, would you take us away? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Civic, let's see, a moment of silence. I'm going to ask Councillor Basson to uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance in English and Councillor Sanchez in Spanish. Thank you. Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the, at the table near the chamber entrance. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting in person and on live streams through four different platforms, GovTV on Comcast Channel 16, the Gov, GovTV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the closed captioning services on your television or device at this time. The video recordings of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. The council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening, if needed. With regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks, and please no applause or outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are respectful of one another. Proclamations and presentations. Um, Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. We, we do have a, a pre presentation tonight. I think the folks that are here to give that in presentation, if you all would come on down for the regarding the environmental health proposal that's before the Air Quality Board. There was a PowerPoint presentation involved with this. I don't know if it got loaded or. Staff, do we have that? No. Presentation loaded for you all to do? OK. I, I do believe that, that the counselors have copies of that. OK. The what? Okay. Okay. Well, that's a small read for that. Well, no, this is just my copy. To read. Well, no, this is mine. 
Uh, my name is Paul Wade, and I've been an air quality consultant for more than 29 years and an Albuquerque resident for more than 40. I want to thank Council Lewis for inviting me to discuss the proposed environmental justice air quality regulation and the effects on business growth in Bernalillo County. I'm here to represent the construction materials industry such as asphalt, concrete, and aggregate. Uh, the, the present air quality permitting process includes determining emission rates based on maximum operating scenarios proposed in the permit application. Once the emission rates are calculated, they are then input into EPA's dispersion model to determine impacts to the public from pollutants that have an ambient air quality standard. The dispersion model performs an accumulative impact analysis, including the maximum pollutant concentration from the facility uh, requesting the air permit, the maximum emission rate for neighboring sources that emit the same pollutant, and the monitored ambient concentration background that represents the permit site for the pollutant. If ambient standards are exceeded, then either limiting the facility process or additional controls will be required to meet ambient standards or the permit will not be issued. These ambient standards are based on scientific and medical data that is designed to protect the most sensitive populations. Environmental justice is a fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respects to development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Uh, EPA defines an overburdened community as um, minority, low income, tribal, or indigenous populations or geographic areas in the U.S. that potentially experience disproportional environmental harm and risks. Uh, EV, EPA has developed a screening and, tool, and mapping tool, uh, which is called EJ Screen, which provides demographic, social, and environmental information to identify areas where additional work may be needed to protect environment and public health of minority, low income, tribal and other vulnerable communities by integrating environmental justice in all programs, policies, and activities. The proposed regulation that's been submitted to the Air Quality Board uh, consists of uh, regulate the objective states uh, consistent with the department's authority to prevent and abate air pollution. Mr. Wade, if I can interrupt you just for a minute, like, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is a fairly long presentation, and we have a long agenda, so I'm going to ask okay. you not to read it word for word. Okay. Counselors have a chance to do that, but if you can give us a summary and folks can ask questions, I think that would be a much better use of our time. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to allow a prolonged discussion here. We, we, this would be more appropriate for that at, uh, at the bill if we get to it this evening. Okay. Mr. President, Mr. President so there's, there's like three or four more slides, actually. I know it looks like a longer presentation, but um, uh, the bulk of it are some, some maps and yeah. some slides. And, and I think so that's fine, Councilor. I just, reading word for word is going to take us a long time here. And just I think a couple more a slides, long, so. I think, where it's, where it's mostly the context, okay. though. But thanks. Uh, we'll skip forward to uh, the maps. Um, well, the, the definition of overburdened community means any census tract. Uh, or conti contiguous census tract where the combined emission, permitted emissions from all sources are 10 tons of hazardous or 25 tons of combined criteria and hazardous. So that's the defini definition in the proposed regulation for an overburdened community. Uh, and then a permit shall be denied if it meets the definition of an overburdened community where, where the permit wants to be located. Uh, the first map. Uh, shows all the census tract that meet the definition of overburdened community shaded brown due to exceeding a combined emission rate for criteria pollutants in HAPS greater than 25 tons per year. A reminder that contiguous tracts are also considered an overburdened community. Uh, this map shows the census tracts that meets the definition of an overburdened community shaded brown due to exceeding HAPS uh, emissions greater than 10 tons per year.
This map shows uh, the, the commercial industrial zoning in northern Albuquerque. This is the same map shaded gray where the census tracts are defined as overburdened community. And if you remember overburdened communities, you cannot, permits shall be denied. Here's the commercial industrial zoning for in southern Albuquerque. And the same, uh, that areas shaded gray are census tracts that are defined as overburdened communities. So no additional permitted facilities can operate in those areas. Uh, this table shows uh, if the proposed regulation is adopted, it would reduce the zoned area of manufacturing by over 90% and commercial development by over 50%. Uh, environmental justice regulations are being developed all over the country. The policies and regulations are involving all stakeholders as re recommended by EPA. Uh, a review of these regulations will provide a framework for an effective regulation uh, for Bernalillo County. And finally, uh, every community deserves equitable health and environmental protection. Uh, to achieve these goals, communities must have a regulation that will stand the test of time, regulations crafted in a transparent process that relies upon diverse shareholder participation or stakeholder participation, an understanding of the cause and effect of air pollution, a respect for the constraints placed upon a regulatory agency, and a well-conceived solution to the problems to be solved. <coughs> the debates, analysis, and investment in time needed for this pro proposed regulation to proceed will not weaken it, but in instead help to ensure its effectiveness. And I want to thank the City Council for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, Councilors, any questions? Well, Madam Vice Chair, um, and Mr. Wade, thank you for um, for speaking tonight. And this is a bill that's on the agenda tonight. It allows the the, um, the the city council to weigh in on something that we just wouldn't normally have a chance to weigh in on uh, with the Air Quality Board. And so, um, uh, you know, the um, uh, the business community won't just want it's an opportunity to be able to take some time to give a presentation as they, they don't often get, especially on the Air Quality Board and their procedures. Uh, to be able to have the time other than just a brief few minutes uh, to be able to explain that position. But Mr. Wade, would, would you just, if, if you could summarize, uh, you know, talk to us about the, uh, this proposal before the Air Quality Board. How would you summarize it within, you know, just a, 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 you know, a paragraph of okay. uh, this is what it does and uh, this is the effects that this, this proposal would have on our community? Yeah, as it, as it is presently written and submitted to the Air Quality Board, and again, this is a proposed regulation that they're going to be having a hearing for. Um, the issue is the methodologies they're using to define what an overburdened community is, is very restrictive. It's based on a mass emission rate instead of um, who's actually living there. Uh, so as you can see on the maps that I showed, that most of the county, uh, it would be considered an overburdened community with reflect, with re, reflected in this, app, in this proposed regulation. Um, it, it's just going to basically uh, restrict any kind of new businesses coming in or any businesses that want to modify their permit from, from being able to do that. Um, so it, it, I think the intent is good as far as um, trying to show or um, improve the health of communities or areas of Albuquerque that are overburdened with pollution, uh, but it needs to be done in a more thoughtful process with all s stakeholders involved, which it wasn't uh, 
for this, this proposed regulation, the industry was not involved at all. Thank you. Councillor Fiebelkorn. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I guess this is probably for city legal. Um, it's my understanding this is a case before the Air Quality Control Board right now. Is that true? Councillor Davis, Councillor Fiebelkorn, yes, that's correct. Uh, this was a petition filed back in November. Um, and uh, so it's currently pending. The hearing has not been scheduled. And so the correct response, Madam Ch Vice Chair, um, to get information to the Air Quality Board, which is the board that was appointed by this city and this, uh, this city council, um, to have any kind of say in that case would be to go and participate in that process at the Air Quality Board, correct? Co correct. There is opportunity for the public to participate in that process. Okay. Uh, it, I don't believe anything's been scheduled yet, but it will be. Thank you, um, Madam Vice Chair. So I just I feel that this is an inappropriate use of city council time. This is a case that is currently being heard by a board of experts, and I will just go on a limb here and say no one up here is qualified to be hearing this case. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that this would be better. A better use of time would be to actually intervene in that case before the Air Quality Control Board and take your issues to them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you. Mr. Wade, I have a question. I know you said it's really going to impact um, businesses. And since you're here, just curious as to what kind of businesses um, this is going to impact. It sounds like it's quite a few businesses or a few different types of businesses. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah. The, the, I mean, the zoning maps that I showed um, mark out uh, business parks, uh, commercial zoning, general manufacturing, light manufacturing. Um, those are the ones that we identified when we created this, this overlay. Any so, restaurants or anything like that? Does I don't, that, I don't I think I, and we weren't trying to look at restaurants. We were looking at more of industry uh, businesses that may come into uh, Albuquerque and wanted to, to locate here, even if it's a, a, a general manufacturing facility. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Councilor Lewis? Madam Vice Chair, I, since the, the question was asked to the, to the city attorney, um, there, there is no, uh, as far as this, this, this being brought up, either on the council agenda tonight or a presentation by folks from our community, I believe that, that uh, our, our legal would say there's absolutely nothing inappropriate whatsoever about this being discussed. If, they, if the city attorney knew our, our rules of procedure and, you know, for, uh, for the city council, and, and I'm not asking you to weigh in on that because I think I know what your answer is, that there's absolutely nothing inappropriate about a topic like this, especially a topic that affects businesses, um, our economy, um, a policy that's before the Air Quality Board, uh, that uh, with members that we appointed. Uh, certainly there's nothing ex parte. Uh, certainly there is nothing uh, that we cannot talk about or discuss uh, within the council. And so, so later on the council will have an opportunity to be able to weigh in on this, to learn a little bit more about it, uh, and to make some opinions on it. And certainly the administration does too. In fact, I, I think it's extremely important for the administration to, uh, to weigh in uh, on this this, this incredibly restrictive proposal uh, that will hurt our economy tremendously. And by the way, I can think of a whole lot of other topics uh, that this council deals with night after night that's absolutely worthless, you know, compared to a topic like this. So, Mr. Wade, thank you for coming down. I know thank we're going to hear from some other folks a little bit later as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, Councillor Bassan. Madam Vice Chair, I would like to read a proclamation that was begun by Councillor Pena, who is remote tonight. But today in the chambers, accepting the proclamation for Professional Municipal Clerks Week, we have Ethan Watson, the city clerk, Marion Diemer, deputy city clerk, Camille Chavez, assistant city clerk, and Ashley Santistevan Records, center manager, if they'll all come to the front. I do want to take a quick moment to also recognize Mandy Enohos from council staff who does perform many functions of the municipal clerk. 
Whereas the office of the professional municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of professional municipal clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the pro professional municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas professional municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas the professional municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, and whereas professional municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the professional municipal clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international pro professional organizations, and whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Professional Municipal Clerk, and be it proclaimed that the Council, the governing body of the City of Albuquerque, hereby proclaims the week of April 30th through May 6th, 2023, as Professional Municipal Clerks Week. So thank you for being here. Thank you for all you do. Um, and if you would like to say anything, you're welcome to. Um, uh, Council President, uh, uh, Council Bassan, thank you for this recognition. Uh, professional Municipal Clerks Week is a hallowed week in the life of the professional municipal clerk. We are excited to, that the council is recognizing this holiday. Um, it, we do, we are very busy. You know, we're just about to start the election cycle and uh, we're uh, the records management responsibilities of the clerk's office and our hearing office um, do keep us busy throughout the year and we are always just very excited to for the council to highlight our work. Uh, we held hundreds of hearings last year under various city ordinances. We scanned over one million records last year for the first time ever, and we responded to over 10,000 public records requests. So it has been a busy um, year, and we're looking forward to what comes this year. So. Madam Vice Chair, I just want to challenge anyone to say professional municipal clerks three times fast and see if you can get <laughs> through it. But again, thank you so much for all that you do for the city. Thank you. Mr. President, okay, thank you. Thank you all. Okay, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, next, we have a presentation by Lieutenant uh, Chris Patterson and Sergeant Eric Nelson from the Metro Traffic Division. APD regarding the noise camera pilot program. Good evening, Mr. President and Council. So, uh, my name is Lieutenant Patterson from Metro Traffic Division. We were tasked with oh, uh, we were tasked with researching the uh, speed. Or sorry, the noise cameras uh, for the city. We were able to locate three uh, cities that currently use uh, noise cameras. They were Knoxville, Tennessee, New York, New York, and Longmont, Colorado. They are in use in the UK. However, their due process rules don't come in line with American standards, so we didn't dive too much further into the UK's method of issuing those violations. Um, it's important to realize out of those uh, three cities we looked at, a lot of this is still in the developmental stage for the, the noise cameras. Um, Knoxville, Tennessee is, was conducting a one month pilot program in which they were collecting data. Um, they did not issue any citations during that time period. Um, the next big one that did go forward was New York. New York does have an active program. It's not run by their police department. It's actually going through their environmental health department. And the way that they issue citations, if, if a vehicle comes through, um, it's issued a, a notice. That vehicle then has to come in and do an inspection. And if the inspection shows that that vehicle was, in fact, the one that had that noise violation, it's issued a fine. Oh, sorry, we're, I was going to over you. You go through the slides. OK, I apologize with that. Go ahead, go to the next slide, sir. And one more. Um, so I apologize, I was going a little quick there. So with Knoxville, Tennessee, they started looking at the noise cameras due to the complaints from the downtown residents. 
Um, they wanted to free up sworn officers' time, and then that pilot program uh, was held by the city's policy team. Um, the Knoxville Police Department was not involved at all. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so they're using the Intelligent Instruments Limited. That's a company that runs out of the United Kingdom. Um, they had a trial period for 40 days, and then they're looking at purchasing more cameras in the future. Um, next slide, sir. So during that pilot program, Knoxville did not issue any citations. They used that for data collection. Uh, and again, they're, they're looking at trying to develop a, a system to issue citations in the future. Next slide. One more slide. One more slide. All right. Um, so approximately 75% of noise events triggered a picture of the license plate. Um, their camera was, the way they had it set up wasn't able to de definitively identify if there was, offending if there was multiple offending vehicles. Um, so it works great if there's one vehicle, but if there's two, they can't differentiate between the two like we can with speed cameras. Um, so with those citations, or if there was multiple vehicles, they were just uh, taken out of um, the queue and they were not reviewed or any citations were issued for those vehicles. Um, those the cameras do not pick up voice conversations or music. They did have some concerns um, having the ability to hear people talk um, or hear music coming from them, but they don't have that technology. So just for the council's um, awareness. They do have a customer support, but there is a seven hour time difference between us and the United Kingdom. Um, I believe Sergeant Nelson at one point had to make a phone call at three o'clock in the morning to be able to talk to somebody there in the UK um, to get that, that uh, customer service. Next slide, sir. Um, they do have their city ordinance for noise violations um, that's based on decibel level of a motor vehicle, gross vehicle weight, and vehicle speed. And I believe that's similar to one of the um, variations we have here in the city of Albuquerque based off of a set decibel uh, limit. Next slide, sir. For Longmont, Colorado, uh, again, it was based off of city council and citizen concerns of uh, noise complaints in the area. And they also had the intent of freeing up uh, field officers for uh, other police duties. Next slide. Sir. They also went with the Intelligent Instruments Limited uh, in the fall of 2012, or sorry, 2022. They had two cameras that they tested, one on a four-lane freeway and one on a two-lane road. Um, their trial period lasted about one month, and they are looking at trying, a, trying to find a second vendor to do an additional trial. Next slide. Um, Longmont, again, did not uh, issue any citations. They did collect that data, and they used that to supplement a police patrol and used that to send officers into high um, time frame areas where they were having the most violations to do live enforcement. Um, it is in the development process um, to issue citations to violators, but again, they don't have anything in place, and they don't have a due process um, plan in place as well for how to issue citations for noise violations. That seemed to be a common thread that we noticed in our research. And they're working with their city's attorney's office to try and develop that due process plan. Next slide. Again, they utilize the decibel level. Um, they're set at 90 decibels. Um, primary issue they were dealing with multiple lane roadways with multiple vehicles traveling in the same way, similar to what we saw in Knoxville. Um, and also camera placement. Um, they had issues with uh, camera placement and the sun being able, not being able to clearly identify license plates. Um, and they saw about a 10% uh, rate of success on the four lane freeway with issuing what would have been a citation. And on the two lane roadway, they were seeing about a 33% rate of success on that they would issue a, a citation with, with certainty to, to have that stand up. Next slide, sir. They have two city ordinances. Um, the first is a general noise ordinance that sets the parameters for accessible decibel level. And the second um, was similar to our unreasonable noise where it sets a, a standard for a police officer to use in a layman sense of where they're positioned and the type of um, noise being extended. Motor vehicle noise such from a licensed uh, vehicle, you're looking at about 300 feet according to their city ordinances, what they, their um, criteria were. Next slide, sir. New York, New York, like I mentioned before, they probably have the most robust program 
um, but they're running out of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, camera activates when they detect noise in a distance of 50 feet or more um, at that 85 decibel level. They're then issued that notice to appear for a vehicle inspection, um, and then the vehicle's inspected, and if it passes, this, there's no fine. Um, we did notice in our review that there are several videos of people going through and cheating the inspection process so that they're not having to pay those fines. Um, that might be something that if it proceeds, we'll have to look at more. Um, and then that, again, the Department of, or Department of Environmental Protection, they deal with the uh, safety <coughs> of the air and noise code. It's the police department's not involved in that process as well. They're also using the Intelligent Instruments Limited. Um, they, for the time period we were able to get, they had about 2,000 citations that, or 2,000 noise events that were captured. 63% um, of those were found to be uh, cars or motorcycles. And out of those uh, 2,000 events, they would have issued, or they did issue 243 vehicles um, were issued those citations. So again, we're seeing about an 11% success rate with the noise cameras. We were able to locate two vendors. Again, the Intelligent Instruments, um, which is kind of the predominant one that we've seen. And then there's also a local company called Not Allowed LLC that operates here in Albuquerque, um, starting with the Intelligent Instruments. So they started in September of 2022, and they're in the UK. They do the audio, precision, accuracy, noise level, and video in two directions continuously. They're working on a second generation camera um, that is supposed to increase their accuracy, but that's still in the developmental process right now. Um, when an event is triggered, it sends an email through, and that um, event's reviewed by a person to see if it fits their criteria and if it's going to be accepted or rejected. So it has that human component to see if it's going to be approved. Um, it's similar to our LPR. They, they plug in with power, um, do a Wi-Fi transfer of the data and to a programming or to a software program that they have with another vendor. So that would be an additional cost that they issue the citations out for those violations. Um, their pricing for a four-week trial, it's 1500 bucks, and that costs the shipping to ship the camera from the United, K or the United Kingdom here to the United States. And for our personnel to install it, or the city personnel to install it, um, and they do that remotely. Um, after that, if we decide to rent the camera, they say it's a $4,400 monthly rent for the camera, and you purchase it, it's about $32,000 $32, per camera with a $500 a month um, servicing fee. And again, that is for the camera only, that is not for the software to issue citations going forward. Um, and then the city would be responsible for power and providing cellular data to facilitate the transfer of that information. Um, the local company, Not Allowed LLC, uh, it's owned by Nick Frederick. He's a professor at UNM. Um, it's been in the development process for two years, and he's currently conducting tests in the area of Tramway Boulevard. Um, he's able to monitor one lane and has to pull the information uh, manually. Uh, as when we spoke to him, uh, he does not have the ability to use the internet to send out and does not have software um, to issue the citations. Um, his units are solar powered, and he has not conducted any sort of pilot program uh, with a large scale department or city yet. Uh, we have talked with Novella Global, who does the automated speed, um, and they are very much in the infant stages of their, uh, their noise program. Open up for any other questions. Thank you, counselors. Any questions? Counselor Benton. Uh, thanks for the information, and thanks for the report, uh, Lieutenant and, uh, and uh, Sergeant, for your work on this. Um, yeah, it sounds like New York has the most robust program, and it's not even law enforcement uh, connected. Um, and it's interesting because I think when Councillor Bassan and Councillor Pena and I heard from a subject matter expert from, uh, from Roswell, I think it's Roswell PD, and a guy who kind of wears two hats, he's also a certified ASME mechanic and a, a, a retired Roswell PD traffic officer. And, and, and that was kind of his take was that... Um, we might want to be looking in that um, in that realm of there. There's a uh, 
an inspection notice where they've got to bring the vehicle in. They're not issuing a ticket. They're just saying you've got to bring the vehicle in and we're going to check it. And um, so we had, had some good discussions around that uh, with that gentleman. And, um, uh, and that might be a tie-in, too, to the, to the county emissions program or something like that. that, yes, that we've, got, we've got some things we're doing already that, where there could be a tie-in to this kind of work. And um, it sounds also like the, the technology, it's pretty limited. This, this uh, United Kingdom outfit is, is almost the only technological program besides the local guy who I think is also involved with them. So uh, but I think it's really important uh, information and we appreciate it and uh, you know it's pretty pretty low dollar for a trial I don't know it, I think that the trials in other cities have probably illustrated the same things we're going to find out at this point with the technology so uh, appreciate it. Thank you any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to administration question and answer period. Councilors, any questions? Councilor Peoplecorn. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I had some questions on the signing or the re signing of the Paris Climate Accord. Not sure who's here to answer those questions. Hello. Hey, Councilor John Craig, Director of General Services. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I was surprised on um, Earth Day to see that the mayor had re-signed the Climate Accord. Um, we signed it four years ago. What progress has been made um, in our greenhouse gas emissions for the city since that first signing? Mr. President, Council, I appreciate the uh, interest, obviously, uh, in what we're trying to do. The mayor did sign uh, the climate mayor's uh, National Climate Action Agenda is what he signed on to. Uh, that commits to us to uh, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions over uh, his administration and, and going forward. Uh, unfortunately, our sustainability officer, Kelsey Rader, is out of town and unable to be here tonight, so you got the poor man's replacement. I will try to answer uh, what we've done. Uh, as you know, last fall we introduced, we, we submitted our first climate action plan uh, that discusses the areas in which we're trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and there are six main areas that we're trying to do that in. Uh, over 55% of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings and energy used to power those buildings. Uh, and so we've really tried to focus on what we're doing in regards to making our buildings more energy efficient, as well as um, um, uh, trying to uh, introduce energy efficient programming while we're building new buildings and while we're upgrading those sites. So in terms of how much impact we've had on greenhouse gas emissions. The sustainability team is currently evaluating that. Uh, they have better numbers than I would have and, and be able to meet um, with you at any time to talk about those and the specific examples. But I know our focus on greenhouse gas emissions in our own buildings have uh, uh, accumulated uh, over 100,000 uh, um, CO2 savings uh, to date since we started measuring about two years ago. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So. Um, you would say that the majority of the focus of our emissions reduction is on city-owned buildings? Currently, that's our efforts that we're putting money towards. There are obviously other efforts going on throughout the city that we're trying to meet with our sustainability partners to understand better what they're doing so we can capture that data and include it in any of our reductions that we're putting forth. So uh, meeting with those, um, those partners that we have out in the community started last fall with the sustainability team meeting quarterly with our partners and trying to uh, get data from them on what it is they're trying to do in the community while we're focusing on our fleet, our canopy, as well as uh, buildings that we're reducing. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. So I specifically asked for a percentage reduction in greenhouse gases from the city's climate actions since the original accord was signed. Do we not have that information tonight? I don't have that information with me, again, because the sustainability office is unavailable and um, such a limited. We'd be happy to meet with you and talk about that and share our data. Right. Um, thank you. Madam Chair, I, I've had that question out for quite some time, but I did submit that in advance, so I was expecting an actual answer to my questions. Um, just real quickly, um, since we agree that buildings are the largest source of greenhouse gases in Albuquerque, does the city have um, a building electrification policy in place? 
I'm sorry, electrification policy? Building electrification policy in we place. Do, we have standards and guidelines developed through our uh, uh, Energy and Sustainability Office. Um, perhaps you've taken a tour of the brain, the Balanced Resource Acquisition and Information Network, uh, where we're tracking all of our energy usage throughout our buildings. Uh, in, in preparation for that, we have put in place standards that are, are required to be put in place any time a building is retrofitted or built. Madam Vice Chair, so there is no building electrification policy in place. I just went to a new building that's being built by the city of Albuquerque. It still is using fossil fuels. A building electrification plan would be a plan to make sure that all new buildings are electric only, and we would be starting to retrofit our existing buildings to be electric only. That's not in place. We do have a fleet electrification plan in place, but how many electric vehicles have been purchased by the city of Albuquerque? Does anybody know? Anyone from the administration able to answer these questions? 100% electric vehicles, we've purchased 10 currently. 10. Hybrid vehicles, we've purchased more than 150 since we started renewing so 10. this. 10, okay. Um, and how many electric buses do we have in place? Five buses were bought about a year ago with grant funding. And what building code are we on? Are we on the 2018 International Energy Conservation Code? I'm not familiar with, I'm not yes, uh, we are. knowledgeable of that. Um, and did the city on its own participate in the cumulative impacts planning at the Air Quality Control Board? And did they put forward a proposal to address this issue, which is before the Air Quality Board right now, that deals with environmental justice and fighting climate change? Do we have a city proposal out there on that issue? Anybody? Mr. President and, and Councillor, I would uh, defer to our Environmental Health Director to see if, what proposals we may or may not have made with the, to the board. <clears throat> Council President, uh, Councillor uh, Feeblecorn, uh, yeah, the, uh, to answer your question, we do have uh, regulation that we have drafted, you know, within the uh, the department. Um, one one thing that happened is that that petition went ahead of ours, and so right now we're trying to figure out. You know, we've never seen any dual petitions be be heard by the air board, but we are working with the community and we're working with the businesses. You know, to try to uh, bring them together. You know, if we go forward with the hearing, you know, to essentially bring everybody's ideas into what we think would be a modified version of what was presented. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'm glad to hear that we're doing something. Um, so I just want to say very clearly, and I would like my, my questions answered um, as soon as possible. We cannot continue to re-sign climate accords and say that we're doing things when we're not. We have, from what I can tell, and I was an advisor to that climate action plan, and I ask these questions every single time I speak to somebody that works in the city. From what I can tell, we have a policy that we're going to try to get to 100% renewable energy for the electricity that is being used in city-owned buildings right now. We have no policy to try to get rid of fossil fuel use in city buildings. We have no policy to electrify transportation. And we are behind the curve on just the basic thing of getting together a rulemaking for the Air Quality Control Board to deal with the drastic environmental consequences of not helping those folks in frontline communities that have serious health problems due to our lack of action. So I would really like those answers to those questions sooner than later, and I'd like our city to do a better job. If we're going to be out there signing and re-signing accords and claiming that we're doing well, we actually have to do well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, my question is for the administration, and since the mayor was so interested in contract tracing during COVID, um, I'm just curious as to why no one has contacted me. Um, I, along with other city councillors up here, went on a tour through the Gateway Center, and while well, it was fully being constructed, it was totally in um, in a in a situation where you could tell everything had been ripped out of it. Nobody's contacted me to let me know that if I, that I've been exposed. Nobody's let my uh, my actual analyst know if he's been exposed. Um, my guess is yes, 
because uh, the situation that we were in, we were in a dusty environment. Um, we were walked all the way through the construction site with hard hat on, hard hats on. We probably should have had proper PPE, and we didn't. Um, if we were exposed by asbestos, I hope that somebody will let us know um, that we were and follow through with the, with the proper protocol. And I also want to know how many people have been exposed, how many city employees, how many contractors, how many residents um, to that facility have been ex exposed um, to that area of the building. I'm pretty sure that I was um, in the middle of the construction. So I need that information. And if somebody can let me know that if I was exposed to start that proper protocol. Council President, Council President, Council, I assume you're mentioning the, the Gateway Center and the work that's going on there. Uh, we were notified about a, a month and a half ago uh, that the city went undertaking a uh, 4,000 square foot or so renovation in the under overnight bed area. Uh, we failed to notify and test for asbestos in that area. Uh, after the construction was complete and pulled out, we were finishing up. We were notified that that had not taken place, so we immediately stopped construction, went into the area, uh, identified a space of about 4,000 square feet of the 20,000 square foot office uh, renovation in that area of the entire 560,000 square foot area. Um, what we found is that last May 24th and 25th, the contractor working in that area went in and um, took out the tiling uh, in that area. What was found to be the case after the fact was that the tile glue that was glued, gluing that tile down was uh, in, indeed tested positive for asbestos containing materials. It was the black mastic under the tile. That tile had all been removed during that process over those two days. Uh, we have since uh, remediated any, uh, had firm come in and test the air quality in the area. Prior to remediation, they went in and remediated anything that they could find in there retested the site, and it, again, before and after, tested negative for any particles of asbestos. So what we're doing now is in the process of going back and trying to determine who might have been in the site during that uh, time frame when which those tiles were being disturbed. Uh, again, it wasn't the entire site. There's dust in every construction zone. It was a specific area uh, that was uh, constructed during those two days. Uh, we're working with asbestos experts, healthcare providers to determine what exactly that means for those who may have been in the area. We're also compiling a list of all those that we uh, understand to, could have been in the area during that time and, and obviously we'll be in touch with those that we feel as though we need to contact with. One of the other things I noticed when I was going through the tours, all we were provided was with a hard hat, that's it. Um, the areas between construction zones were not completely sealed off. There was maybe a piece of plastic dangling there, but it wasn't completely sealed off from the rest of the building. So it was still able to be, there's still exposure that could have happened throughout that whole entire building. Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, Councilor uh, Sanchez, yeah, the Environmental Health Department did a thorough uh, inspection of the site. You know, when we're notified, I mean, there's a notification process that, that has to happen throughout the county Anytime there's any demolition or renovation, and uh, you know the contractor is required to do the inspections for asbestos. Now, and I think there's there's sort of two kinds of asbestos, if you will. There's what uh, the regulations call ACM or asbestos-containing material, and then regulated asbestos-containing material. Um, you know, when we did the inspection, um, by that time everything had been cleared out. So essentially, we didn't find any asbestos-containing material. Period. Whether it was ACM or RACM in the area that was in question. And so, you know, but our inspection continued. And so, um, you know, uh, Director Craig is, is absolutely right. You know, we actually are going back and looking at the historical aspect of, of the issue, you know, and trying to find out who was present at the time. And keep in mind that at the time that the asbestos material might have been removed, it was a very specific time that happened, you know, roughly about a year or so ago. So, you know, if there was any, any um, visits or actually tours, after the fact, you know, then chances are that the exposure is nil, you know, um, like, like we found it, you know, we found primarily new material in the area. But nevertheless, you know, our inspection will be done, uh, reports should be done by Friday. 
Uh, and we do, just for the record, I mean, we do intend to issue some violations uh, based on what we found. Um, you know, our report's about a 52-page report that's thorough and essentially looks at all aspects of the project and the issues that were presented to environmental health. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Is there any concern also since the city's inspecting the city? So you actually have the city inspecting the city on this one. Uh, Are you pulling a different entity in to inspect so we're not, so there's not an appearance of impropriety with the city in inspecting the city? Oh, um, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, uh, no, we, we, we are a kind of a unique program. We're federally delegated program, so essentially the air quality program represents the EPA and not necessarily the city, uh, and they represent the Air Board, and again, not necessarily the city. Um, we're actually, we actually have a very good track record on enforcing actions against the city and the county, you know, so we don't hold back on, you know, on any, any, any action that we take, we assume that has a potential to either wind up in federal court or be appealed, you know, through the process. So we're very good about, you know, essentially keeping that, uh, you know, that separation uh, of powers, you know, between us and the city and the county for that matter, because we actually also regulate the county. But, uh, you know, you can look at our track record and we don't hold back if we have to issue fines. We've issued several fines, tens of thousands of dollars to the city. Thank you. Um, one more question. Um, when you, are you going to be in a position where you're going to at least do some sort of public service announcement to let individuals know who may have been in there to contact you or maybe a contact line, something for individuals of the public who might have had exposure is there anything in place? Council President, Councilor, I, I, I think your point is well taken, that it's very important to ensure that anybody who is at risk is notified of that. Uh, again, we're certainly uh, willing to do that and trying to figure out who that was at this time. I want to reiterate that it's a very large campus. There's a lot of construction going on in a lot of different places. What we've identified through testing in every area that we've tested is that this was a very isolated incident to that specific uh, encounter and who was in that area at that time. Uh, since then, we have tested areas that we are going to be uh, going under construction over the next two years. Those testing has not provided any asbestos uh, positive containing materials. Uh, we, have been the, we have been inspected, we've been cleared to go through that. So uh, without uh, creating, uh, if you will, a panic regarding uh, the entire facility, it's a very isolated incident that we're working with professionals to see who may have been affected that we would need to notify and make sure, and, but anyone that we uh, need to deal with. We're dealing with our risk management division as well as professionals in the healthcare industry and medical field to let us know what we need to do. Thank you. Mr. President and, and uh, counselors, uh, I know that many of you um, were involved in tours of the site. I have directed the staff to uh, contact your offices to determine the dates that you were there so that we can ensure that uh, we match the time that you were at, uh, touring the facility and the time that this um, asbestos removal occurred and so we will uh, touch base with all of you as we are as we're going through the directory of fill and the registration forms that we had for all the folks who toured the area so including the number of city employees that work on the site so uh, to answer your specific question counselor we're going through that and and uh, we'll be in touch with with you here in the in the very short future Madam Vice President, thank you. One last question. Um, why didn't we do due diligence when we purchased that facility to, to make sure that there was no issues? I mean, don't we all do dil due diligence when we purchase a house or we purchase any type of property? Why did the city miss this um, opportunity to do dil due diligence? Mr. President and Councillor Sanchez, we did do due diligence in the purchase of the building. We did a, there was an asbestos test done of the facility. The, uh, the test that was done reveals some areas in the facility that required some remediation. And in fact, remediation was done in some areas uh, before even gateway, if you will, uh, the gateway project was, was started. Uh, this particular area, unfortunately, was one of the areas that the test did not uh, fully uh, evaluate the material that uh, Mr. Um, Mayor Health Services Director, uh, Mr. Martinez, um, if you will, talked about, which is the 
the mastic that holds the carpet um, onto the floor or the tiles. That uh, area was, uh, was not uh, picked up, um, and it was only after a, a uh, if you will, an inspector from our plan department uh, had been there that uh, raised the concern. However, interestingly enough, his concern was a completely different issue that was, uh, quite frankly, handled appropriately. But um, as it began to uh, develop, we found that this mastic was, the, was really the issue. And it really is a, an issue just for the purposes of clarification. It's, this is called a, a it's, it's non-friable asbestos, which basically means that it's not the kind of asbestos that you, we all hear about as it relates to the fine dust and the powder that people breathe. In order to be severely exposed to that, you have to have been really in the middle of it for a long period of time. This is a non-friable substance. It comes out really in chunks as it's taken off the floor, et cetera. And um, the contractor is responsible for ensuring that that process is, is done appropriately and according to the rules. So as uh, Mr. Martinez alluded to, the contractor is also uh, in part responsible for, for what happened here. And our review now has, has, has uh, recognized that we did miss some steps and obviously um, not uh, happy about that, but also really making sure that um, our contracts also uh, held accountable for their role and responsibility for ensuring that the removal of the asbestos was done appropriately, et cetera. So we are obviously happy to, to keep you all posted as we move through this process. But again, um, I would just reiterate, looking at your calendars and ensuring us, letting us know when you were there will help us uh, identify when you were there versus when this removal of this uh, portion of the asbestos was done in the building would be really helpful. Madam Vice President, Mr. Rail, um, thank you. I'm still concerned of the people who are exposed. If you wouldn't mind sending council that report um, in reference to these, the, the people that may have been exposed, what's going on with it, how you're letting them know what they need to do so that way we can make sure that uh, mm -hmm. that people aren't left out of the loop if they've been exposed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, counselors? Okay. Uh, let's move on to the journal. I move approval of the April 17th journal. Okay, we have um, first and a second. Um, will the clerk call the roll? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Hinojo, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and thank you, uh, Madam Vice President. Uh, Ms. Hinojo, or Mr. Melendrez, I know earlier we were working on some technical issues with the city's network and Zoom. Uh, do we have that resolved, and do we have Councilor Pena with us now? Okay. So for the record, Councilor Pena will remain excused until we can get, until she's able to rejoin us. Councilors, next up we have communications and introductions. Are there any changes to tonight's letter of introduction? Seeing none, do we have a second? Oh, I'm sorry. I move approval of the letter of introduction. We just did it backwards to get. Thank you. We have multiples of those. All those in favor say yes for the clerk. Yes. Go ahead. You got to do it. Yes. Councilor Wasson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena is excused. <coughs> Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. You made it look so easy. I just got ahead of myself. Councilors, we have uh, reports of committees. Madam Chair, Feeble Corn. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, April 26th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of 054, that it do pass, and in the matter of 077, that it do pass as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee reports. A second from Councillor Bassan. Any questions? Seeing none, will the clerk call the vote? Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. 
Councillor Pena is excused. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Councillors going to deferrals and withdrawals. Are there any deferrals or withdrawals this evening? Seeing none, we're going to move to our consent agenda. Are there changes to tonight's consent agenda? I don't see any, but I do want to recognize and say that for individuals on tonight's consent agenda who are being appointed to serve on our boards and commissions, we appreciate your service. And uh, thank you if you're here or watching from afar. Madam Vice Chair. Mr. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. Councilor Bassan offers a second. Missy Knowles. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena is excused. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Councillor Sworn to announcements, Madam Chair, Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, there will be a committee of the whole meeting on Thursday, May 4th, and on Thursday, May 11th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. Chair Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a Finance and Government Operations Committee meeting on Monday, May 8th at 5 p.m. via Zoom video conference. Uh, Chair Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee meeting scheduled for May 10th is canceled. Councilors, we have no financial instruments on our agenda this evening, and so we're going to move to our general public comment. As a reminder, members of the public have the opportunity to provide public comment to our council in person or virtually if you sign up according to the instructions and availability posted on our website every Friday. Tonight's uh, public comment ground rules are the same as every week. Each participant has up to two minutes to present, though you need not use all of your time. Comments are uh, to be addressed to the councilors only and through the president, and any disruptive comment will result in removal from the meeting. Copies of our rules have been available to those who attended person uh, and we will enforce them otherwise online. There is a two minute time limit and a bell will ring in person to indicate your time is up. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, I think uh, we have a young lady here who we're gonna take first because she has homework. Um, and so we'll get started there and then get into our other list. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Aviel Jaramillo, followed by Cynthia Rodriguez. Ms. Jaramillo, welcome. Good evening, Council president and members of city council. My name is Aviel Jaramillo and I am a fourth grade student in APS at Alvarado Elementary School. I am here tonight in support of the Handle with Care program. As a student, I know how hard it can be to go to school if something stressful happens at home and if you don't get enough sleep the night before. The Handle with Care program is a great way for first responders to be able to let staff at school know that one of their students had something happen at home and they need more support from their teachers at school. When you are having a bad day, it is nice to have the adults at school know that they can check on you and make sure you are doing okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. And can I ask, how did you learn about the program? It might be a Mr. President. Yes, Councilor Grout. I think her mom is our AFR yes. chief. She's the one smiling over there. Yeah. <laughs> We're very proud of her. We're proud of you too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for coming down. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Ms. Jaramillo. I really appreciate you coming down. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Cornish. Thank you, Mr. President. Our next speaker is Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Kevin Branham. Folks, I'll remind you as uh, Mr. Cornelius calls your name, and we can barely hear you, Garrett, if you could speak up or we'll help you with that. Um, if he calls your name and you're on the on deck circle, come on down, take one of those seats in the front so that we can get you ready to go as soon as the current speaker is ready. Welcome, ma'am. Hi, thank you guys. Um, I'm here with the People's Housing Project, and I know you guys are going to be talking about uh, the Landlord Registry, which is really great. Um, so I won't go too in-depth about that. Uh, I think that it is a great idea to have that registry. Um, more importantly, I think that, you know, furthering initiatives to be able to monitor landlords and the conditions that they're making tenants here in Albuquerque live under while increasing rent prices 
is, is going to be really important. So maybe building off on that, you guys would be able to monitor more closely the slum lords here in Albuquerque who make people live in homes that are falling apart. Uh, I've been working with a lot of tenants recently in a neighborhood over by um, oh, Gibson and San Pedro, and I've run into a lot of people who are saying that they have holes in their ceilings. Uh, their landlords are not fixing them on time. And in fact, their landlords are starting to push back on them organizing in order to get their work orders completed. So there definitely needs to be more monitoring of these, these homes that are allowed to just decay, but landlords are allowed to profit off of. Um, obviously, they're not in code. I don't know if there needs to be more resources put into that, like for more workers, but there definitely needs to be some more regular checkups and check-ins and site inspections by the city for these people? Why are they forced to pay hundreds, almost $1,000 a month, over $1,000 a month in most cases, because the average one bedroom is over 1000 here in Albuquerque now, but they are living in slum conditions. They're developing health problems. They, you know, talking about, you know, we just saw a child come here talk about how issues at home affect their ability to focus at school. Why do we force children to live in these places that are half condemned? I mean, if you drive around the international district, there are buildings that are half condemned and people are still forced to live in the other half. You have to imagine that if it's condemned, it's because they're not taking care of it. Thank you, ma'am. Kevin Brownham, followed by Jordan Newlander. Good evening. I'm also um, part of the uh, People's Housing Project. I would also like to encourage the uh, City Council to pass um, uh, 02259. Uh, by having a rental registry database, the city would be able to better direct resources uh, such as, say, money for uh, property improvement uh, more efficiently to landlords, which would enable them to provide things like maintenance repairs to their residents, which we have seen and talked about as a huge problem, and it's an ongoing issue, like health hazards like mold and electrical issues and like um, stuff like that. Um, a rental database would also uh, improve code enforcement. Uh, a database could be used by inspectors to identify, track, and pri uh, prioritize the most hazardous properties so that the city could work with landlords to take appropriate action. Right now, there are, uh, there's huge infrastructure problems um, in numerous complexes uh, that have to do with, like, plumbing. There's, like, sewage coming out of people's sinks and bathrooms and uh, outside and everything, and... The residents will file a complaint, and then the, if they're lucky, they'll have a maintenance person come out and fix it and snake out the, the line and call it good. And then a few days later, it, the problem comes right back again. So um, this, um, um, this uh, simple and the, this really simple you know, action of creating a registry would enable the city to identify larger infrastructure problems like that and uh, prioritize them rather than relying on uh, individual complaints coming from residents. Uh, lastly, uh, in order to enact correct policies that would fix the problem of uh, rental accessibility, uh, we need the correct data. So, so, so please pass uh, 02259. Jordan Newlander, followed by Rhiannon Samuel. Rhiannon and Samuel, followed by Kristen Forge. Hello, counselors. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Rhiannon and Samuel, and I represent NAOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association, and I am here to urge you to support two bills. The first one is R2292 and R23128. On the first item, with the Manal MRA, we are supportive and we thank the sponsor for taking a thoughtful approach to this important area of the city. MRAs are a useful tool to incentivize development and uh, within blighted areas while mitigating some of the financial risks. They show a strong public-private partnership and we are excited to see what projects emerge because of this new possibility. 
On the second item, R23128, we strongly support, or we strongly encourage your support. Um, Councillor Lewis has it right when he says in the resolution, this type of position, petition can carry significant consequences for the community, not only in terms of promoting air quality, but also in terms of balancing the economic impacts. The business community has been working with the Air Quality Control Board for months. And I appreciate Councillor Fiebelkorn saying that that's the appropriate place to bring our concerns. But the fact is we have talked to them many times over and they are not receptive to any opinion other than what the petitioners have to say. And although we understand the intent and the concerns of the applicants, this is a one-sided proposal that will cause irreparable harm to our community. Please urge the Air Quality Control Board um, to consider all of the in unintended consequences that will come of this petition and vote to support Councillor Lewis's um, declaration of opposition. Thank you. Kristen Forgey, followed by Patrick Gallegos. All right, let's talk about consequences and accountability. Even the most basic work and educational environments implement systems that enforce consequences and accountability. As a society, it's proven that we are on our best behavior when these systems are in place. In the midst of a housing and economic crisis raging, why would anyone with an ounce of critical thinking skills allow the powers to be to run wild with greed and limitless opportunities to compact and intensify the waves of people becoming houseless? Some of you sitting before me might not be in touch with how hard communities are being hit by the city's predatory landlords and developers, sick and disgusting, lust for money with no thought to the citizens who reside here. The denial of this makes anyone with power culpable for the harm being done in this community. Now is the time for action. The community has made it clear that we want information. We want to hold these landlords and developers accountable. We deserve to know how many homes are available and what are available to rent and how much the rent is. How can we address the crisis if the community in the crisis doesn't have the basic information available to them? If nothing is being done wrong, if the laws are being followed, then there's nothing to fear. Accountability and consequences don't scare honest and hardworking folks, but it can scare entities and people with nefarious and predatory intent. This community deserves to have all the facts. We work hard and we are the heartbeat of the city. Take action today and choose the most vulnerable of us and give them the basic dignity and respect to have the power of informed decisions. 02259 is for the people and the people deserve better. Patrick Gallegos followed by Marsha Sanchez. Good evening, councilors. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm also an organizer with the People's Housing Project, um, and I'd like to stand in support of O2259 and the rental registry. I think it's an important oversight for landlords to be held accountable to their actions um, and any violations that may be taking place that are not currently being held accountable uh, by the city. Uh, we have a massive housing crisis going on across the country, uh, here in Albuquerque as well. I myself have had my rent raised multiple times um, and maintenance is a huge problem that um, I think we need uh, some sort of registry and, and uh, a system of accountability that can provide renters with a space that they can um, take their issues to without um, fear of repercussions from their, from their landlords. So please support this uh, resolution. Thank you. Marcia Sanchez, followed by Sean Smith. <coughs> Thank you, Council President and Council people for listening to us. My granddaughter and I, whom I am a guardian of, are in a situation that we have no idea how to handle, and it has to do with the slumlords that we are dealing with. I moved in here from out of state. I love this city. But I am finding out very quickly that there are corporations who are in charge of honest, hardworking people's places of residence, and they have no qualms in how to change or how to treat us. We have no heat in the winter. We have no air in the summer. Our water is shut off without warning. We go out to take our children to school or to go to work, and our cars are booted in the parking lots when we have legal tags, legal registration, 
and they know who we are, and yet this is continually happening. Now I have a granddaughter who panics every morning because she doesn't know if she's going to have a roof over her head. And I wake up every morning wondering if I'm going to have an eviction notice because several, and I mean several, at our small apartment complex have already got them. And there is no reason. We are on time, we're current, we have no issues, and they are not giving us a reason other than the fact they want us out because they want to bring in more people to pay higher rent. We are already there. We are already paying it. It is our home, and we are being forced out. And I don't know where I'm going to take my granddaughter or I, to be very honest with you. I will work. I'm going to continue to work, but I don't know where I'm going to live. And so we are here today fighting, literally, for our life. And I would appeal that you think about this very carefully and go for this registry, please, because we've got out-of-state landlords coming in, and that's where they're coming from. Thank you so much for listening to me. Sean Smith, followed by Tad Nimitsky. Tad Nimitsky, followed by Miguel Alvarez. Excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Ted Niemiski. Well, here is um, I've been learning more from the public records, more than one million. City Council is responsible for the spending, how they spending. In accountability. Uh, okay, here is section 217.1. They own ordinance. <clears throat> Public, all that's local city law. They violating, refusing to disclose public records. They own public records. How they spending millions of dollars. That's also state law. Yes, I mean, they produce some 318 or over 300 pages of, of that one Westinghouse. About 80, 80 pages. And they wanted me to pay 50 cents a copy. There are other advertising. What I needed is simple. Last three years, oh yes, Diana Gibson, 19, uh, 2019. <sighs> I don't need that. I just need it simple. Simple last two years, how they spending, how much they receiving, spending money, and how they spending, including in the voices. Yes, that's only beginning now. They, they have their own here investigation. I spent two hours this day. Thank, uh, today. Thank you. Miguel Alvarez, followed by Julie Dreike on Zoom. I came here tonight to speak about what I saw on the news last night about the program that you folks are gonna start to try and get uh, the city of Albuquerque uh, forward instead of ass backwards like we've been doing these last couple of years. Last year, we lost a lot of police officers and some firefighters, and today we lost a lot of bus drivers, which is leaving a lot of our citizens uh, without transportation to go to work and to go to places that they need to go. And, and it's hard already with everything else that's going on, that the groceries are more expensive, the rent's more expensive, and nobody does a damn thing about it. I think that if you're gonna start a program to, to get the city back on its feet, I think we need professional people up here in front of us, not uh, counselors that don't care about us. We're just a bank for you guys. You get our money, you do what you want with it, 
You don't even care about what our issues are. You, I've been coming over here for four years and I feel that you don't even listen, you don't even do anything about what we have in common. The only one that actually uh, tackled the issues that were a problem is Ken uh, Sanchez, the one that died with diabetes. I don't know about the rest of you, if you really care about family issues or your family or anything else that happens in this town. But if we're going to be putting this town forward instead of ass backward like it's been going for the last uh, 10 years, uh, I believe that we should get professional people instead of the same people that caused the problem to begin with. Julie Dreike, followed by Jane Beckley. Thank you, Council President and Councilors. I submitted comments um, to you in your pack by email um, regarding the timing of the debate and consideration of Ordinance 2254, Housing Forward. Please do not schedule this at the same time as the budget hearing, as both of them um, need due consideration. I remain concerned about the fact that neighborhood associations from throughout our community were not engaged in the planning of Housing Forward. From the administration, we've heard who was involved in the planning of Housing Forward and who was at the table. I don't know why neighborhood associations were not at the table or they were afraid of questions or disagreements. I'm not afraid of disagreements. In fact, you might not experience this, but in fact, from time to time, my spouse and I do not agree. And I believe that disagreement brings us to a better decision with all the points of view at the table. Please consider various points of view if, as you consider how to improve housing for all of us. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Jane Beckley, followed by Michael Brasher. Thank you. Mr. President and counselors, I respectfully request that you defer consideration of O2254 and O2377 to a future meeting where there is time to adequately ensure both genuine public engagement on these important matters, as well as deliberation by counselors of the merits of these proposals and evidence for their potential effectiveness in Albuquerque. At last week's LUPS meeting, counselors discussed the potential impact of adding these uh, IDO matters to a council agenda that already included the budget. Arguably, both the city budget and land use matters are among the most consequential for everyone in Albuquerque that this council addresses. So please assure that each of those important matters is discussed in a single meeting where the separate meetings where there is sufficient time to really consider all of the issues. Thank you very much. Michael Brasher, followed by Christopher Ramirez. You are muted, sir. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Council state statute at 321.6b talks about notification requirements for zoning in municipalities and other local government areas. This is a state statute. My question is, has the city complied with this statute, which requires that written notification be given to all property owners when zoning changes are made on property? Now, I've asked a number of questions, and neither have answered the question that I've, I've asked, and have had a period where some calls have, frankly, not been returned. The home purchase of a home is the most important purchase many people will ever make in their lives. Most aren't aware of the change in zoning. I've walked a couple of neighborhoods, the last one, South Los Altos, on Saturday, and no one, absolutely no one, was aware of what is proposed, the zone change that you're planning. We need more time. There's no rush in this. We need to make sure that the public is generally aware 
of what is being done. Now, whether you agree with the state statute that it applies that each property owner get mail telling them that their property is being rezoned, whether you agree or not, wouldn't that be the best way to do it for such an important purchase as a home? Wouldn't it be best to have them get that letter notifying them that their property is being rezoned? It's such an important, important purchase for a, for a homeowner. And wouldn't be really that that really be the transparent thing to do to make sure everybody is aware of what's going on. Thank you all very much. Christopher Ramirez, followed by Leslie Padilla. Good evening, President and Counselors. My name is Christopher Ramirez with Together for Brothers and the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union. I'm uh, speaking tonight on the, the budget matter that's gonna be considered at Thursday's Committee of the Whole. Um, and want to remind you that for public transit, um, the city's own onboard survey conducted by bus riders showed that 85% of bus riders agreed that keeping zero fares would be the number one way that we could improve public transit in the city. And then most recently with the um, Transit Advisory Board, um, they have passed, uh, I think this is the, the fifth year and um, the seventh resolution supporting zero fares. So just want to say I won't be able to be at the Committee of the Whole meeting on Thursday, but I hope that City Council will consider continuing to include zero fares in the budget for the fiscal year of 2024. Thank you very much. Leslie Padilla, followed by Alan Marks. Uh, thank you, Council members. Uh, my name is Leslie Padilla. I live in District 6. Uh, like several other speakers tonight, I would like to encourage you to uh, postpone consideration of the housing forward um, ordinance um, so that it's not uh, heard at the same time as the city budget. As uh, another speaker mentioned, I believe there has been you know, severely inadequate notice uh, given um, to residents about this. Uh, to, as the ordinance itself acknowledges, it's a significant upzoning of a huge uh, portion of the, of the city's uh, zones. And there's been seriously at inadequate notice to property owners. Um, I also noticed there's, I, I tried to find analysis. Of, I, I'm a lawyer, but I actually, I'm not a land use attorney, but I tried to, I'm trying to understand the ordinance. And honestly, it is extremely difficult. There, the analysis that's available on the city's webpage is inadequate. It's more like public relations, propaganda. It's not an, ad, an actual analysis of what the ordinance would do. What would be really helpful, I think, is a map so that residents can understand exactly how their neighborhoods and their properties would be affected by the changes, particularly, I would think, the ADU change and the height, um, the height change uh, for multi-residential um, development. Um, and, and where is the research that supports the proposition that density uh, improves affordability? Uh, as I mentioned at the LUPS meeting last week, um, there's a recent Urban Institute study that actually finds that land use reforms such as Housing Forward um, are not statistically, there's no statistically significant evidence that additional lower cost units become available or became less expensive in the years following land use reforms. So please take more time on this. I hope the fix is not already in. Thank you. Alan Marks. Alan Marks. Can you hear me? We can hear you, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening, counselors. Uh, my name is Ellen Marks. I live in the Mountain View community. Um, I would like to discuss item R23128 regarding the petition to the Air Quality Board to establish a health environment and equity impact regulation. I know all of you council members understand that often permits for polluting industries go into the same poor and overburdened communities. 
and I'm sure all of you believe in treating all citizens of our metropolitan area fairly. That's the intent of the regulation being heard by the Air Quality Board. Councillor Lewis, uh, through his proposed resolution, resolution, questions the opportunity for input by members of the Albuquerque community. Obviously, there are public comment opportunities at all Air Quality Board meetings and at the hearing on the regulation. Additionally, our community, which proposed the regulation, has invited and met with industry to hear concerns and get input. Since this was a community initiative, it came from the community. Other input has been provided along the way and will certainly be considered by the Air Quality Board. Councillor Lewis's second concern was regarding unclear standards. No court will support a regulation with unclear standards. The Air Quality Board certainly knows this and will work with the City Environmental Health Department and attorneys to ensure that clear, easy to apply standards will be reflected in the regulation. The most helpful thing the City Council could do, given the concerns raised in Councillor Lewis's resolution, would be to ask the Air Quality Board to ensure that the regulation contain clear standards. Surely providing equity and protecting overburdened communities, something currently going on in cities across the country, is something our City Council believes in. Please help our Albuquerque community, not by labeling such attempts harmful, but rather by constructive critical support. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes general public comment. Thank you, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, let's see, it's about 6.30. Um, let's try to get through this, uh, this appeal and then we'll see where we land from there. I see Ms. Ronquillo's on point, so we'll get going from here. Next up is gonna be AC 239. Ms. Peggy Norton, on behalf of the North Valley Coalition, has appealed the site plan administrative decision to approve a site plan for uh, all or portions of the lot listed uh, on or about 5307 4th Street Northwest. Uh, Ms. Ronquillo, would you kick us off, please? Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this matter was before you at your last meeting to consider whether to adopt the findings and recommendation of the land use hearing officer. The council declined at that time to adopt those findings and recommendations in favor of holding a full hearing at this meeting. Just to give a quick refresher, the issue in this appeal is whether a site plan should be approved to develop an automatic car wash at 4th Street and Douglas MacArthur. City planning staff administratively approved the site plan, finding that it met all requirements of the IDO and DPM. Peggy Norton, on behalf of the North Valley Coalition, appealed that approval, arguing that the sidewalks and landscape buffer zone developed along the 4th Street side of the property were not laid out property per, properly per the requirements of the DPM. Pursuant to prior approvals, the applicants constructed the sidewalk such that it goes street, sidewalk, landscape buffer, and then the car wash property. The appellants claim that it should have been constructed as street, landscape buffer, sidewalk, and then the car wash property. The council referred this appeal to its land use hearing officer who recommended that the city council deny the appeal and uphold the city planning staff's decision to administratively approve the application. Tonight, you will hold a full hearing on this matter and we'll hear directly from the parties to determine whether the site plan should be approved. You'll be looking at that approval to determine whether uh, planning staff acted fraudulently, arbitrarily, or capriciously, or the decision was not supported by substantial evidence, or staff erred in applying the applicable rules in approving the site plan. Um, you'll hear arguments from the parties tonight, uh, including first Peggy Norton on behalf of the North Valley Coalition, who's the appellant, followed by the applicant, 7B Building and Development LLC, who is developing the car wash, and then there will also be some time to hear from the planning department if you have questions for them. Um, there will be some rebuttal time for the appellant to close out the appeal, and then at that time you can deliberate and discuss. Uh, one last thing to note, you are not permitted at this time to take in new evidence. There have been several hearings already, and the evidence is complete for our purposes tonight, so you'll be making your decision based only on the existing evidence in the record and the arguments that you'll hear tonight. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Norton, I know you know the, the process here, so a few rules to get through. All of our presenters other than attorneys must be sworn in. Our time limits are as follows. Uh, on behalf of the appellant, Ms. Norton, on behalf of the Neighborhood Association, you have eight minutes. Uh, a presentation from the applicant, which is 7B Building and Development, LLC, has 10 minutes. 
uh, a presentation or response by the city planning staff. Uh, we'll have three minutes, and then uh, Ms. Norton, you'll have two minutes to uh, respond to any and all of that, if you so choose. Uh, and at that point, do we need to swear everybody in? Is that right? I remember. So Ms. Norton, would you, and any other, where our city planning staff and any other folks that will be presenting and participating this evening, where do we have our uh, applicants from 7B? Come on down. If you would, just come on down and have a seat in the front row for me, if you don't mind, sir. We do have to swear everybody in, so if you'll raise your right hand, please, and promise to swear the truth. I do. Thank you. Sir, do you promise to swear the truth? Sir, from 7B. Hi, I'm an attorney. We do yep. have one other representative here that is kind of available to answer questions. Uh, she's dealing with the day-to-day -day with the city staff. I'm not going to swear her but in now. We're going to do, we're going to swear her in now just to be sure, so stand up for me. Stand back up just a second. Yeah, raise your hand. There we go. Hi, do you swear to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, you're good. Great. Ms. Norton, time is yours. Okay, don't start yet. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have, I was hoping this would show up a little better on the overhead, and I am going to show it on the overhead, but I have uh, about five extra copies that I, you could and pass clarify, around. Thank and, you, Ms. Norton. And to and clarify, that was already in the record. It's just something that's come out. Yes. Uh -huh. Great. Yeah, we'll let. It's numerous places in the record. Michelle, would you share that with us, if that's okay? Thanks. Thank you. We can share. Here's my question. Well, thank you. Ms. Norton, you can proceed. You have eight minutes. Okay. Council President, Councilors, thank you for voting to hear this appeal. I have a background table here which shows the street element dimensions uh, shown in the development process manual. And this is the area we're talking about, this buffer here. So when I refer to buffer, that's what I'm talking about is between the street and the sidewalk. Notice this is along major roads. We already don't have a bike lane. We don't have a buffer. We don't have, a, a, I'm sorry, a bike buffer. We don't have a transit lane, we don't have a median, we don't have on-street parking. So the only thing out of all this that can happen is this buffer sidewalk frontage portion of the design. It shows in a main street corridor that has the dimensions of uh, listed on this chart. Forest Street has been designated a main street and multimodal corridor and is a historical Route 66. The goal of that designation is to make it a lively, highly walkable street lined with neighborhood-oriented businesses. This concept dates back to the North Fourth Corridor Plan 2009 and continues to appear in the Comprehensive Plan and is carried out through the IDO, including Character Protection Overlay 9 and the Development Process Manual. The North Valley Coalition has been active in supporting that concept, being involved in two projects being built at 2818 and 3525 4th Street. These projects, heard by the DRB, will use the cross-section guideline layout and blend them in with the already existing sidewalks. The UNM Health Clinic is a prime example of blending sidewalks and presenting a walkable area along the frontage of the lot. These guidelines are required in CP09 and the DPM and are in the North Forest Street Corridor Plan. There is also a complete streets ordinance. The buffer is important not only for accomplishing street designation goals and providing visual interest, but also for pedestrian safety. This is particularly important when there is no parking providing a buffer between the vehicles in the road and the pedestrians. Additionally, it can mitigate impacts of a drive-through car wash, which would not be allowed on a Main Street corridor if the IDO did not exempt car washes from being treated as drive-through facilities. This project was originally planned to be submitted to the Development Review Board which would have provided more transparency and accountability. Because an improved infrastructure agreement was required, although waived, the site plan should have been heard by the DRB. The DRB hearing in February approved an infrastructure list 
which included a 10-foot sidewalk on the east, which was an error side of 4th Street. It did not specify a location adjacent to the curb, as staff states in their comments. Page six of the appeal packet confirms there was no discussion of a landscape buffer in either transportation or planning comments. Code enforcement comments in February stated that development must meet all applicable standards and provisions of the IDO, the DPM, and other adopted city regulations, including but not limited to CPO9. We did not appeal the February replat decision because we were assured public concerns would be addressed in a pre-submittal meeting when a proposed project was submitted. We were never notified of the April hearing. The 10-foot sidewalk requirement carried over to site plan approval. The city notes in the appeal packet contain nu numerous references to the importance and high priority for wide sidewalks and landscape buffer zone. The LUHO states the DPM requires street designs to meet best practices and should indicate designers are encouraged to apply the guidelines to the greatest extent feasible. There is no documentation that that happened or could not happen, the guidelines could not happen. I had discussed the cross-section guidelines with both the original applicant and the agent, so they were well aware of my concerns. Staff should have considered the provision for a pedestrian buffer. One constraint cited was that the applicant had constructed a 10-foot sidewalk and it was illogical to ask them to remove it. However, they did not construct a 10-foot sidewalk and we object to LUHO finding eight. The end result was a 10-foot sidewalk, but they only constructed a four-foot sidewalk adjacent to a pre-existing six-foot sidewalk. If you can see that, this is the four-foot sidewalk. I offered one possible design to meet the guidelines would be to leave the four-foot sidewalk, add six feet to it, and have a five-foot pedestrian buffer. I offered this as a compromise to the agent and she refused it, so staff is incorrect to state we required layout is exactly as shown in the DPM. We do think the intent of a buffer should be in the approved plan. Nothing in the DPM guidelines state that these guidelines only apply to areas without current sidewalks. The other constraint offered by the city at the LUHO hearing was inadequate right-of-way to allow for the buffer. However, the right-of-way ended at the back of the curb, so we were really talking about 15 feet of easement. This site is a large portion of this block, and a lot to the south has the same odor. The same picture illustrates the sizable frontage and the few poles to work around on this side of the street. These cross-section guidelines only apply to new construction or expansion by 25%, and that is more reason to meet the standards and follow and set precedent. Besides the buffer, another missing component of the approved streetscape is street trees, which Parks and Rec stated are required for a minor arterial. The city justifies non-compliance with guidelines using the words balance, prioritize, reasonable discretion. The LUHO agrees. Staff comments that the guidelines are the preferred comment, uh, preferred outcome, but not the only. However, there are numerous plans and documents recommending these cross-section guidelines, and yet they were all ignored, not even mentioned. Shouldn't these have been the priority? For what users are we balancing and prioritizing by eliminating the buffer? We should expect detailed do documentation to justify the inability to meet the guidelines. That is not in the file. I stand by the justifications in our original appeal. Staff acted arbitrarily and capriciously by ignoring plans, precedents, corridor designations. The decision to eliminate the buffer and street trees is not supported by substantial <laughs> evidence. Staff erred in applying requirements and plans, policies, regulations. There could have been a much better attempt to comply with the wonderful plans that have been written for our city, our streets, and North Forth Corridor. 
Please send this back to be redesigned either to staff or the DRB, which is where it should have been heard in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Next up, we're going to have a presentation from the applicant, uh, which is 7B Building and Development. One of you is going to do this. All right, there we go. Welcome, sir. Will you introduce us for the record? Introduce yes, yourself for good the evening. Record. My name is Petrus Wasdorf. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Hans Scarborough in Austin, Texas, here tonight representing 7B Building and Development in this matter. I want to start with a, a clarification of the uh, presentation by staff at, at the beginning where they described how this was approved during the platting process, that it was uh, sidewalk or street, sidewalk, landscape buffer. But at the time, uh, you know, no site development plan had, had been developed. We had not decided on what was going to be in this location. And so there was an indication on the approved plat that a 10-foot sidewalk be adjacent to the curb. Uh, Ms. Norton pointed out that it doesn't say attached to the curb, and that's correct, but it does indicate that it's going to be in a 10-foot uh, easement that is adjacent to the curb, so limiting it to that area. Um, when the DRB approved the, uh, the plat with the 10-foot the sidewalk, um, Ms. Norton or the uh, North Valley Coalition approved uh, or appealed that decision, and I think that's part of what their problem is here tonight, is that, that they are trying to go back and, and redo that decision. Um, existing elements on a site, such as this 10-foot sidewalk, are not subject to the same standards as a greenfield site would be. Uh, and that uh, reference comes from DPM 7-3B4, Roman numeral 4. In fact, the IDO specifically requires that for approval uh, of the site plan must comply with any conditions specifically applied to the development of the property in a prior permit or approval affecting the property. That's IDO 6-5G3A. And we feel like this uh, plat approval was a approval affecting the property that we are required to comply with. Um, it's economically inefficient for us to uh, have built a sidewalk, tear up a sidewalk, move a sidewalk after the fact, after building plans have already been put in place and gone through an extensive approval process. 7B Building and Development strives to be a good community partner, and we have done so here in Albuquerque by participating in multiple post-submittal meetings, facilitated meetings to address the concerns of the North Valley Coalition. And we have adopted uh, some of their concerns in, uh, down to the level of allowing them to choose which plants we plant in the landscape buffer between the sidewalk and the facility. Um, Ms. Norton has uh, alleged that city staff has acted arbitrarily and capriciously has uh, not uh, left substantial evidence in the, in the record and has erred in their uh, consideration of the IDO. And we would respectfully disagree. Um, as I said, uh, there has been uh, the original uh, uh, approval by staff, the post-submittal meeting, the facilitated meeting. Uh, many of these issues were discussed at those and the City staff approved the site plan with the consideration of the existing sidewalks, the fact that the sidewalks and the adjacent properties are also attached to the curb, the limited depth of the site um, and the available right-of-way, and the substantial landscape area that was provided for in our site plan between the sidewalk and the facility. <clears throat> staff correctly applied uh, the review criteria as found in the IDO 6-5G3. Uh, that review criteria is limited to the IDO, the DPM, and other adopted city regulations and other conditions that are specifically applied to the development of the property or approval, uh, prior approval affecting the property. Um, 
Ms. Ms. Norton and the North Valley Coalition have have asked us to go back to look at that prior approval and and change that here in this site plan approval, and and that's just not appropriate. Um, in addition, uh, the three requirements that that you can overturn uh, a, a decision, uh, administrative decision of the staff, are that they acted arbitrarily and capriciously, um, did not, uh, was not supported by substantial evidence, and uh, that they erred in, in consideration of the IDO. Uh, arbitrarily and capriciously means that no reasonable person could have come to the same conclusion. And substantial evidence means that there is just more than a mere scintilla of evidence. And I think it's clear that there is in this case. Uh, the DPM is a, has, has a bit of flexibility in it. And it has said so repeatedly in the document. Uh, Ms. Norton showed you a table of, of street elements. Um, and a, a note that goes along with those tables says that this table does not equate indicate whether these street elements are required for a particular roadway, roadway and should be used in combination with the ABC Comprehensive Plan Table 7-5. And admittedly, in a main street area, a landscape buffer is a high priority uh, uh, element, but it is not a required element. Elsewhere, they, uh, it goes on to say uh, in the DPM that limited right-of-way of existing facilities may provide constraints on the available options and force designers to make choices and trade-offs among the street elements. And that is exactly what has occurred here. Uh, the city planning staff, through all of the uh, approval process and meetings, has uh, decided and the applicant thinks appropriately with the consideration of the uh, specific site conditions uh, and constraints that uh, the sidewalk is appropriately attached to the curb. Um, we have a, a lot of, of, of Ms. Norton's concerns seem to stem around two things, and that is one, that this is a car wash that she believes should be excluded from uh, the IDO uh, for approval, and it's not. But this is not the position, the place to reconsider what the IDO says. Uh, that would be for whatever uh, IDO reapproval process uh, that uh, will occur. But this individual uh, application is not the place uh, for those considerations. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and conclude uh, my comments there. Um, I will note that for the record that, that we have uh, Regina Okoye here with uh, Modulus Architects and Land Use Plan Planning. Uh, she is the uh, on-site uh, developer who's working directly with city staff if there are questions uh, for her. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, sir. We uh, will now move to city planning staff if you have any comments or presentations for up to three minutes. Anything, sir? We, we don't have a presentation. We're only here to answer questions. If you have any. Great. Then we'll skip that part. Ms. Norton, you're back if you choose. Uh, you have up to two minutes for a rebuttal from the presentation from the other speakers, and then counselors will have an opportunity to deliberate. I'm not as good at unprepared remarks, and at the LUHO hearing, I had a hard time doing cross-examination. So what we are appeal appealing is the site plan approval. That's exactly it. And um, we do accept the earlier approval of a 10-foot wide sidewalk, and somehow this site plan has to work within that constraint, and that's fine. Um, but the co comprehensive plan shows that buffer is a high priority. Uh, Main Street corridors consider it a high priority. The character protection overlay requires it. 
and refers to it in the DPM. The North 4th Street corridor has that almost exact same picture in it. All these plans that, that don't require it, but highly, highly recommend it, should be respected. And if we are not going to follow those plans, why do we even have them? Um, and, and I mentioned the car wash only as a means for um, mitigating the effects of it, not as saying it can't be there. I realize it can be there. And um, I'm not exactly sure why we excluded it as a drive through facility. Um, the only concern really that the applicant addressed from our one public meeting, and we had a couple smaller, uh, I don't know, little, little meetings to see if we could come to a consensus. Um, the only concern they really addressed is species. And I am concerned that there are also no street trees there. And I'm not sure how those got left out of the design. So I, I still stand by my comments. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Councilors, we're going to move on to, to discussion and deliberation. We're going to start with our IDO expert, Councilor Benton. So I have a, a couple of series of questions, I think. Um, and I'm not sure uh, exactly who to uh, address these to, but I know Ms. Ronquillo has looked at this extensively. Um, the definition of a landscape buffer, Ms. Ms. Ronquillo, could you? read that and where that resides. Sure, Mr. President, Councilor Benton. Um, in the DPM, a landscape buffer zone is defined as an area between the curb and the sidewalk that provides space for signage, utilities, stormwater catchment, landscaping, street furnishing, and driveway aprons. That's so in the emphasis DPM. on that first uh, phrase, between the curb and the sidewalk. So, um, Ms. Ronquillo, I'm looking in the record, and I, I keep seeing references to the fact that, um, that the staff, the city staff, needs flexibility when applying these standards in the DPM. Uh, I don't think anybody's disputing that. However, I've yet to see anything, and I believe it was stated by Ms. Norton, that there was no record of any kind of discussion on the part of staff of why this is not being provided in the place that it's defined in the DPM. And so I, I find it uh, surprising that, that there's no presentation by them and there's nothing in the record to indicate that staff deliberated on their own, on their own about why this deviation occurred. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, since, since planning staff is here, we do have an opportunity to hear from them now if they're able to point to something in the record or provide that information at this time. All right. Councilor Benton, do you wish to question the yes, please. planning department? Now it's your turn. So just, just as a lead in, sir, uh, 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 the question is, you know, what was the discussion of the staff on this specific project that led to a decision that it was beneficial in some way for the public interest uh, or, or just by, by uh, uh, consistency with, with, with these various recommendations, if we want to call them recommendations and not uh, absolute fixed requirements, but pretty strong recommendations throughout various documents that the city has, what was the discussion that occurred with your staff to determine that, no, it's okay, uh, a landscape buffer despite this definition within the DPM does not have to be between the curb and the sidewalk? Uh, yes, Mr. Counselor. Uh, so the, the issue of si where the sidewalk was and if there was a landscape buffer that was actually uh, decided at the DRB during platting. That's typically when we do it because that's where we, we can ask for right of way or easement in this case. Uh, when it got to site plan, typically it's, it's a current practice within planning that we do not go back and uh, override decisions by DRB or uh, other engineers. I was not the transportation engineer at that time 
I was the transportation engineer that approved the site plan. So we don't go back in time and look at previous decisions so long as the only time that we will override a previous decision is if there is a major safety concern. Okay, thank you for that explanation. So the, the decision occurred at the DRB. Was there discussion at the DRB as to why we're not placing the landscape buffer where pretty clearly the public policy intention is that it should be? Unfortunately, I, I don't have the answers to that. I was not in transportation at that time. Um, and is there someone from the DRB who can speak to that discussion? I think the chair person is here. Yeah. And ma'am, just for the record, if you would give us your name and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and do you swear to tell the truth? Sir. I'm Jolene Wolfley. Yeah. Thank you. And I swear to tell the truth. Thank you. And um, I was the DRB chair when this case was heard in February. And um, Jean Wolfenberger was the traffic engineer. And I think Ms. Wolfenberger had worked with the applicant and looked at the depth of the site and looked at the available right of way and determined that some of the other requirements for 4th Street regarding minimum and maximum setbacks would constrain the property owner. In addition, they had to set back from their rear line from the residential area because of the car wash outdoor equipment. And so I think at that time she balanced things out, knowing that in addition, some of the requirements on 4th Street meant that a facade wall needed to be constructed um, along the property frontage so it would look like a main street. And the applicant was providing quite a bit of landscaping immediately in front of that facade wall. And I think at that time, she was focused on the plat. She, I think at that time she knew about the sidewalk or the car wash likely coming in and just determined that given the depth of the parcel, some of the other requirements on 4th Street, that that was a good balancing of where the landscape buffer would be because there is a landscape buffer. Um, this is more about the location of it being between the curb and the sidewalk or between the sidewalk and the facade wall. Councilor Ben. So thanks for the explanation. Um, the, so it sounds like there was a lot of consideration given to the needs of the car wash plan with regard to this. And, um, and as I understand it, this 10-foot this easement was negotiated as part of this approval, correct? The 10-foot the easement that, that shows up on the plat. Correct. And so was there any reason why that easement could not have been wider and the same amount of landscaping be required, uh, but it would have been a wider easement. It wouldn't have, it, from what your description is, um, it wouldn't have compromised the placement of the buildings or the elements, the other elements on the site. Uh, it would seem that, that, that the, since you're already negotiating an easement, that you would negotiate a wider easement and you put the, the sidewalk where it's intended by the North Fourth Corridor Plan and all these other uh, guidelines, if you will, uh, of where it should be. Thank you, Council President Davis and um, Councilor Benton. There is a maximum setback on 4th Street of 15 feet. And so I think the easement allowed the property owner to um, abide by that 15 foot maximum setback. And, also, and their sidewalk is in the easement. The extended sidewalk is in the easement. And therefore, they were able to um, use the setback from their property line in order to meet that maximum setback. They couldn't set it back any farther. So if the easement, um, if all of that would have moved, it would have affected their compliance with the maximum setback. Um, so, so the maximum setback is, is 15, correct? 15 feet. 15 feet. And, and the, the, uh, the right-of-way line or the property line is, is the back of the curb? The right-of-way line is back of curb. Right. So within 15 feet, you could do a five-foot landscape buffer and a 10-foot sidewalk. 
right? <coughs> 10 plus 5, 15. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds simple. It looks more complicated on the plot, to be quite honest. Um, and, and here's the problem I'm right. having, is just looking at the record, is that, that um, there's a lot of talk about how we need to accommodate and we need to, and, you know, especially on an existing site, and I'm sure especially on an old corridor like North Forth, where we already know there's limited right of way and so forth. But, but uh, it, I just don't see the evidence in the record that any serious effort was made to create the landscape buffer in the place called for in the, and, and as defined in the DPM. Um, that's, I guess that's not a question, rather a statement. But thank you, Jay. Uh, I think it's Councilor Jones and maybe myself. And then we'll see where we go. Thank you, and, and thank you for talking with us. I think this is a majorly confusing issue, but quite obviously the city allowed this to happen and issued the permit and let it happen. So if the city in my opinion, and I hate to say this, could possibly have been the one who made the mistake, why would the developer be responsible to pay the amount that's being asked for? Or does where does the city's, I guess I'm going to ask you, Julie, where is the city's liability for allowing this and issuing the permit? If I may have some legal advice on this? That might be outside the scope of this hearing, I think. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, it, it is a tricky question. Uh, Ms. Ronquillo and I are kind of conferring on this as, as we sit here. And the, the tricky aspect of it is that, that there was two stages of the approval, it sounds like. There was the, um, the plat, which was approved. Um, and, and there is some um, aspect of when, when, a, when a person acts in reliance on an approval by the city, there's some aspect of vesting that can occur. Um, and so I, the fact that this property has been built um, and, and built as approved by the city does place an interesting wrinkle. That doesn't limit your discretion to uh, determine that the site plan was issued incorrectly. Um, but it does present an interesting wrinkle as far as uh, any remedy that might actually be practically applied at the site. And if I may, Mr. Chair, and what exactly are the ramifications and where do we stand if we ask to have this issue, have this remand this and let the legal people battle it out because I, I believe this is a very, very difficult issue. Mr. President, Councilor Jones, um, any decision by this council relative to this action is appealable to State District Court. Um, and so that is one, one avenue, of course, uh, to the extent that the council um, believes that there was an error in approving uh, this site plan as it was approved, there's still an opportunity for the developer to redo the, the sidewalk in order to be in compliance, um, but that would not uh, be the only option. Certainly to continue to challenge the city's decision would be an alternative. I believe this is a little too complicated, as we've heard already from several, and I'm, I don't have a legal mind. I have a right and wrong mind, <laughs> sometimes. But um, I would like to make a motion to remand. So we have a motion and a second on the, the motion to remand back to the planning department. So we'll have discussion on that motion for a minute. Uh, do we have any comments from this side of the table before we go forward on that? Councilor Ben, do you want to follow up on that, or are you going to just take it? Um, let me it's, add a comment, if I may, please, and I'll come please. back around the table. Look, I, that may be the best answer here. I hate to see these things drag out forever, but let me say sort of the, the it appears to me, um, you know, I heard from Ms. Wolfley say that that applying the standard as written in the IDO, I'm using my words, not hers, 
would quote uh, constrain the property owner. My concern here is that it seems like the planning department applied flexibility to squeeze something in that may not have been appropriate or fit this space. If that's not the case, I agree with Councilor Ben, the record's not well developed enough that they started by trying to apply the right standard and working flexibility in there in some way. Um, I think my concern is the IDO to me is pretty clear. It's set by policy by this council as a guide for doing that. Um, and anytime there's a deviation from that by staff, I think there needs to be a very good reason that this doesn't fit. And I might use, I did not see one in the record that I was able to review, but I'll give an example and say, if there were an underground power line between the curb and the middle of the sidewalk that would prevent us from planting trees with roots there, totally a justified reason, but I don't see any of that. No analysis that this doesn't fit in the 15 feet, just that it didn't, wasn't the preference. And so I'm sort of, in, I'm sort of inclined to say this, that the planning department made a mistake here and it's gonna have to answer for it, but I think the remand may hopefully allow for some cooler heads and a better answer. So I would be inclined to support that. Any other, uh, Councilor Bassan, then I wanna go back to Councilor Benton since you started this and we'll go there. Mr. President, I just wanted to, I, I think that we don't get appeals all that often here. Um, and so I think that it would be really beneficial if for the public and for some of the counselors that may not have been through an appeal where it's not just capricious, arbitrary, or fraudulent, but what would remand mean? Ms. Ronke or Mr. Melendres? Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Bassan, um, I think in this instance, a remand would involve sending um, this back to the planning department for, for the review. Um, I think council could request um, additional justification um, for any approval that the planning department may issue. Um, we could also um, request that um, this definition that we've been discussing be specifically addressed um, in any subsequent um, decision by planning. Good question. Thank you, Councilor Benton. I think kind of to close on your motion. Well, just close on the motion. First of all, sure. I we'll think come back uh, we, we would depend upon our staff to write some findings with regard to this and what we would be looking for if the counselor were, were, to, were, were to agree to the motion. Um, and that still leaves, you know, some some area here of the if the city were at fault. And I'm not saying, I'm not assuming the city was at fault. What I'm saying is I haven't seen anything in the record to explain why these, this decision was made. And I think that's why it needs to be remanded. Um, and, and then there's the whole physical remedy of whatever needs to happen. I think a lot of discussion was, was uh, or seems to be clearly placed on the idea that, well, there was already a sidewalk there, so it's so much easier and so much more straightforward to just add to that sidewalk, and that's a reason. But that it wasn't really stated that way. So that, that's why I feel like we, we need uh, guidance, and we could work on, the, on, the, uh, on our findings between now and the next meeting. Uh, Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, so a remand does mean a remand would be, would mean that uh, that there is the belief that there was a mistake made by the prior body or by the planning department. Is that correct? Mr. Q. Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, no, um, not necessarily. It would just mean um, that the council has identified um, areas where we need some more information um, put into the record. It could be that there wasn't a sufficient evidence for us to make that decision, and so we'll bring it back. Um, if we believe that there was not an error, um, or, or say there's, there's is a is is, an, is there an appropriate motion to um, to deny the appeal, Wendy? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor yeah. Lewis, yes. Okay. So, seeing no other comments, we're going to call that a call to question on the motion to remand. All those in favor uh, will upon the roll call of the clerk, who reminds me that we, uh, do we have Councilor Pena is not participating in this hearing, is that correct? Just for the record, okay, great, thank you. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fubelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. No. Councilor Pena is excused. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. It passes on a seven to one vote. So on a seven to one vote, that matter is remanded back to the planning department. We'll develop some follow-up questions to be addressed in the record. 
So at this point, the council is going to take our normal dinner break. For those of you here for uh, the second act, we'll see you in about 30 minutes.
Okay, folks, welcome back. Act two opens with Councilors Grout and Sanchez, R-118. Mr. President, thank you. Um, R-118 R is declaring the city's intent to collaborate with Albuquerque Public Schools to create a program to prevent children's exposure to trauma and violence, mitigate ne negative effects of childhood exposure to trauma, and to increase knowledge and awareness of this issue. Directing the Albuquerque Police Department, the Albuquerque Fire and Rescue, and the Albuquerque Community Safety Departments to enact protocols for first responders scenarios that involve school-aged youth, I move a due pass. Second. Councilor Sanchez has a second. Councilors, I think you have a special guest, and if you want to introduce your bill. We do. Um, let's see. I just wanted to uh, start a little background here. Um, it's traumatic for kids um, when something happens and AFR or APD um, are called to their homes. Many times they go to school the next day, and their teachers and school counselors have no idea anything has happened. Handle with Care is a program that was started by Bernalillo County Commissioner Maggie Hart Stebbins several years ago, where first responders let Albuquerque Public Schools know when they respond to a scene and a child is present. Participation dropped off, but we'd like to bring it back and formally place it into the city's code of resolutions. So the program will continue for years to come. We have Vicki Price with us. She's the Director of Counseling for Albuquerque Public Schools. She's on Zoom and presentation. Ms. Price, welcome. Thank you very much. I'd also like to um, introduce um, Dr. Christine Muir. Wonderful. She is, uh, I'll let her introduce herself as well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Chris Muir. I'm the Executive Director for the Student Family Community Supports Division for Albuquerque Public Schools. And I was just going to do a quick introduction. Um, <clears throat> if known that uh, Ms. Armijo, the fourth grader, was going to talk in public comment. We would have asked her to join our presentation. I think she did a better job than we're going to do on this. But um, I'm glad to see that we've got some support out there. So Handle with Care is, we started it just before the pandemic. And it was going really well. And then the pandemic hit. And things started to fizzle out because kids weren't in school. So uh, the program kind of faded away. So we're thrilled that it's getting um, a renewal and a, a new rebirth, regeneration. And I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Price, who's going to take you through what the program is and, and what it looks like. OK. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide, if you don't mind. Thank you. So the Handle with Care program is really a notification and a care system. So it works hand in hand. Um, when uh, first responders and school systems work together, we can notify, uh, they, the first responders can notify the schools so that then we can provide care for the student. Um, of course, we're, we're thrilled that this is being revamped and revitalized. And, and I do wanna thank Councilor Grout for um, getting us started again and lighting the fire here because I think it's re a really important program. So you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So what we know is when um, there's a traumatic event at a house, first responders often see children at the house or the location where the event happens. Um, they often talk to the kids. They're, they're often checking when, when they're okay. But what this program allows them to do is notify us that this, this child has, has been part of something traumatic or something very hard to witness, and they can let the school system know. So the next day, we can provide supports and um, resources if the family needs us as well. Um, but what we can do is just try and mitigate the negative um, impact that traumatic events have on students. Um, really through this initiative, what we're just trying to do is put the, the students first and make sure that their health and well-being um, is taken care of. And we know if we respond to um, trauma quickly in, in a way that works individually for each student, we can help them recover quicker. They can have a healthier response to the trauma. And we can continue to support them in the days and weeks to come because it's not just about the day after the event. 
It's about ensuring that there's ongoing support for the student. So really, this is just a way for us to um, provide additional supports and make sure that kids are always coming first in everybody's mind. So go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as we talked about, it's really a notification system. So the first responders are such a critical role for us because they see the children um, at whatever event is happening and they can identify when there might be extra um, resources that are needed for, for the student. So all they do is ask the child their name. They might ask them the school they go to um, and their date of birth. If they just get their name, we can search for them and, and try and find them. But if we get those other two things, it's helpful in us identifying. They really, um, and then all they would do at that point is they send an email to APS police dispatch saying, here's a handle with care notification. Sometimes there's multiple students in the home. Um, and then we take it from there. So once they send us the information, we will put the handle with care notification process in place. We don't share any, they don't share any details about the event. Um, they don't um, reveal any confidential information. It's just put this kid on your radar. We need you to check on them tomorrow. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So once um, our police department, our school police department receives it, they're going to initiate an email to all the school points of contact. These points of contact are the principal, the counselor, and the nurse at each school. So every email goes to those three people. One of them at that point will take the lead and they will notify teachers and any other staff members that interact with that student that there's a handle with care in place. Um, so they have an important role. We always have them contact three people. Um, so that we can ensure that somebody responds to, to the handle with care notification. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Then once the um, notification gets to the school and we go and talk to the teacher and say, hey, this handle with care notification happened. Here's, then, then they're well aware and, and there's some things they can do to help the student at that point. What we don't do, is we don't question the student about the event. We don't ask them if anything happened last night. Hey, is there anything you want to talk about? We don't do that. If they are exhibiting normal behaviors that day, typical behaviors that um, we would see from them, we don't call them out. Um, kids, kids' ability to handle different events that happen at their home are very different, and we're not going to put them on the spot and ask. But what we are going to do is we're going to look for signs that they're they're struggling. Maybe they're sleepy or they're talking about being hungry. Maybe they don't have their homework ready that day or there's a big test. We're going to pay attention to what we're seeing and, and we're going to provide support. So again, we don't question the student, but we do have eyes on. You can go to the next slide, please. So there are things they can do, like I was talking about, just monitor behavior. Now, if the student is upset, they're exhibiting you know, signs of sadness or depression or tiredness, of course, we're going to react immediately. That's going to be a referral to the school counselor on site or the school nurse, depending on what we're seeing with the student. And at that point, we still don't question the student. But I can tell you many times at that point, the student is ready to talk to somebody about what's happened. So we, we go on their time frame, we let them take the lead, and we just follow along and provide supports that are needed. Um, we, we will respond if the student wants to talk, if, if they're, you know, highly agitated or upset, um, we, will, we will certainly take good care of them that day and, and also in the days and weeks that follow. Sometimes these notifications are great because it, it might be a kid that wasn't necessarily on our radar before, but needs to be on our radar now um, as somebody who might need a little extra TLC and attention as they move forward. So um, I would say what I love about this program is that we don't in insert ourselves into the students or the family's lives, but we're there when they need us. We're there when they wanna talk about something. We're there to help 
um, with that trauma response, with the healing after the trauma. We can also um, help the family find resources if that's needed. Uh, we can put many, many things in place once we get that notification. Um, I, I would say it's one of the programs that um, I'm most proud of in APS. We, um, we, we did um, several notifications before, and I would say the students always felt like they were supported. And like I said, when they were ready to talk, we were right there. Um, and even when they weren't ready to talk and just needed um, a soft place to land for the day, we could provide that as well. So you can go to the next slide. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but I am open to those if there are any. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate that. So before we go to questions, actually, we have one public speaker here in our public comment process. So we're going to take them, and then we'll turn this over to counselors to follow up. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. We have Marilyn Beck on Zoom. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to say specifically, thank you. My name is Marilyn Beck. I'm the founder and executive director of New Mexico Child First Network. Um, we are a nonprofit dedicated to improving the lives specifically of children Im impacted by foster care and those impacted by the child welfare systems. Um, you don't have to look further than today's headline or Sunday's editorial to see just how great this need is. And we are so grateful for Councilor Grout and Councilor Sanchez and all of the body, as well as Albuquerque Police Department. The, the, I know the county commission's been involved, and I know specifically APS has been leading the effort on this. Um, we have been working to try to bring this back to the city for the past year. Um, we couldn't do that without City Councilor Grout and then all of your support. Um, unfortunately, New Mexico's children have the highest adverse childhood experiences of any child in the country. 66% um, of children in the United States have an adverse childhood experience score, an ACE score of zero to one um, in New Mexico. 66% of children in New Mexico have an ACE score of four or higher. And at four or higher, if you're not familiar with adverse childhood experiences, um, it really starts to become a determination of public health and concern, um, diabetes, heart, heart disease, suicide ideation, mental health, you name it. And so if we can start to mitigate trauma, and if we can start to actually bring these resources to the front lines of our schools and our children, um, I really think this is going to increase. This is going to help the children. This is going to help the families. This is going to help the teachers. This is going to help our community. This is going to help first responders. This, I mean, this is such a win for our entire community. I don't think we could do better. And I also just want to say thank you to the fourth grader who spoke earlier, because I do think she did better than all of us. So mm -hmm. um, this is such a win for New Mexico. This is such a win for Albuquerque and our community. And I just want to say thank you to all of us. Thank you. Mr. Cornelius, do we have any other speakers? No, Mr. President. Thanks. We are back on to the sponsors. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments in reference to this. Everyone knows I'm a, it's no secret that I'm a, a retired law enforcement officer. And some of the hardest calls that I ever had to deal with have to deal with, with child trauma. You know, one of the biggest calls that I dealt with that I still remember very, very clearly is was a uh, domestic violence, a violent domestic violence that happened in a murder-suicide of both parents and the kids who are very, very young were trying to, re to bring their dead parents to life after being shot. It was just awful. And for a child to have to go to school the next day or even a week or even a month later is gotta be a very, very difficult scene and scenario. Um, I don't know how a child is able to deal with those things. I know they say that children are the most resilient, and they have to be. But by, but but without us giving them the help and support that we need throughout APS, and to make sure that they fall and they have a soft landing when when these things happen and they fall, and there's a soft place to to land, is so very important to everyone in our, in our community. It helps all of us for future generations. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for, for supporting this. I know this is a no-brainer to this council. Um, we will always support our children, and we will support those who support our children. And so I just want to say thank you to everybody here um, for their continued support. Thank you. Councilor Grout. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Sanchez. Um, I wanted, I'm just thrilled that our whole community is 
behind this. Um, Jasmine DeSidero, I probably butchered your name. She's the Deputy Director of ACS. The fi Fire Chief Emily Armijo is here. And um, we have Commander George Vega from the APD. What's really thrilling about this whole program is that everybody, again, is thrilled to be part of this. Children are that important to all of us. And um, sometimes they get lost, and we can't let that happen anymore. We need to do a better job of taking care of them. So I think this is a, a good first step. Um, APS has wonderful, um, wonderful, op, um, a wonderful program in, in, in place, and they just need to have that, um, the information. They can't do that if we don't share our, the information we know. So um, with this, I'm excited for it to get rolling. Um, each department has their own special operating procedures that will be written into their, their program, and then they'll, they'll get uh, with APS police, and it'll, they'll go from there. So we're going to help these kids. We're going to get those ACE numbers up, and we're going to make a difference, I hope. That's my goal. And so I urge you all support. Okay. Counselors, any other comments? Mr. Surasau, you're here. We're going to put you on the spot. Anything from the administration? I don't think you get to do this very often. Surely we have to have questions for you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I can't say enough about what everyone has said here tonight. I, I just, you know, we're very supportive of this. And I know, uh, Councillor Drought, I, you know, we do have to take care of our kids and watch out for them. So thank you. The administration who speaks in short sentences, that's great. <laughs> Councilors, any other questions? I think we have, for the record, I think Councilor uh, Pena may have joined us by Zoom now for this section. Is that right, Ms. Hinojos, Mr. Cornelius? Councilor Pena, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Oh, great, and welcome. So at this point, we are going to do our roll call votes. We just practiced a lot for the first half uh, when she was <laughs> excused. So, Madam Clerk, would you please call the vote? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. It passes unanimously. Congratulations. And thank you both for joining us this evening from APS. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much for your partnership. Thank you. Thank you, and congrats, Councilors. Councilor Bassan, 055. Mr. President, 055, Committee Substitute 3, amending the City Inspector General Ordinance, Chapter 2, Article 17 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I move it to pass. I'll do a second. Mr. President, uh, I just if it's okay with you, I would like to have a discussion about both 055 and 056 with the Council and the Administration and the Inspector General and the Interim Internal Auditor. Uh, because I do think that there has been a lot of work involved in this. It's my intention to defer these two bills when we're done having some discussion. I recognize that we have a big agenda, but at the same time, I think that when it's just five of us in a committee and let's have more meetings and let's, you know, I think that this would be really good to have the full council at this point to be able to weigh in some of the priorities of the IG, the IA, and the administration because I am sponsoring by request. So... Um, you know, I have made it clear that if there's like a hard, we have to have this in here, then let, let's let it roll. So if it's okay with you, um, I would like to invite the IG, the interim IA up here. Mr. Pacheco is going to come up here as well. Come on down. So that way we can have a discussion. So there's been some accommodations in these bills. We have had a meeting. We did not finish discussing. It was a meeting with the admin, with the IG, with the IA. Um, with our council staff, we did not finish getting through the concerns um, in that meeting. However, it was all um, an attract changes document so that we could kind of evaluate and, and figure out some ways to go. The IG in particular has made some concessions and accommodations on some things. So if it's okay with you, I would like to for now kind of skip that and get to really what the IG in particular is saying is a hard has to stay in. So that way you can hear the reasoning why it's a, it's a requirement to keep this in the ordinance. And then I'd like to hear from administration on really why they, why they struggle with keeping it in the ordinance so that we can, 
figure out a path to go forward in the next few weeks with a new floor substitute where it does either accommodate everybody or nobody or we figure out what to do next. So the first one I'm gonna um, talk about is the clause regarding um, the IG can only be removed for cause by two thirds of the council. Um, and Ms. Santi Stavon, if you want to go ahead and if we can, I mean, try to keep it kind of brief because otherwise we'll be here all night and Mr. President won't allow us to get through it. Nope. So, um, you know, if you can kind of explain why you think for cause is really necessary and then, you know, if Mr. Botka can explain why he thinks it's not necessary, if at any time any of you counselors would like to ask council staff why they have, you know, I mean, we've, I've worked with them repeatedly too on how to proceed with this and what we think might be legal, what might not be legal, and how to go from there as well. So Ms. Santi Stavon, can we start with the for cause clause? The proposed for clause uh, for removal of an inspector general is consistent with the Green Book standards for independence. Now the Green Book is a book that is put out. It has the principles and standards set forth by the Association of Inspector Generals, which actually is the leading authority across the nation on inspector general's offices. With that, um, it's a common experience of inspector generals that those who do the job to the full extent of their authority are often subject to political retaliation from those affected by the inspector general investigation. If we institute a four cause requirement, what that will do is it will ensure appropriate means of preventing arbitrary and capricious removal while also ensuring that there is a process for removing the inspector general when there is cause. Mr. President, if we can hear from Mr. Botka a little bit about why, why the administration is opposed to putting in the clause for cause. That sounds like a question, Mr. Botka. Thank you, Mr. President and Council. First of all, I want to appreciate uh, Councillor Hassan's initiative in convening these meetings. It was very helpful. I also want to clarify that uh, administration actually supports the Office of uh, Inspector General and Internal Audit in spirit. However, we believe that there has to be some checks and balances and some rail guards. Uh, in, in regards to uh, adding the language that uh, the person can be terminated only by cause, I believe that that's already kind of taken care of because you need a super majority in AGO to, to terminate someone. So I believe that there is that democratic process already in, uh, built in to the process and um, for cause is a very subjective word. Uh, who is going to decide that this is for the cause and uh, if there is an argument about it, who would uh, be finally deciding that it is for cause or it is not for cause? So we believe that because there is a supermajority, I'm sorry, because there is a supermajority required, I think it's it's been taken care of in a way. Thank you, M Mr. President. I will say that when I was discussing certain items about for cause and the removal for cause from the, if the IG were to ever be removed for cause, the point is made that how do you do an investigation upon anybody without fear of any kind of potential retaliation if there's not the concept of not having your job threatened if it's just a, it remains as an unclassified position. Um, so Mr. Melendrez or Ms. Ronquillo, when it's for cause, is that inherent because it's in AGO? Because to me, also if we're saying for cause by a two-thirds majority vote of the council, that's still nine members versus AGO is five that are appointed also um, between the council and, and the administration. So if for cause is something that would be okay for AGO, why would it, is it wrong? Would it be inappropriate to have it be so where the council would remove for cause by two thirds vote? Mr. President, Council Bassan, uh, to answer that question, I'll just kind of relay some of the rationale that, that we've discussed um, with the admin and, and with you and just talking through this. Um, this is all sort of informed by recent changes at the CPOA and the CPOA ordinance and um, the City Council has authority in that instance to remove the director um, of the CPOA for cause by a supermajority vote. Uh, in that instance, the CPOA board itself also has the authority to move the director. Um, and one of the concerns that may or may not you know, manifest that this could address within the discretion of the council 
um, is the instance where a, um, an official of the city, whether it be the CPOA director, the IG, the IA, is accountable only to a board of volunteers and not having um, direct accountability to the folks that are accountable to the voters, so to speak. Um, and you know, as, as much independence as can be injected into the system for, for good reason, there's, there's good reason to also have a, a balance on accountability as well. And so in order to potentially promote that accountability, again, if the council believes that that level of, of accountability <laughs> is appropriate, um, that that's, was the genesis for this proposal, to have the ability for the council to intervene, um, most likely in a very extreme circumstance, it's not the type of thing the council usually treads into. Um, and in it, if so, only based on an articulable basis, not anything completely arbitrary. Thank you. And Mr. President, I know that one of the other conversations is that, you know, if, if for cause is put in there by two-thirds vote of the council, then the mayor should be able to remove somebody for cause too. And I, I do personally disagree with that. Um, but I want that's, that's your teaser of this point. Um, I really, there's a few more that I want to get through, and so I feel like this is opening that conversation with all of you so that we know, and I hope you will get briefings from Ms. Ronquillo, you will meet with the IG, the IA, the administration, you will find out really where you stand on this ordinance when it comes back before the council, because I think at this point, we can keep spinning wheels, and this is why I wanted to move it from committee, but we can keep spinning wheels and keep changing it, and, but it's not going to make everyone happy. So we're going to need to work together to figure out what that's going to look like. Um, Mr. President, moving on to the next one. Uh, there has been some issue with the attorney, the city attorney, through no real fault of their own. It, to me, is very um, timely in what's been happening. But uh, the city attorney and changing some of the rules uh, in this ordinance for representation of the AGO and for the IG. Uh, so I would like to discuss that as well and have uh, Ms. And also, for the record, <laughs> Ms. Vargas is here. but. Her AGO ordinance kind of hinges on what we do with the IG ordinance. And so she is here to answer questions, but just she's been involved in this situation as well. And so, but Councilor Rasan, before you do that, I'll totally let you call the shots here. Uh, we do have one public speaker on 056, so when you get into that portion, okay. we'll just be sure to include them so that we can keep that going. Noted, and thank you for, for pointing that out. So Ms. Santi Stavan, will you please start with just kind of explaining the city attorney and why we need to keep the changes that, why, why you would like to keep the changes that are suggested in here? Yes, thank you, Councilor Bassan. One of the things I do want to start off by saying is that each of these changes that we're talking about maintaining in this ordinance that were proposed is because it creates structural independence. Um, and that's, very, that's necessary for an office of IG. We need to be structurally independent so that we can uh, fully perform the duties that we're charged with, with performing. Um, and that is accountability and transparency to the constituents and the city. Um, when we talk about the legal um, issues, first of all, it's in, there's an inherent conflict when the IG has to rely on a city attorney who answers to, or an associate attorney who answers to the city attorney, um, and, and we're asking questions that may be in opposition to a city position. So that, that's going to inherently be an issue for us. So having the ability to have independent counsel is going to be imperative for that structural independence that we need. Um, one of the things, as you alluded to, Councilor Bassan, is that we've had a recent issue uh, that arose where, where the IG's office was informed that we would no longer be represented by the city attorney's office. Now, that was subsequently reversed to us to some extent, they will not assist the uh, uh, Inspector General's office with certain items, but other items they can. So we have to ask and inquire about that. Something that we came across as we went through this process, and many of these things we've encountered um, obstacles along at least my tenure here. Um, but specifically with the legal counsel, we have a dedicated person, uh, dedicated attorney to our office, but it appears that those attorneys may be called to do um, or work on uh, other cases that come um, on behalf of the city. 
which then may ultimately be in opposition, and they may not know that. Um, and so whenever we get to this level of having discussion or we're in a situation and someone then tells me, my attorney tells me, uh-oh, I wrote um, a dissent letter on that, um, but then we have an issue because I've been confiding in that individual. Um, everything I have, and now I realize that we're in opposition. And so, it, we, I mean, we discovered that, and again, I think that through the discussions, it was through no intentional um, situation, but that there was conflict of interest, and then the list of conflict counsel then for this particular issue also had conflicts of interest. So the IG's office was actually kind of in a pinch without re representation and therefore couldn't finish an investigation either. So it's a chicken and the egg and um, a roundabout way that we need to have some kind of clause in this ordinance that makes sure to stipulate that, sure, maybe the city's city attorney that's appointed and, and put on to work for the IG, that might be fine or it might not, but then the conflict council could or couldn't be okay, but then we need to have a third option. Um, and this is similar to what we had discussed too with CPOA and kind of that, you know, trying to streamline this ordinance along with um, the CPOA board and the CPOA as well for, for that independence. But um, to be fair, I want to make sure that Mr. Botka can also give his side of why, why there is a problem or why administration is not okay with this, please. Um, Council President Davis, Councilor Bassan, um, I think there may have been some kind of miscommunication because I am not opposed to this. Um, I, in fact, feel that it's probably the best solution. Uh, and my understanding, and I, I may be wrong, but there had been issues raised or the, about the possibility of having outside counsel before this conflict arose. And to be clear, the conflict arose that the attorney who recently assigned to represent the OIG had done work prior, that then it came to light that, that uh, it, was, it was the same issue and he could no longer provide representation, but he had done that work prior. Um, but I've, but I, my understanding is the question had been raised before whether we needed outside counsel for the OIG. I also understood at the time that we had counsel available. It turned out she was not. Um, but I do think that, prop, that, that this kind of three-step process that the ordinance lays out, that the city attorney's office will be the first line. If not, we'll look at, at our count, outside counsel list. And if not, we will then go look for other counsel. I, I think that's a reasonable proposal. Okay, and Mr. President and Ms. Keefe, thank you. That, that makes the upcoming floor substitute a smidge easier, but it also lends me to plant the seed too that if we were to go this route and the IG's office does need to hire outside counsel, then they also need to have that budget. So um, we're getting there, and I promise I'm trying to be concise, but I'll also be very fast on 056. Uh, so the next one is um, a clause that says, a report that unless otherwise prohibited has been presented to the committee, meaning the AGO committee, distributed in final form to the mayor and chief administrative officer and to the city council and is available to the public. Uh, this, this would mean that it would, be, um, it would be actually presented. And so I know that there's some, some you know, recourse or some misunderstanding or something that the admin does not like this either, but you really want it in there. So will you please clarify the purpose of that? I just think that from the standpoint of the IG's office, we don't have a problem with this definition of publication or when a report becomes published. It seems very clear and concise, and it meets the needs of what we would and be published, looking for. Published is the word I couldn't grab in my brain. So, um, and Mr. Botka, and I know that we've had some conversations about this too, but if you can kind of go into why, why it's the administration is concerned about this. Um, President Davis and uh, Councillor Bassan, uh, I think we can work on this uh, with the IG and figure out the timeline and sequencing of the reporting. I think our issue is more about the, the interpretation of definition of confidentiality from IG. And uh, we believe that uh, you know, it is the interpretation by IG is very subjective. Uh, we believe that uh, it adds value when that report is briefed to the AGO and to the council member who is assigned to the AGO and the administration. It makes sense to have that particular director whose department is investigated to be present 
and that report, the draft report should be shared with that director unless the director herself or himself is target of the investigation. And I believe, generally speaking, I have seen that there are questions from AGO members, there are questions from the uh, attending council members who are very meaningful, and based on that, sometime the AGO wants uh, the IG or the internal auditor to actually- Mr. Baca, this is, that's a different one that's right. coming up regarding the director being in the meetings. That one's another one coming up. Yes. But this one was about the published, the definition of the word published. So we can work with her on that. Okay, and I'm sorry to that. interrupt you. I just wanted to make sure okay. that we were um, staying on the course of this one, but so. But I so, believe that this is also kind of connected with the issue that you were talking about. Okay, please continue then. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So we, we believe that uh, the transparency is very important. And I think not having the director actually defeats the purpose of the transparency. And we also believe that uh, um, when previous IGs historically had no issue with that definition, then, then they always invited the directors. They always shared the draft report with the director. This particular IG is not willing to share that draft report with the director. So the director cannot uh, meaningfully respond to the findings. Also, well, it, it, last meeting, you know, uh, the AGO actually voted to require a director to be there. And that was voted by majority of the AGO. And that was very useful. So in my opinion, I think that interpretation of definition of confidentiality is very subjective and we disagree with that. Mr. President, uh, and so, I mean, and I, this is one that I need all your help on because I see both sides on it, but I also think that by the time a report has undergone the investigation by the IG, it's been distributed to the AGO committee, it's been distributed to the mayor and the CAO and to the full city council, it's pretty published in my opinion, but that's my like, just my logical side of the brain. So, um, you know, I, I think that this is another one I encourage you to kind of look at, but we will also work, and I, I intend to have more meetings with admin and the IG and the IA so that we can figure out how we're gonna work on some of these. Um, the next one is that, uh, this one, okay, this one, remember I'm the sponsor, because I also agree with both of these sides, but at the same time, the Office of Inspector General should receive a dedicated funding source. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with you, Ms. Sevan. Again, uh, per the Association of Inspector Generals, for structural independence, it's recommended that we have some sort of, of dedicated funding to ensure that we're able to meet the objectives of this office. Um, without that, uh, things can can um, be held back. We can be, our budget can be cut, or we can be stagnated by our budget where we cannot grow, therefore we cannot meet the needs of the city or its constituents. Um, we could have issues where um, we're not, like I said, we're not able to hire, we're not able to get training, we're not able to have the tools or the resources we need to do these investigations. We've, we have had our Inspector General Ordinance since 2010 with no changes to it, no changes. And when they created that Inspector General Ordinance, they did not uh, do so in conjunction with the AG Ordinance. So there was conflicting language in those, between the two. Um, and so with that, we wanna make sure that one, we're able to, to make sure that the changes are being addressed in both, but also we want to make sure that there is dedicated funding um, by the city council or administration for this office to continue. At some point, it was decided that an office of IG was important. At some point, you decided that accountability and transparency was something that you, you thought needed to be addressed. But it also comes with making sure that we have the tools, the resources that we need to be able to fund that office adequately. <clears throat> Otherwise, we're just, we're here spinning our wheels and not accomplishing the objective set forth through the ordinance. 
Thank you. So I'm going to start with a little bit of um, the administration, which I, I do agree with a lot of this as well, that the annual budget priorities for the city can conflict with standing carve-out appropriations, that we can't bind future councils um, into a carve-out of future, future funding, and general funds are not supposed to be and cannot be dedicated funding. Um, I, I'm not, I mean, this one, I'm, I'm not convinced that the IG, that you really have to have this in there so much as something that says there will be adequate funding appropriated to the IG's office, you know, now and forevermore, whatever that algorithm may be. So with that, Mr. Botka, if you want to add any comments. Mr. President and Councillor Bassan, uh, I believe that we have a very rigorous uh, budgetary hearing process. You know, there are multiple opportunities for all the departments, including IG and IA, to present their case to the council. This council is extremely active. They ask detailed questions. I believe that every council should have the right to look at the request every year and also uh, evaluate that in light of all of the department's requests, plus the overall financial situation of the city at that time. There are times when we, have, we are in middle of recession and we need to tighten the belt. Everyone will have to pitch in. Maybe there are furloughs and things like that. So why would we dedicate funding to a department and then we regret it later and put ourselves in a box? Talking about structural independence, uh, I think if you really want structural independence, maybe, maybe you want to consider making this position elected. Uh, as far as the budget, even the Attorney General and State Auditor's Office, who are very independent, they have to go through the budgetary process every year. They have to talk to LFC, they have to talk to legislatures, they have to talk to the administration. And there is a process, and their budget gets increased if there is a real need for that. So I believe that we need to have the faith in the council and the administration that they would listen to all the needs every year and evaluate everything in context of all other circumstances. Thank you. Please, Ms. Santi Stevan, keep this as your warning to be here Thursday night so that if counselors have questions about your funding desires, needs, and, and all of that, that you're here to answer those questions, please. Mr. President, only a few more, I promise. Um, the next one is a larger clause, but really I think, if I'm understanding correctly, the hang up in this clause is that the inspector general may also initiate an investigation um, based off of receiving and investigating complaints referred to by the Board of Ethics. Will you please elaborate on that? Yes, thank you, Councilor Brisson and Councilors. When we talk about the IG being able to initiate uh, investigations, those investigations should be predicated on something that we have seen or that we have uh, been advised of. So when we're doing an investigation, and we are looking at one specific thing, but in the course of looking at that information, we realize that something else is going wrong, maybe there's fraud, maybe there's waste, and maybe there's abuse, then should we not be able to look into it? Should we turn a blind eye? I don't believe that meets the, the um, objective of what our office is there for. So the fact that we would be able to uh, initiate an investigation should be permitted, um, again, with predication. We don't willy-nilly um, set out to investigate or, or make up complaints. Uh, we are completely reactive at this point in time where a complaint comes in and then we will um, assess that complaint. And because of the fact that we've had no funding um, or very little funding in the last two years since I've been here, uh, we are short-staffed, and we have a growing list where we have 20, a backlog right now of 24 cases. Mr. Baca. Mr. President and Councillor Bassan, um, we can work on the language on how this could be possible, and we should have some uh, checks and balances built in. I also feel that uh, even though it is not initiated willy-nilly, it could be. And we have no way to prove that it's not initiated willy-nilly because a lot of investigations begun by way of anonymous complaint. It could be just a phone call. There is no telling that uh, IG may just make it up. I'm not saying she is, but there could be. So we need to 
be very careful. We need to deliberate what kind of language we want to have in this ordinance so that she can initiate uh, investigations. That also could be a tool for her to, to retaliate. So we need to be very careful in uh, what kind of uh, authority we grant by allowing her to initiate investigations. As long as there are rail guards, I think the administration would work with the council and the IG uh, to figure out the appropriate language. Thank you. Mr. President, the next one, Mr. Baca kind of started talking about um, in the AGO committee, um, when, when investigations are not approved by the committee and, and very public, um, the director of whichever department is a, in question is not um, present because of the confidentiality clause that currently exists in the ordinance. So, um, you know, I know that the administration really wants to be able to have the department directors present. I know I've expressed it has been beneficial when sometimes they are there to hear information directly from the department director, but I also can respect that the ordinance says that there's a confidentiality point in here. So trying to find a way um, as compromise, I believe, is how currently the committee sub three is, is listing it. So Ms. Santi Stavon, if you can explain that, please. So as far as the confidentiality clause that is in the current ordinance, um, I do believe that we are adhering to that the way that it is written. And I have to believe that when it was written, it was intentionally written that way. Um, so we do not allow anyone to, to have a copy of the report until it is published. Partly, that's the definition of published and the fact that it's confidential. Uh, the, I will go on to say that the director does not have the full report that has all of the details of everything that we found. But we always provide the director with the allegation, the finding related to that allegation, our management comments or, or uh, recommendations for how to address that. And that should be adequate for them to be able to respond. What it doesn't allow them to do is, is glean information that could be used in a nefarious way. Thank you. And I guess I should also clarify that currently, as written in this proposed version, uh, it's, it's saying that rather than the department director not being there or, or not allowed at all, it's saying the AGO committee during their meeting has the discretion whether or not to allow the department director in. Um, so just to be clear on, on that's kind of where we're writing that. But Mr. Botka, if you want to respond to that one. And then I only have one more after this. President Davis and Councillor Bassan, uh, <clears throat> we believe that the report is released to the administration right now as we speak, uh, which means uh, the mayor, uh, not mayor, but CAO, and uh, uh, myself, who I'm representing the CAO, I have access to that draft report. I see no point in not, not sharing that information with the director, because the director is extension of the administration. They are appointed. They are very high level people to just kind of uh, uh, kind of suggest that they would not keep it confidential does not make sense to me. Uh, sometime I have heard that it is because to protect the whistleblowers. Now the whistleblowers, if there are, their name is redacted, their position is generally redacted. And if the CAO or the CFO has that information, what good it does by not sharing that with director because I can share that information with the director. So, I think that confidentiality interpretation is something I completely disagree with. It's very subjective. And I would make it a default requirement that the director should be given the draft report. You, you get the summary of the findings, which is sometimes one page or two page. And the report could be 45 pages. There are a lot of information in the report which the director needs to know to meaningfully respond to the findings. So therefore, I, I believe that we should have directors in all the AGO briefing unless the director is personally targeted. Thank you, Mr. President. So the last one, honestly, I think that when we have our meetings, we can probably rectify through our conversations. It's regarding should the state auditor be included and then 
the OIG says no because it's defined and covered by the term agency, I think it, I, I think that should be something that if we converse and talk about, we can probably figure out what the right terminology is rather than sit here and go back and forth about it. But I hope that counselors, please, please know that this has not been rushed. There has been a lot of effort put into this. There probably is, is not going to be one clear solution, but this is where I think it's our job to figure out what's the best solution in the update of this ordinance, being that it has been, how, since when? When was the, 10, 2010? Was uh, when 2010 was when the IG ordinance was created, and that was the only time. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's been 12 years. At, for I promise you I'm learning that ordinance updates are not something that you should take lightly. So please, please review it. Please meet with staff. Me, I will meet with the administration and, and both offices and our staff and keep working on a solution for a floor sub, but will you please take a look at it and see really where your hearts lie and where your representation of your constituents is to where you believe that for the Inspector General Ordinance, you will be doing the best job for, for the people that you represent as well because I think that we have to come to a compromise in some areas and there are there is a need a serious need to update it for the structural independence but also uh, for us to be productive as a city, whether it's from the council side, the, IG, the independent office side, or the administration. So with that, I would like to move a deferral. Um, let, wait, let me ask this question. If we have a floor sub, then it will be introduced at the next meeting. So if I just defer this for a month, that should be fine. And I can introduce the floor sub in two weeks. Um, Mr. President, Council Bassan, if you plan to introduce a floor sub in two weeks, then you should defer it to, for to two, two weeks. weeks mm -hmm, to okay, May that's what I would like to do, please. So that way we can move on from there, please. I have a motion and several seconds on the motion for deferral of our May 15th meeting. Any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the vote on the motion for deferral? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Grout? Yes. Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Lewis? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. That passes unanimously. Councillors, next we're going to be on 056. Councillor Hassan, we'll let you introduce it. We do have a speaker, and then we'll come back for your final motion, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. 056, Committee Substitute 3, amending the accountability and government ordinance. Chapter 2, Article 10 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque, I move a due pass. And I'll second it for the record. Uh, Councilor, do you have a motion, a final motion on this? Yes, I will be changing my motion to a deferral once we hear from public okay. comment. So if it's okay, let's just take this as a motion for a 15, till the 15th, is that right? Um, yes, so thank you, Ms. Vargas for sitting here and riding the wings <laughs> of the IG ordinance because I know that you've put a lot of time into this as well. I think it's really important. I don't want to cut her off. I just so, want to make sure we get the right record. Perfect. Yes, then if we can do it now, I just didn't want to. So yes, for two weeks. I would like to move a deferral for two weeks. Thanks, because I forget. We have a motion and a second for a deferral for two weeks. Uh, if it's okay, Councillor, let's take our public comment and we'll come back to our guests in person. Uh, Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker and only speaker is Peggy Neff. You are muted. You are muted, Peggy. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you, counselors. Thank you for being out here late at night. Uh, Councilor Bassan, thank you for opening the forum for discussion. It's very interesting to hear this uh, approach. And uh, thank you for bringing this revision before city council. For many years, along with many other community members, we've asked for improved oversight for city administration, for city management, and respectfully for city council members' undertakings. In this revision, we can significantly improve it by a, a couple of amendments, and I'm looking forward to your floor substitute. I would think that under the duties and the roles, the powers and membership under 210.5, where subsection K defines the roles in two sentences of a, the independent committee. I think the first sentence says that the committee may provide the city auditor and the inspector general with guidance, priorities, and potential areas for investigations and audits. I think perhaps it needs to be the word shall 
in order to give the committee clarity of this basic role and to uh, underscore their responsibility and their, their, the significance of this role, the word may doesn't do it. This is a, an important role and it needs to be strengthened and it needs to be given the significance of the word shall, not the word may. If it needs to be mitigated to provide for unintended consequences and circumstances beyond the control of an independent committee, perhaps it could read, to the best of their ability, the committee shall provide guidance and perhaps maybe suggested priorities. I'll forward you these notes. They got drafted real quickly because I wanted to be able to say something also about how important oversight is for the integrated development ordinance. I wonder how many of the 25 open cases that the it's okay you can finish your thought i just wonder how many of those cases are involved uh, the ido is involved in we need oversight built into the ido we've asked for substantive amendments to have maps and to have priorities or to have comments from hey. the public summarized, to have risk Thank analysis you, clearly stated, to have impact statements, to have the beneficiaries identified. Thank you, so Ms. Neff. One... We're gonna cut you off there though. We gave you a time to finish that thought, but it was a long sentence. Thank you, ma'am. It's the same thing we've been asking for many, many times. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. President, I would just like to invite Ms. Vargas to, I mean, if there's anything you want to add or discuss about the AGO part, I know that, again, there are, there are two parts in this AGO ordinance. One is that whatever happens in the IG ordinance, we should make sure to mirror that in the AGO ordinance where it would be duplicated. And that's why this one is, is kind of being held up. But there are other things in here that I think are going to be beneficial. And, and I think much less... Um, contentious as well. So Ms. Vargas, do you have anything that you'd like to state? No, I think I would just like to add, um, as you look at the ordinances, the way it's written, my office doesn't have as many challenges as Melissa's. But I think it's the perfect time to tweak it and make sure that everyone's in agreement on what's in it. Um, we appreciate your feedback. This has been a long road, and I know that we're not done, but it just makes us a more effective office. So thank you. Thank you. And Mr. President, I, to be fair, I would like to find out if the administration wants to add anything about the AGO ordinance in particular, or if we're good to go kind of moving forward. Mr. You, Mr. President, Ms. Yara has something to say. Ms. Yara. Mr. President and counselors, thank you for listening to our uh, concerns on these two ordinances. Um, um, our, our concerns uh, with the the AGO ordinance mirror a lot of what we talked about in the IG ordinance, but there are a few things I want to mention that are a little bit different because it's more comprehensive. Um, first of all, I want to go back to the first point that was made in the IG ordinance about for cause and removing the inspector general for cause. Um, that also is in the AGO IA ordinance. Now, I'm, I'm not as concerned about as the for cause definition I'm a little bit more concerned about the independence issues that might be created if the council is able to remove the, the city auditor or the inspector general without the administration having the same power. The reason being is that it might be the case that either of these offices would um, investigate or audit a counselor, the council, the administration, the mayor, the CAO, um, which causes independence issues for both offices. They might be beholden to the administration. They might be beholden to the council if they know they have the power to remove them. That is the whole reason I think that the AGO committee was created um, to in, in fact oversee these offices, these two um, positions, and to make recommendations for removal if that were necessary. To remove the council and the mayor um, as an independence issue. So as a CPA, I have to say that. Um, the AGO IA ordinance has a few things that are a little bit different. I just want to mention, um, as written, um, it says that if the city auditor is removed, then their first assistant automatic, automatically will become interim city auditor. I think that is also an independence issue. If there were any um, personnel 
some collusion, who knows? I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. But it's up to the AGO committee to decide who becomes city auditor. That is their power. So they would, if the city auditor were to leave, they would have to decide who the interim auditor is. Um, I did notice in the back of the AGO ordinance, there was a listing of everything that the internal auditor has to put into their reports. I see that all of that was struck out, and it just says, you know, she can, he or she can put in as they see fit what needs to be in the report. Um, the IG ordinance actually added a list of things that should be in the report. So I just think they need to be consistent. There are standards for auditors to follow and they need to have specific items in their report. So I think that needs to stay in. Um, one more thing, I just want to go back to this whole issue of what is a published report. Okay, so right now as written and I think as it exists in the ordinance, um, the inspector general or the city auditor can present a report to the AGO committee. They don't have to approve it. They don't have to vote on it. But within 15 days after that presentation, the report can become published. Um, I remember when they changed this part of the ordinance because it was to um, actually prohibit or discourage people um, from, from send, uh, actually an inspector general from giving the report to the media before the administration or the council had the chance to see it. Um, but I'm, I'm afraid this might be swinging also the other way as to, you know, if there was an issue with the report that the AGO had a question about and wasn't answered, or if they had a question about the process that, that produced that investigative or audit report, they should be able to vet that with the city auditor and the inspector general before that report is published. Um, and that's, that's a pretty much the three things I saw differently, so thank you for your time. Ms. Santos-Tavon, briefly. Thank you, President Davis. I just wanted to say that in, re in um, response to Ms. Yara's comment uh, regarding the fact that a report can be published uh, 15 days after it is presented <coughs> at the AGO, what that, that clause says is it's presented to them if they decide not to vote on it because they have an issue with it that cannot be uh, accommodated in some way, then they have 15 days to write a cautionary statement that gets added to the report before it is published. That, that uh, clause or language that's in there was not intended uh, to make it where a report could be disseminated without the AGO's review. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Vargas, go ahead very briefly if you. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to address uh, two Mrs. Yara's points. Um, I just forgot my thought. Um, no. So, okay, about um, AGO selecting like an interim internal uh, city auditor. We just went through a peer review of the Association of Local Government Auditors. And unfortunately, during that time frame, we had uh, the city IG acting as a city auditor. And because they were unaware of some of the CPE requirements, that was a finding on our office. And so I think that wording was included to ensure an individual would become acting city auditor in the interim, uh, but would know the requirements that they need to adhere to. Um, the other thing about the language in the ordinance being struck about what requirements are in the reports, those are requirements from the yellow book and I'm fine leaving them in. The only concern I have is, is that the yellow book's going to be, and I'm sorry, government auditing standards. Um, that's going to be updated this year. And so we might lock in requirements that become obsolete at a certain point. And I think we can all see how hard it is to crack open an ordinance and, and fix it. So just some of my thoughts. Thank you. Well, this one's been more hard than usual. Um, yeah, so, Councilor. We do have to get on to other yep. stuff. No, Mr. President, I'm all set uh, with the deferral. I just, again, really urge you all to take a look at these and ask questions, please. 
And let me echo that. Like I made the mistake of dipping my toe into this water a little bit earlier, a few months back, and it has been a few months. Um, but if we're going to have a floor sub, it needs to address all these questions because we keep having one answer from the council, one answer from our quasi-independent agencies, and then the third wheel of the or the third leg of the stool says, "Oh, I don't like that. I want to do it this way." And then we go back to the starting line. Like somebody's got to come up with something that at least two out of three can agree on. Um, so that we can have a conversation because we can't keep deferring this every two weeks at the full council. Um, and you've done a great job of trying to merge all those pieces together and getting it here is important, but I mean, this could take forever. So um, I just want to say, like, I realize there's a lot of disagreement here over these substantive questions, but we got to settle this at some point. So and I think we'll see you on Thursday anyway for budget, right? Yes, and Mr. President, just so everyone knows, I will. I just directed staff to set up another meeting with all of us so that we can continue to review and, and try to work through as much of it as possible. Great. Councilors, any other questions on the motion for a deferral? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the vote? Councilor Passan? Yes. Councilor Benton? Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn? Yes. Councilor Grout? Yes. Councilor Jones? Yes. Councilor Lewis? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. It passes unanimously. Thank you, Councillors, and thank you, Councillor Besson, for getting this moving forward. Councillor Fiebelkorn, 059. Thank you, Mr. President. This is 059, a committee substitute adopting a new article in Chapter 13 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque, 1994, Business and Occupations, to be known as the Residential Rental Database Ordinance, establishing an enrollment requirement. Move a due pass. I'll second it. Do you want me to open or we have some nope. public comment? It's up to you, ma'am. Okay. you want to open or you want to comment? Sure. I'll open real quickly. Um, so this bill is uh, requires a free enrollment in a database for long-term rental units in the city of Albuquerque. We already require um, a, more, a much more detailed annual filing for short-term rental unit owners, um, and they're required to pay a fee. But you're not, we're not requiring that for the long-term rental um, anymore. And I'll quickly just go through the big changes that happened from the original bill to the committee substitute. Originally, there were more data points required. And we heard from industry that they did not like that. So we did back it out to be just the basic information that's required. There were originally updates to your um, enrollment in the database that would have happened after every change in um, uh, a lease, we struck that, and now it's just an annual update. If nothing's changed, you can literally go on and say nothing's changed. Um, and then originally, we had it as a permit system where um, the landlords were required to pay a permit fee. We heard that that was not something that they were interested in, and so we did back that out as well. This database is now going to be free, um, so there would be no charge to the landlords to use it. Um, so with that, I guess we could just go to... Public comment. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Cynthia Rodriguez, followed by Annalie de Salmiers. Thank you. I'm with the People's Housing Project. Uh, yeah, I think that having a database where we're keeping track of our long-term rental units is important because it helps us figure out what we're lacking when we're talking about the housing crisis that's facing the city right now. So we know that we're, behind, we're short thousands of units of affordable housing units in the city, um, but we don't know if that's because landlords are charging outrageous prices in rent or if that's because there's physically not enough housing here. So having that kind of a database would let us know what we're working with and know what exactly we need to tackle. Because I guarantee you probably what's happening is that we need more physical units that are habitable, but also to stop landlords from being able to charge these outrageous prices that no family or single person is able to actually pay for. Um, I, I think that you know just starting even with the bare minimum, there's no harm in asking or having a landlord say how many units they have, how many are occupied. Um, that's bare minimum, honestly. And the fact that it's free and it, they don't even have to pay for a permit, they really should. They should, they should have some kind of permit 
and some kind of thing that, you know, actually where code is enforced so that they're not able to run these slums that are here in the city of Albuquerque. I mean, I encourage any one of you to just drive through the International District, stop at any like T and C apartment complex in the International District and just see what the conditions are and tell me that that man, Chuck Sheldon, shouldn't have to pay for a permit and also be held to code. Um, so I think that this, uh, this ordinance is really good. I think that you guys should pass it and I think in the future should actually even improve and you know, put more like things in there, you know, to actually make sure that there's inspections that are happening so that they aren't allowed to do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Annalie DeSalmiers, followed by Kevin Branham. Hello, good to see you all again. Um, thank you to Tammy Fibicone for bringing um, 02259. Uh, I feel like, how are we gonna solve the housing crisis without knowing how many units we have, without having any type of data to look at to see how we're going to solve it? Uh, it seems like a extremely reasonable um, thing to request from landlords. Uh, and you know, you, you all have heard us come and, and talk to you about the slum conditions, you know. Um, we've talked to you about parents having to bathe their children in gas station bathrooms, elders having, um, you know, health flare-ups because they don't have cooling in the summer. You've heard about all of those things, but what are we really asking for? We're asking for consumer protections. And it's a very reasonable ask. Um, you know, tenants deserve to be able to, you know, lock you know, rent an apartment, get into a lease, and feel confident in their purchase. Uh, the fact that it's free, I mean, come on, like what, what more, how else can we really make this super easy um, for landlords to comply to? I'm, I'm really curious as to um, what the possible objections might be. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, how you all really wanna protect kids and, and you know, how you were talking about having that program. Well, all of these people that come out that talk to you about the things that the landlords are doing, their parents, their grandparents, um, there's children in these apartments that um, you know we're asking for you all to start um, implementing something, and, and this is a great, 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 great first step. Um, so you know, if if they want to come and say that some of this is inconvenient, like are you going to tell those children that you know, oh, we couldn't pass it because it was inconvenient for landlords? I really, really hope not. Um, I think this is a super, super reasonable ordinance, and please pass it. Thank you so much. Kevin Brownham, followed by Todd Clark. Hello again. I'm uh, also with the People's Housing Project. Uh, so you all heard my uh, description of uh, my example of the conditions that we've uh, seen about, you know, sewage backing up in people's sinks and stuff. You know, this this ordinance would, yeah, uh, like Annalise said, be a really good first start in holding, um, it, it would be a really good first step in yeah, yeah, overall. But I'll just finish the last point that I had that I uh, uh, had earlier. One, yes, it's a simple, a simple bill to uh, pass. It's a, it's, it couldn't be any more simple. <laughs> uh, and you know, if landlords, basically if landlords are not required to report how many units they own, how many are filled, how many are empty, and how much they're charging rent, then we can't adequately understand, you know, how much of a housing uh, rental accessibility problem is related to rents being too high or if there actually is homes that need to be built. So, um, yeah, uh, that's all I really had to add. Please uh, pass 02259. Todd Clark, followed by Roger Culp. Mr. President, counselors, my name is Todd Clark and I live in District 2. Wanted to thank you for the opportunity to speak against 02259. Um, there are a number of issues with this legislation, starting with the fact that it's a mismatch with current state laws. And I'm doubtful the city has the resources to track this many properties. The primary issue is that it makes an owner or manager 
and their information on rents, fees, vacancy, utility info, very public to their competition, to other residents, to the assessor, to national data collection firms, and to attorneys. I'm not aware of any other local business that's required to report to the city government on their income or their expenses. It also requires an owner to attest if their units are, excuse me, ADA accessible, which is not currently required and could likely increase their legal liability for making that certification. It's not something that you're required to do in a residential property. Additionally, New Mexico is a non-disclosure state, which means the assessor does not have access to your income and expenses unless you file a property tax protest. If this legislation passes, the assessor would have cause to build a financial model to demonstrate your property is underassessed and seek to increase property tax revenues to the local government. Finally, if the intent of this legislation is to one, gather essential data on the rental market, two, improve communications with city property owners, and three, protect the health, safety, and general welfare of residents, rental occupants, neighborhood residents, and property owners, I would propose the following. One, there's national and regional data sources available today. You don't need any of to get this information, so they're readily available. Two, I think our communities would be better served to have a requirement that property managers and owners obtain a version of a business license that the city issues a unique identification code number that's posted on the property. So when our fire, when our ACS, when our police department's out there in an emergency, they don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out who the owner is. I would encourage you to vote this down. Thank you. Roger Culp, followed by Jay Edwards. Hello, I'm Roger Culp. I'm also an organizer with the People's Housing Project. You've heard some of my colleagues here speak about the horrible conditions we found in some of these uh, apartments we've looked at, as well as how tenants are afraid to report these things to landlords out of fear of both retaliation and eviction. So I urge you to pass this. But I, one thing that hasn't been discussed is how this ordinance might benefit small mom and pop uh, family landlord operations. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but in Philadelphia, they passed a similar ordinance where they, uh, where small family landlords were also, were in addition to being on the registry, were given financial assistance by the uh, city to uh, help bring their properties up to code. And as was just mentioned, we don't have a, a realistic uh, listing of what is and is not affordable housing as far as these apartments are concerned. And if there was such a database online that people could look up with the prices of the rents included, that would help a great deal as far as people who need affordable housing. And I'm sure this would also go a long way toward leaving the problem we see with homelessness that's growing here in Albuquerque. So I urge you to pass this ordinance. Thank you. Jay Edwards, followed by Patrick Gallegos. Thank you, counselors. <clears throat> so I'm going to start by saying that um, personally for me, a marginal increase in the cost of doing business for landlords for um, disability accommodation is less concerning than uh, the homelessness crisis that we're seeing unfold in Albuquerque. I'm speaking in support of O2259 because I believe that it can make a difference for people here. So as we are all painfully aware, uh, we are seeing more and more homeless people here in Albuquerque every year as people are priced out of their homes. We are told that this results from a shortage of housing but of course, this problem also exists in cities like Oakland and Portland, where homeless people are outnumbered by empty housing units four to one. A landlord database will help us to determine whether we are seeing a shortage of housing or an excess of profit seeking here in Albuquerque. This would be simple to implement. All we are asking of landlords is that they submit information that they are already documenting into a database to make our housing reality more transparent than it is today. If, as we have heard time and time again from many property managers, that they want to work with tenants on solving the housing crisis, then this should be a relatively trivial ask. As I have learned in my community work with tenants in Albuquerque, 
We deal not only with laws and a legal system that prioritize landlords, but also a pervasive enforcement problem. Nominally, tenants have the right to a minimum standard in their housing quality. In truth, landlords in Albuquerque communities mislead their tenants and refuse basic repairs whenever it is convenient. <clears throat> I have spoken to tenants and families that have spent multiple winters without heat, and another elderly tenant who had a giant hole in her floor for a month as water rose up through the bottom of the floor. As we've seen in Austin, a database can Sir, improve code enforcement. That yes, morning, okay, yeah. I understand. Please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Gallegos, followed by Alan Lisek. Thank you, Mr. President, Councilors. I'd like to urge you to vote yes to this uh, ordinance. Um, I work as a victim and community advocate for missing and murdered Indigenous relatives um, in my career. And I'd just like to say that data is the groundstone, the foundation of what we've been trying to do, uh, mobilizing so we can get data to uh, tackle a problem. I think that's the same kind of um, thing we're going for here. We need a baseline of data to attack a crisis. Um, there are many different crises, crises that are happening in New Mexico. And um, a data such as this, a rental registry that can hold landlords accountable is the baseline, a foundation of where we can tackle these problems, especially um, in regions and different parts of Albuquerque um, and to give residents and renters the opportunity to um, understand what's going on, uh, what's happening with the housing market because it's not really accessible to a lot of working class people either. Um, you know, finding a place to live is hard on its own, let alone um, how the housing market works and which landlords are doing what, which are good at maintaining their properties, which aren't good at maintaining their properties who has, you know, massive amount of properties and who is small uh, mom and pop landlords, that kind of information should be available to the public so that they can make informed decisions about housing, which is already, you know, an incredibly difficult and long process. Um, so thank you. Please vote yes. Alan Lasek, followed by Richard Ramirez. Mr. President and uh, Councillors, my name is Alan Lasek. Um, and, you know, this proposed, I want to talk about what's actually said in this ordinance. And this proposed ordinance imposes significant burdens and contains numerous drafting issues. The ordinance requires 14 lines of information for every unit in the city with approximately 100,000 rentals in Albuquerque. That's 1.4 million lines of information which must be furnished by housing providers and processed by the city. Uh, this ordinance conflicts with state law by redefining terms such as dwelling unit, rent, rental agreement, property owner, operating residential property, uh, residential rental property, all of that is new in this ordinance. This new definition also mentions a sleeping unit, and that's important, and I'll tell you why in a second. These are not the established legal definitions that we have had for nearly half a century in statutory law under the New Mexico Uniform Owner Resident Relations Act. The requirements here are imposed on dwellings beyond what the state law would consider residential units. The Uniform Resident, Re Resident Rela Relations Act exempts a number of types of residents. This is where those definitions come in. This bill, because of the new definitions, would also include medical care, counseling, religious orders, detention, education, geriatric care, and they would all require the same reporting. This ordinance requires reporting the number of units that are ADA accessible. This is confusing because ADA accessibility standards generally apply to public accommodations, employment, access to government programs, rather than private housing. They're very limited in scope within the apartments. This report could require a hypothetical opinion of accessibility under a really lengthy, and that's like 279 pages, set of requirements. And finally, we're back to competing with the internet. It says that you have to put your permit number on every piece of marketing. Owners can't control every single website that's out there. It's just, it's absolutely impossible. I urge you guys to please vote no on this. Richard Ramirez, followed by Kent Cravens. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Richard Ramirez. I'm a disabled veteran and a single father. I live in the, uh, I live in the Plaza Apartments. On this property, I have personally seen serious maintenance issues go unaddressed. I've seen large water leaks. I've seen refrigerators not work for weeks. 
Last week, myself and many of my neighbors, approximately 60, received a 30-day notice to vacate. On this 30-day notice, I was told that I have to let the management know 60 days before I leave to receive my deposit back. If I have to leave in 30 days, I can't do that. When I went into the office, they told me if I signed this notice to vacate, I would be allowed to get my deposit back. In this notice, they want me to pay a month of rent after I leave the apartment complex. I've gone to war for this country. Myself and my child and my neighbors do not deserve this treatment. I understand that industry is pushing, but the people are pushing back. Please, the people of Albuquerque need your help. Please don't let us down. Thank you for your time. Kent Cravens, followed by Josh Price. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, Kent Cravens, uh, CEO at the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors. And I first just want to start by saying thank you all for the work you do on behalf of the city of Albuquerque. No matter where we end up, uh, we always seem to, to try and make good decisions uh, together. And I appreciate that uh, from all of you. Um, speaking against the ordinance uh, for uh, some of the reasons that have been enumerated here, uh, mostly I just don't think it's, it's uh, prime time for, for an ordinance like this. It just hasn't been thought through uh, quite uh, to the extent that it needed to be um, uh, for many of the reasons that have been alluded to here. So I'd like you to, to maybe go back to work on it a little bit if you, if you can and, and take, a, take a second look at it and see if there's something that, uh, that can be done to uh, maybe true some of that up. Um, I, I'm, I'm doubtful at this point because it, it just goes uh, so far into um, almost intruding uh, for not much tangible gain uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what it will, will, will accomplish. In terms of uh, supply and demand, what's going on in the, in the housing market right now is, is definitely a market condition. Uh, when you've got people lined up for miles to rent a home, money in hand, um, you know, you, 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 you have customers and you have lots of them. And, and that seems to be the issue now. This will not, in fact, it will exacerbate uh, the supply and demand problem, the market conditions. Uh, lastly, I don't want to always come before you saying, no, don't do it. I'd like to talk to you about uh, an ordinance that's, that's coming, uh, 02375. We're in favor of that one. So thank you very much. Ken, what is that? Which one's that? That's the uh, nuis nuisance abatement. Oh, good. That's ordinance. ours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Josh Price, followed by Kimberly and Duho. All right, Mr. President, uh, members of the council, thank you very much. Um, I am here to speak against uh, 02259, but first off, my name is Josh Price. I'm a father of two. Um, I'm an av avid volunteer. I volunteer in our community, both for my association and as uh, the past Little League president, and is still a avid member of the Little League. Um, I would like to thank uh, Councillor Feeblecorn for your work on the Manal Redevelopment Project, where my Little League literally is housed. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I have a couple problems with uh, 2259. And the first thing is, sitting here in this meeting where I'm hearing, why didn't the city do this? Why didn't the city do that? Why this kind of thing? How can we imagine that we're going to put a database with so much heavy information, with so much labor just inherent in it, on the back of the city that we're already criticizing for not doing what they're they're doing to oversee their job as is right now. Second thing is, as we found in the past, over 80% of the rental market in the state of New Mexico is mom and pops. These are sole people that own maybe one property. And if you own a property or you are a homeowner, you know how hard it was to get there. If you are lucky enough to have an extra property and you are going to make some kind of profit off of it, Who's to tell you that you are not allowed to do that? We are in a, a place where we are in a free market. Private property rights are a thing. Privacy is a thing. If you start telling me what I can rent my own private property for or what I can use it for that's not within the law, you're just going to lose those houses right out the market. We're losing housing. We won't be creating more housing. We're going to be pulling it right out just from the teeth of victory. 
So please oppose O2259. Thank you very much. Kimberly Andujo, followed by Tony Lee Ponick. Hi, so I am um, like a lot of people around here. I, back in 2017, I, I was a Department of Health worker. Um, I was doing good, I lived on the west side, but uh, I got sick due to the house I was living in. Um, it had mold, all kinds of things. I had no recourse. I ended up losing everything. I became homeless for two years on the streets. I fought hard to get back, to get where I am now. Um, I, I, I deal with medical issues all the time. Um, I'm housed in an apartment that basically looks great because they made it look nice. But you go inside, I went off summer last year, no air, no working air. I was told by Burnland County Housing, well, air's a luxury. When did air become a luxury for somebody who's asthmatic? It put me in the hospital for a week with, in May with bronchial pneumonia. Um, I didn't report it. Somebody reported it to Burnland County Housing and even code enforcement who came out Housing knew about the electrical issues that actually electrocuted me. Code enforcement told me if we don't see it, it doesn't exist. I was retaliated on with a seven day notice. I have now been told that they wanna raise my rent. They wanna backdate it to 1144 for a war zone apartment on Rhode Island. It's a two bedroom, one bath apartment that really Five years ago, it was $500, and now they're trying to tell me that they want $1,144 because that's what HUD will pay. So what if there's a database that gives us information? They don't want your income stuff, but people deserve to live in a safe environment, that they're not electrocuted, that they have air. Air is a luxury. So please, please pass it. Tony Lee Ponick, followed by Steve Grant. Good evening, counselors. Thank you very much. I am Tony Lee Ponick, and I own a property management and real estate company. Um, I live in Councilor Grout's um, district. Um, I am uh, opposing and would like you to oppose Ordinance 2259. Um, I currently manage currently about 265 units. That is 150 different separate owners. Um, most of my owners are small mom and pop owners. Um, the reason why they hire a property manager is so they can have us lease their property, manage their property, market their property, um, that kind of thing. This database with the information that you are wanting in that database for my example of 115 owners, as it has already been uh, stated, that would be 14 lines of information for each individual owner which is 265 units in my portfolio. That database, if made public, would be able to be used for tenants to gain access to owner information. That owner information is private to us property managers. The reason why they hire those property managers is to have a, have a distance between the tenants, tenant relations, and the public. We act on behalf of our owners. Um, that database would, um, the collection of information, which would possibly be made public, um, could potentially, if you're sharing those rents, um, could establish a competition between other landlords, which could set rents in the way um, that the city does not want. Again, if the database is made public, that information, rental owners' private information would be made public to per possibly disgruntled um, tenants. Thank you, I oppose the ordinance and I suggest you do the same, thank you. Steve Grant, <clears throat> excuse me, followed by Jennifer Merriman. Good evening, Mr. President and uh, esteemed counselors. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Steve Grant, I'm a property owner small property owner here in Albuquerque, and been so for 20 years plus, and also the president of the Apartment Association. Um, all of our members and affiliates, and yes, the small mom and pop like myself and others throughout the city, 
are seriously concerned about the items within the city proposed ordinance, and therefore we stand in opposition of the rental, uh, the residential rental database ordinance. I've read over the ordinance many, many times, and the question I keep on asking myself is, why? I mean, I know there's lots of reasons, but why is this database so important all of a sudden, except for the reasons that have been addressed? How is this going to help the dilemma that we have when it comes to our housing situation here in Albuquerque? Why is 14 lines of, I know we've already said this, of data is required for every rental unit in the city? Why is this ordinance requiring uh, occupied versus vacant units during a certain time period? How will this help the overall housing challenges to get the right people for the right reasons into the right rental units? And in closing, I'd like to say that um, we want to be a city of growth and positive direction for new company expansions. And yes, friendly, inviting process for being a rental property owner. Or are we going to be a city to deal with that real estate investor that wants to run away from the Duke City? Therefore, decreasing the need for housing stock and supply. I'm very, very eager, as my colleagues are, to see what we can do as developers, property owners, and work with the city however we can to find solutions to these concerns of our housing dilemma. However, this proposed solution doesn't help, but only hurts the process of growth for both the rental owner, or rental, I should say, renter, and the property owner. Please vote no. Thank you. Jennifer Merriman, followed by Rachel Biggs on Zoom. Good evening, counselors. The question of why just came up. I'm Jennifer Merriman from the People's Housing um, Project, and I'm asking you to vote yes on this. And why? Why did I sit here all night and watch data? Data, chart, maps, evidence. We talked about AGO, IGO, NGO, I don't know, all that, about structural independence. That's what the people are asking for, a, a registry of structural independence. So there's not retaliation against the people. So there's not really retaliation where 60 people are getting kicked out of one place. And the infantilization that's going on, actually, I'm quite offended. Does the city really, do we really think the city can't handle a database like this? Hell yeah, you can. Of course you can handle a database. We are sheltering people. This is not trafficking people. None of this is going to hurt anybody to have a database of information because that's how you make decisions. You all ask for accountability. Counselor, you said, do your due diligence tonight. Do your dil dil diligence about those people who were affected by asbestos, workers who were hurt, yourself on tour. This is the due diligence to the public, to the children of all the parents. You care about the children, but how do you show care and compassion to children, yet through top down? You have to show parents compassion. They're in a very bad spot. We have transparency, accountability, care, concern. That's the why. We need more data. And I'm sorry, 200 units for a few 14 lines of questions? That's ridiculous. You should see the kind of paperwork people do. The lady who spoke up here about being homeless, I bet she was buried in paperwork. So remember, uh, please vote yes. Thank you. Rachel Biggs, followed by Wolf Von Gardner. Good evening, Mr. President and City Councilors. My name is Rachel Biggs with Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless, and we strongly support O59. This ordinance is a straightforward and sensible solution, an important first step to creating policy that can benefit both landlords and renters in Albuquerque. We are grateful to City Council for increasing the investment in housing vouchers in last year's budget and are currently supporting efforts to design an effective landlord incentive program to ensure more vulnerable community members can access safe and affordable housing at a fast pace. What we're missing in designing effective policy is the critical data that's needed to understand our rental stock. From survey data, we have a sense of the makeup of landlords and the extent of the market in Albuquerque, but we need more comprehensive data to ensure future policy addresses the unique needs of our community. We ask for your support tonight of this sensible and easy step to better understand housing needs and develop sound public policy 
that addresses our challenges and build up on our opportunities for creating a more equitable and healthy community for all who call Albuquerque home. Thank you for your time and thank you to the sponsor for bringing this forward. Wolf Baumgartner, followed by Ashley McDavid Fitek. Good evening, Mr. President and Council Members. My name is Wolf Baumgartner. I'm an attorney with the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty. Um, it's no surprise to any of you that we're facing a housing crisis in New Mexico and in Albuquerque. Um, just to put some numbers to all of the moving testimony tonight, 40% of New Mexico, or excuse me, 40% of Albuquerque homes are rentals. Those numbers are even higher in communities of color. And right now they're facing eviction numbers um, that are unprecedented. There are literally thousands of youth that are homeless right now in Albuquerque, even more thousands of families that are homeless right now in Albuquerque. And rents have increased to the highest that they've ever been in the history of the city. Every single day, my office receives calls from people who are on the verge of homelessness. They can't pay the rent in the next month. The rental moratorium, the eviction moratorium is over, and they're not getting any more um, eviction assistance from the federal government. And the fact is, is that the city, if they don't want to have the streets filled with homeless folks, if they don't have people who are precariously living, the city is going to need to step up and do something about it. And to do something about it, the city is going to need some basic data on what the housing market even looks like. This is a modest start in that direction. The ordinance is about information, information that the city needs to address community health and safety concerns, information to create informed housing and community development policies, and information about communities need intervention and services. This is a necessary first step, and the New Mexico Center on Law and Poverty thanks you for supporting it. Ashley McDavid Fitak, followed by Dan Rowe. Hi, I'm, my name is Ashley. I am a property manager here with Full House Real Estate. We manage approximately 60 plus properties. Our brokerage opposes this ordinance. It's intrusive. The amount of work that it would take for me to enter the data base is just time consuming. And right now we don't charge application fees, but I would have no choice but to charge an application fee because time is money and this is these 14 lines of intrusive information is just unnecessary. And honestly, after listening to some of the stories and hearing some of the stories that I'm sympathetic to of the, the poor maintenance, lack of maintenance, I don't think that's addressed in this particular ordinance. Um, that's something that should be referred to nuisance abatement, perhaps put more money into the nuisance abatement department to handle such calls to go out and address that. But for this ordinance, I can't support it. We can't support it, and we hope you vote no. Thank you. Dan Rowe, followed by Jose Enriquez. Good evening, esteemed counselors, and thank you for staying late and listening to all of our concerns. I've always admired the city council, but tonight's a reminder of your resolve and your patience, so thanks. Again, my name is Dan Rowe and me and my wife are New Mexico natives and we love our city. And we've somehow struggled to provide over 30 rental properties in the Albuquerque area and we're very proud of that. In reviewing this, the bill is, a, it's confusing, but the one thing that stands out, and I know you're scratching your head wondering, is how can it accomplish these claims made by the authors or today's guest speakers? It doesn't mean no more clock sinks. It doesn't mean more affordable housing inventory. It doesn't mean more licensed technicians will get trained and appear to fix heaters. Um, it doesn't fix refrigerators. Um, it doesn't mean lower rent. And I, I can't believe that somebody from city housing was saying, or affordable housing saying it, it doesn't mean more housing vouchers. So the bottom line is this, is more red tape and more legislation means what? I could hear you saying it in your minds. It means higher rent. It's more labor. It's more management on the city. It's higher expenses from your manager. It's an unnecessary burden. And it's the perfect recipe for higher rents. I'm also afraid it's going to mean that less people like me can possibly provide housing. It's just, you know, and also if you're looking for larger out-of-state housing providers to come in, they're going to see this and be like, I, I don't want to work here. So this only 
results in higher rent, less housing. But sadly, it seems like it could only hurt the people who need it most. So council members, for obvious reasons, please uh, vote no on 02259. And thank you guys for staying up. Jose Enriquez, followed by Craig Boney. Hello, uh, my name is Jose Enriquez. I'm an organizer of the People's Housing Project and a member of Southwest Mountain States Carpenters Union, Local 1319. I'm here to speak in support of Council Bill 059, which will establish a landlord registry. When my partner and I moved in together, our landlord asked to see our paychecks and my partner's grades because she's a graduate student at UNM to see if we were viable tenants. I understand that some landlords even ask potential tenants for credit scores to see if they're viable tenants. However, there's no way for us to see if our landlord was a person we wanted to have a business relationship with. The fact that there is no registry makes it easier for landlords to break current housing laws and neglect tenants requests for maintenance without repercussions. When working with the People's Housing Project and reaching out to tenants in many apartment complexes, we found out that many of the tenants didn't actually want a hostile relationship with their landlords, but simply wish that when they place a work order for a maintenance request, that the issue would be solved. Some of these issues include landlords digging up people's floors to get the piping and then not fixing the floors for months, and newly installed water faucets and showers failing and shooting a stream of water clear across the shower. We found that a lot of people's issues wouldn't be solved until they said they would abate their rent, and then they were only able to do this after proper state steps were taken on their behalf, that their maintenance issues would be solved. Not having this registry would only encourage landlords to continue being negligent towards their tenants. If there's a public record of negligence happening, it will force them to honor maintenance requests in a more efficient manner. It will also prevent negligent landlords from being dishonest in city council chambers, city county commission meetings, and at the state house. It will also stop landlords from issuing illegal and dishonest eviction notices, which has happened to tenants at Las Brisas apartments when they decide to step up and organize. Um, so that's part of the reason why I'm suggesting that City Council pass bill. Thank you. Craig Boney. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, uh, good evening. Uh, Council President Davis and members of the City Council, uh, I would like to respectfully request that you vote no on Council Bill 02259. I am a small rental property investor in District 6 and pr provider of affordable housing in the form of one bedroom units. A small mom and pop investor um, like me, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm a little bit. Um, but, uh, are driving things like um, this bill are driving me to consider selling because uh, the burdensome regulations. Um, small investors like me that are active in caring for their properties and their tenants are really the best landlord that tenants can have. Uh, my tenants get immediate attention to issues that come up without having to wait for management company decision makers to respond or corporate boards to decide on a particular need they have. They also benefit when uh, they may, when I, you know, maintain, when they may maintain my property and pay rent on time because I'm willing to keep their rents below market as an incentive for them to stay. I believe that ordinances like this one are written to regulate housing providers uh, and will actually reduce new and corporate new corporate and individual investment in rental housing in Albuquerque and ultimately drive up rental rates as demand exceeds new supply. This ordinance actually doesn't uh, achieve its stated purpose of protecting health, safety, and general welfare of resident occupants and neighboring residents and property owners. It does create this database, of course, uh, and holds under financial pen penalty the owners if they're not compliant, even if they have a ma management company. Again, I, I uh, respectfully request that you vote no on this bill. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes public comment. Councilor Feeblecorn, we're back to you, and then other questions. I'm happy to just answer any questions, Mr. President. Councilor Lewis is the first one I saw. 
Well, I think, Mr. President, um, just some some comments and maybe some questions that'll come up out of it. But uh, you know, I, I think of uh, first of all, um, you know, the people in in the city who uh, who who invest their livelihood, they invest their reputation, their hard-earned money, uh, and you know, to those to those here, you know, tonight and who might be listening that uh, that are owners, they're property owners. Uh, they uh, they rent homes, they rent apartments, they rent uh, rooms and places for people to live. They provide housing uh, in our community, um, and they uh, you know really forced to come down here once again. It seems like you know multiple times now, you know lately, just to defend um, who they are. I mean, to defend their livelihood, uh, to defend what they do, and then to hear a lot of comments like uh, just just inflammatory comments and. Um, uh, you know, demonizing them, uh, retaliatory, you know, calling them retaliatory, uh, infantilization, I mean, just these kind of inflammatory type uh, comments about them, you know, and, uh, and they probably don't feel like they have a whole lot of uh, advocates at City Hall, uh, or people that just understand or uh, want to support them. Um, but, you know, you, you got to have people that, that are willing to support, you got to be able to support the people who provide the housing, you know, in the city, and I'm concerned about, uh, you know, bills like this and resolutions like this that, uh, first of all, that paint them in that kind of light, um, uh, that assume that about them, uh, and then also just put, you know, such a burden, um, I think, and also a burden on the city. Um, I can think of, um, you know, I'm trying, trying to think of other, other industries uh, that would be similar to this. Um, uh, so, so the uh, gas, the gas industry and you know, would, would we as a city require uh, convenience stores to self-publish uh, their, um, their, their gas, you know, their, their fuel prices? I mean, as demonized as, as, as gas companies are, we don't allow that, we don't make them do that, you know? In fact, third parties publish that, and it's actually more transparent to the consumer because third parties do that and not the, not the convenience stores themselves. I think about, uh, the food industry, you know, we don't require grocery stores to, to self-publish their, uh, their prices. We don't, when you, when you buy a car, it's important to have, you know, public transportation and to be able to, people to, you know, have transportation in the city and you go buy a car, you know, a used car, a new car, and those car companies are not required uh, to publish uh, their, um, their pricing. And so, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, and yet, and yet to, to think that in this, this industry would be, Different, and then I think about the time and the, the cost to be able to, um, and, and a lot of these things were brought up tonight uh, to be able to regulate something like this. Um, there's not a fee, um, but if you don't um, uh, if you don't apply in the database, uh, then the process, uh, according to the resolution, is uh, of course this is all um, managed by Family and Community Services. We got a department. We're giving them one hundred fifty thousand dollars to do this, and yet I think we down, we're down. This resolution's downplaying. The amount of money that it would take to manage something like this, um, you know, we say there's no fee, but yet if there's a complaint that's made, I mean, we could have several thousand complaints if people aren't enrolled in this. Uh, the city says we'll investigate it, and if it's verified that they're not enrolled, the city will issue a letter of compliance. That's going to take clerks and people to issue letters. Um, if the unit is not enrolled after three letters, uh, so you have to have investigators who investigate. I don't know, I guess we've got to go out to that home and, or, and investigate uh, if it is, in fact, uh, you know, a rental home or a rental place, and if they've, they've been they're in compliance or not. That's going to take an investigator to do that. If it's verified that they're not enrolled, the city will issue a letter of compliance to the owner. If the unit is not enrolled after three letters, so, so you've got to have three times investigators go out and try to find uh, if they're uh, in compliance or not. Um, and if all that happens and they're still not enrolled, you've got $100 a month. Uh, to be brought into compliance, and so so we're not charging them a fee to do this. But if you don't do this, you're going to get charged twelve hundred dollars a year uh, by not being compliant. Um, and, it, and it does go on and on. I think if you read this resolution, um, there, um, you know, it's just it's just problematic. It's very problematic in that way. Um, mention mention um, you know staff mentioned companies throughout the United States that that develop and maintain such ba databases. I mean, I'm sure there's software companies that spend a lot of money or charge a lot of money to be able to uh, do that as well. But uh, bottom line, a lot of good points that were brought out here tonight. I don't think this is the solution. 
uh, to solving our uh, you know, affordable housing you know, issue. Um, I think it's exactly the opposite, you know, that we need to you know, support, again, those who are investing and um, helping them. You know, I want more people who are in renting homes right now, renting places right now, to have the opportunity in this city uh, to be able to one day be a homeowner themselves and possibly even to be able to make some income by maybe renting out that home or another home or a portion of that home uh, without having to go through so much red tape and regulation that they never get a chance to be able to do that. Councilor Lewis, uh, excuse me, Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I just can see the unintended consequences here. I was an actual uh, landlord for many years and uh, I did exactly what Councillor Lewis was saying, is I purchased my house when I was very, very young, and then I went to another house, renting the older house, and then continued that process to where I'm at now. So I think it's a really good way for an individual who is wanting home ownership to move up and uh, gain a nicer house. Also, using the unintended consequences in this bill, um, it's a public doc public database. So at that point, um, I would actually, if I was the landlord, I would actually use this database with all this information provided to actually charge more for rent. I would take this, take this database and I would know that my neighbor right down the street who I only have to guess about how much he's paying, I'll know exactly how much he's paying and I'll know that the condition of that house versus mine is way better, so I'm just gonna up the rent way more because I'll have that data at my fingertips. And I think that's what we're gonna start seeing is that unintended consequences, and you'll see that within these big, large apartment complexes as well. So I just think we need to leave this alone. Um, I know that the system will get used in a way where, um, where we will have those unintended consequences. I know I would, um, so I just think it's really important that uh, that we continue the way we are now. I'm not going to support this uh, bill. Thank you. Other counselors, other questions? Councilor Bassan? Mr. President, I just think that hearing the different, there's definitely multiple layers to to the intent, what I'm going to call the intention of this and my perception of the why. And really, I, I don't think any of us believe that slumlords are acceptable or that they should exist or that we should enable them to exist. But uh, that to me is what I believe is a big portion of the why in making this um, ordinance and passing it. So to me, I would love to hear from planning eventually, not tonight, but director, if you can, if you can, you know, if you or any of your code enforcement or anybody has a solution for what we can do regarding slumlords and identifying who they are and what we can do to work to eliminate them. But I don't think it's right to lump all landlords into that category because I, I do not believe that that is anywhere even near the majority of them. Seeing no other discussion, uh, Council People Corner close. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I did fill out a survey today from my Zumba studio, and there was 12 questions on it, and I'm really tired. But I'm still here tonight, despite that rigorous survey. Um, I want to point out that this was the number one request last fall when I called in the housing experts from UNM and asked them, because they know and I don't, what do we need to do to help with the housing crisis? What do we need to do to design programs or policies or incentives that can help us provide more affordable housing? And they all unanimously said, we need a database of housing. We don't know what we have in the city. We have no idea what part of town has enough housing, what part of town doesn't have enough housing, what policies and incentives you could possibly develop because we just don't know. And so that is the reason that I worked with them to develop this proposal. Now, I've heard a lot of drama um, tonight and the last couple of weeks, and it's been very interesting to me that the comments are all about how 
we don't want these progressive ideas. This is not, this is not, this is Albuquerque. We don't want progressive ideas. But this is in place in, you know, bastions of progressive thought, like the state of Arizona, the state of Ohio, and 20 cities in Texas, including Dallas, Forney, Hearst, quite a few, 20 others. Um, and so this is not a progressive idea, and it's not a new idea. It's something that happens next door in Arizona and next door in Texas. Another really nice benefit of having a landlord database would be that we could actually communicate with landlords. I can't tell you how many landlords have called me up in the last couple of weeks and said, I didn't know anything about this. Why wasn't I invited to the meetings that you had back in December to discuss this bill? And I had to say, I didn't know you were a landlord. So you're actually complaining that we don't have a landlord registry so that I can actually tell you about conversations about a landlord registry. It makes zero sense to me. Either you want to be in communication with the city and you want to know when we're doing things, or you don't. It's your choice. Every business that I'm aware of has to register, has to get a permit, has to join a database. Most businesses have to do all three. Um, Short-term rental owner, owners, short-term rental owners already have to do an annual permit. They have to provide a lot more than 14 questions. I guarantee you, they have to do a lot of work and they pay a, a fee every single year. <coughs> the company that picks up my dog's poop in my backyard once a month has a business license. They filled out a lot of paperwork to get that. My neighbor who rents out his casita during balloon fiesta has a short-term rental registration. The vendors at my local farmer's market have to fill out several pages um, on a permit application just so they can sell their yard, their lettuce from their yard at a, at a um, farmer's market. My friend who sells handmade jewelry at farmer's markets has a business license. My friend who runs a dog rescue has a county permit to do that. I've read articles in the paper, thankfully not in Albuquerque, about kids who have lemonade stands on the side of the road who got in trouble because they didn't have a permit. So what makes long-term rental owners, landlords, so special that they don't have to register in any way, shape, or form? It's really disheartening to me because when you think about the fact that these long-term landlords that we've heard from tonight more than any of the other examples I gave you, they are dealing with someone's basic human right of having a home. So it seems to me that that is really not much to ask to have them fill out a 14 pay, a 14 line, not page, 14 lines of data so that the city of Albuquerque can get a handle on what rental units we have in our city, what we need to do in terms of incentivization, policies, programs to increase that. Now, I think we all have heard tonight why they don't want that. And I'll just repeat it for the folks in the back. They're worried that the tax assessor is going to find out how much money they're making. And the owners of these properties don't want to be bothered by the people who are forced to live in them. That's what I heard tonight. So in closing, you know, I heard your support. Um, I think we know how this is going to go. But at more than urging support up here, I urge the citizens of Albuquerque to really start thinking and asking questions about why this industry, above all others, has so much power and why they, more than any others, have the power over your elected officials at the city and at the state. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilor, seeing no other discussion, we'll ask the clerk to call the roll on uh, this legislation, 059. Councilor Bassan. No. Councilor Benton. No. Councilor Fubelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. No. Councilor Jones. No. Councilor Lewis. No. Councilor Pena. No. Councilor Sanchez? No. Councilor Davis? Yes. That bails on a two to seven vote.
Thank you, counselors. Howard. Live pay for it. Folks. Howard. Don't worry about asbestos. If you can't help the people out. We will call that, call you into order. We don't allow disruptions during our meeting. You're welcome to take your conversation outside. Fuck all of you. You can't go out that way. That door's locked. Councilor Jones, uh, 068 by request. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, 068 is repealing and replacing the independent hearing office ordinance and providing for a standardized process for administrative appeals. It's repealing ordinances no longer in effect or superseded and repealing and replacing the contractor debarment ordinance designating the zoning hearing examiner as the review body for solar rights hearings and revising the integrated development ordinance related to zoning hearing examiner duties. I would like to move a due pass and then I have an amendment. We have a motion, do we have a second? I have several seconds now and so, Councilor, you have an amendment, amendment number one. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, move amendment to ask City Clerk Watson, oh, <laughs> move amendment. Uh, City Clerk Watson, would you come up and tell us what we're going to do and then we'll move that amendment. Thank you, Clerk Watson. The, or, um, the amendment regarding the debarment provision. Uh, we do have Jennifer Bradley here from the, the Chief Procurement Officer, and she can probably explain it better than I can. Yeah. Oh. I th the amendment basically clarifies the provisions around debarment and broadens it somewhat so, to, so that it applies to anyone essentially pro applying for procurement um, with the city. Yeah. Ms. Bradley. Hi hey everyone, President and uh, Councilors. The the uh, this is a great ordinance. We're streamlining some of the hearing and debarment, and part of the debarment is in the purchasing division. And so we just wanted to make sure to make some technical adjustments to make sure that debarment suspension would apply to any contractor, not just the ones that respond to bids and solicitations. And a couple different uh, you know modifications to the definitions, but. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to ask for uh, approve. I would like to ask uh, a do pass on the um, committee substitute 068 as amended. Councillor, I actually think we need to vote on that amendment first, okay. really quickly. Thank uh, you. Did the clerk catch a second on that? I heard a couple, but okay. Okay. Councillor, Therefore, any other discussion on the amendment? And seeing none, we'll ask the clerk to please call the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Benton. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. That amendment passes unanimously. Thanks. And Councillor, I'm sorry, uh, we are back on your uh, bill uh, now as substituted and amended. Any other councillors, any other questions? Going once, going twice, Councillor Jones to close. Thank you. I uh, ask your Support. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Councilors, next up is 075 uh, by request. 075 amends, amends the nuisance abatement ordinance uh, relating to all kinds of things, including amending our weed and anti-litter ordinance, uh, the revised ordinances of the city defining penalties, the hard ordinance, et cetera, uh, and I'll move a due pass. We have several seconds. I heard Councilor Feeblecorn first. Councilors, before we get too far into this, I think we have one amendment that's on the dais here, and I don't want to forget to do it. Uh, actually, nope. Actually, that's for 78. I'm sorry. Uh, councilors, this was a matter or a bill that originally came from the administration after some work uh, on a number of nuisance properties and other uh, pieces. The, the council might remember that we went after some uh, convenience stores in the southeast area of town a few years ago um, that had accumulated any number of 
uh, police, hundreds of police and law enforcement and first responder calls um, and use the nuisance ordinance from this council when we pass nuisance legislation um, to sort of twist their arm and bring them into compliance and be better neighbors. Um, and of course, we see this quite often here uh, on dilapidated properties. Uh, but the administration had asked us to take a new look at consolidating these, including the hearing process, uh, to better align how we manage those uh, in the hearing process that we just talked about with uh, Councilor Jones. Mr. Surasau, anything from the administration? We may have questions, but I want to give you guys a chance since you started it. Nope, just, uh, again, I'm going to keep it short. It's late. Um, <laughs> Thank you for bringing this forward, and uh, we urge your support. Thank you. Thanks. Counselors, any questions? Any comments? I hear several no's. This might be easier than we thought. Counselor, seeing no other discussion, all those in favor of 075, please respond when the clerk calls your name. Sorry, y'all. That's just old habit. We've done 100 votes. I'm mm -hmm. tired. Counselor Lassan. Yes. Counselor Benton. Yes. Counselor Fubicorn. Yes. Counselor Grout. Yes. Counselor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. And thanks to the administration for their help on that one. Councillors Bassan, Ben, and Pena, 078, and we do have an amendment. Whoever wants to take this? Mr. Bassan, Pre Mr. President, 078 is amending Chapter 7, Article 15, Section 4, enabling the city to create parking offense for vehicles with multiple automated speed enforcement fines concurrently in default. Amending Chapter 8, Article 5, Section 1, creating a code, a city code petty misdemeanor offense for parking a vehicle on city streets with multiple automated speed enforcement fines concurrently in default. And amending Chapter 8, Article 1, Section 3, Subsection 12, enabling the city to immobilize vehicles after one outstanding parking violation issued pursuant to section 85143 repeat, repeated non-payment of automated speed enforcement system fines, I move it do pass. We have a second from Council Feeblecorn, Council Bassan. Mr. President, I would like to move Amendment 1 and invite the administration to come up to speak regarding it, please. So the mo we have floor amendment number one, which is being shared. I see a second from Councillor Grout. Great. Hi. Hi there. I'm Jennifer Morrow. I'm the deputy director for DMD. Um, is it possible that attachment I'd sent you to get it up on the screen? I think it is. Is it? Oh. Yeah. This might help explain the, the process. We put it into a flow chart so it's easier to see it visually of uh, what this um, ordinance proposes. Great. You might just have to tell us. Oh. <laughs> I think we got it there. Yeah. So if you well, can see it, the, uh, the top there, um, it's uh, it, it now has it so that after the first ASE violation that is unpaid, there's a, it'll be a letter of default that is sent out. And then to let them know that if there is a second um, ASE uh, violation that goes unpaid, it will then become illegal to park on the city streets um, or on any city right away. If they are found parking on the city right away, they can then get a parking citation and if that citation goes into default, at that time we can boot them. We're still trying to look at all these colored boxes. Hold on. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Counselors, any questions for the administration before we go to amendment? Counselor Sanchez, really quickly. We're, we're on floor amendment number one, but. Yeah, I'm just um, looking at the whole bill in general and um, I don't know, don't we have programs in place? And um, aren't we one of the poorest states of the nation? And we're going after the parking enforcer or the parking individuals. Um, I just think that we should really, really take a look at this. And, and um, I mean, we still have crime on the streets. We're low on police officers. And yet we're hitting the people that we know probably have a little bit of money. Not a lot, but probably a little bit. And in effect, we're actually um, doing
directing our resources in the wrong place. I think we should direct our resources to the amount of crime that we're dealing with. Um, right now we have high shopliftings. We just saw the Walmart close. Um, we're low on police officers, but yet we're finding individuals um, who are probably um, living in some of these poorer areas of the city. Um, I'm going to say no on this bill. Councilor Basson. Mr. President, well, I hope to change your mind, Councilor Sanchez, but at the same time, uh, so we passed the automated speed enforcement. We have the, the cameras that are helping APD officers because we are low on the numbers for some speeding citations throughout the city, which is a chronic problem. This is actually making it a little bit more strict if you are speeding and get a citation from one of those cameras. And correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, please. But this actually makes it a little bit more strict because people, we're finding that people are actually getting the citations and either not doing the community service or not paying the fines and it's becoming a chronic problem. And so this is now escalating it to say that if people have multiple citations or automated speed enforcement fines, then eventually if they are caught parking on a city street, then the city can go ahead and boot their vehicle until they either pay the fine or, or remediate the problem. Thank you. And um, Mr. President, I just wanted to also say um, just another way of, of circumventing police. I think it's really important that we make sure that we concentrate on hiring more police officers so that we can actually have an actual criminal penalty instead of an actual civil penalty. I think it's important that we actually um, work on, as, as I said, as I've been saying, is we're low on police. Our bottom line is we need to find ways to get more police through the doors here um, so that we can actually enforce the laws. If you had police officers out there enforcing, enforcing the laws, you would actually see pick up individuals who have warrants, pick up individuals who are involved in DWIs, pick up individuals who have other misdemeanor or felony uh, offenses pending. And, uh, and right now, I just think it's just a really tough situation to actually um, grow this right now. So I'm not going to support it. Uh, well, Councilor Sanchez, on this, you and I agree. Uh, I was the only counselor to vote against speed cameras when we passed it for that exact reason. Um, because I think that when you're committing a crime, it doesn't help to get a ticket in the mail three weeks later. It doesn't really stop you from speeding down the road for however long that takes. Um, and to that end, like I, I, uh, I want the sponsors to have their bill, and so I'll support all the amendments. And uh, but I don't believe that this is the right approach for this uh, for this particular violation. Um, so I agree with you when we get to it. But in the meantime, the amendment on the Floor is amendment number one. Mr. President. I'm sorry, Councilor Besson. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure to include my co-sponsors, uh, Councilor Benton and Councilor Pena, if, in case they have anything they would like to add. On the amendment, Councilor? Not Pena. on the amendment. Thanks. Okay. And Councilor Pena, anything on amendment number one as a co-sponsor? No, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Good, thanks. I'm trying to get us back on track here a little bit. Councilors, uh, seeing no other discussion for amendment number one, we'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. And I believe we have at least one more amendment, just one, right? This is mine, I think. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Cordini says it, but floor amendment number two, I think, is going to be mine. Uh, this relates to sort of the same issue we've had uh, in some of our other issues, and, uh, and thanks to the administration and Ms. Dola for helping us with this. Uh, this came through our committee process, and we recognize that the notices, like some of our city notices, uh, may or may not be in multiple languages, and so to avoid the confusion and the problem that we've seen in some of our other issues, um, this just adds language that's consistent with our uh, uh, administrative hearings ordinance we just passed to be sure that notices about how to get additional information is available in multiple languages. I move floor amendment number two. We have a second for Councilor Feeblecorn first. Councilors, any questions or discussion on amendment number two? Councilor Ben. Just curious what the languages are besides Spanish. Somebody will tell from Office of Equity and Inclusion will help me, but I seem to remember that Vietnamese, Diné, there's a 
another one. Um, but I'm certain that the Office of Equity and Inclusion will get us that list. Councilor Brown says it's Frank. It's number five. Okay. <laughs> I was just curious. It doesn't matter. Now I'll that you bring it up, I am too. So, uh, we'll ask Ms. Dolan if she can help us get that back by next week. Great, thanks. <laughs> Councilors, any other discussion? I have amendment number two. Will the clerk please call that vote? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Councilors Pena, Benton, Bassan, we're back on your bill as twice amended. Mr. President, I do have one thing before we go to the other questions and, and the other counselors, but is this, uh, can you clarify if is this APD or is this code enforcement? That's a sure so question. They would be working on the boots for any cars that are parked on the side of the road with the ASE fines. Council President and uh, Councilor Bassan, uh, this would be uh, parking enforcement. They have the boots, they have the license plate readers, they have the resources that are out there every day booting for parking offenses, so they would be uh, the ones that would, parking enforcement through DMV would be the ones supporting this effort. Councilors, other questions? Anything else from the administration? I just want to say thank you to our sponsors, Bassan, Benton, and Pena. Can you not hear me? No. All right, there. Now thank you. How's that? Um, thank you to uh, sponsors, Bassan, Pena, and uh, uh, Benton for uh, helping us with this. Thank you. And Councilor Pena. And Councilor Pena. Councilor, seeing no other discussion, unless you wanted to close. I don't think Ben did again. It's late. Yeah. People Once need to time. not speed. People need to pay their speeding tickets. Urge your support. <laughs> Councilor Pena, any closing thoughts? Um, thank you, Mr. President. It's been a long night. Um, I just wanted just to thank the fellow sponsors. There were some other sponsors. I mean, this has been a lot, a lot of work, a lot of time. I know that the um, the light, the speeding um, cameras have really made it a big difference. Unfortunately, that you know we really tried to do this without having any of the um, the fees associated with it. But now that you know some people have not responded. Um, you know, it's just important that we make sure that um, we do this and we do it right. So thank you. Seeing no other discussion, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll call vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. <laughs> Was that a yes? I'm sorry. Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. No. Councilor Davis. No. That passes on a seven to two vote. Thank you, ma'am. Councilors Bassan and Pena, you are up, but before you do that, I think we have three more bills and 10 more minutes. I'm willing to bet we're not going to do this, so reluctantly, I'm going to make a motion to extend the meeting until 11 p.m. There's a second, a reluctant second, I think. Councilors, any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Hinojos, would you please call the vote? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Oh. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fubelcorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Councilors Pena and Bassan, 081. Okay. Go ahead, Councilor. I was going to ask you if you can just go ahead with it. Yes. I think it's good. <laughs> Mr. President, 081 is amending the Capital Improvements Program Ordinance to formalize a 6% council district set aside. I move a due pass. Second. Second. And... Mr. President, we do have an amendment in your iPads. I'd like to move amendment number one. This changes it from a set rate of 6% to an actual dollar amount for the next three bond cycles. Second. We have a motion and a second. 
I'm doing math. Okay. Council, any discussion on this amendment? Seeing none, I see no one. Or Councilor Pena, did uh, you want to add anything? I'm sorry, Mr. President. No, go ahead. Uh, Mr. President, Council Bissell, no, um, you're, it was perfect. Just okay. that if this amendment passes, I think we're going to have to defer because it changes the title. That's right. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. That passes unanimously. Mr. President, I'd like to change my motion to a deferral for two weeks. We have a second, I'll second it. So the motion is for a deferral until the May 15th meeting. No, nope, so, four Mr. weeks. Mr. President, I changed my mind. I would like to move a deferral for four weeks. I saw <laughs> how you changed your mind. So whatever four weeks is. Mr. President, that'd be June 5th. Great. That is the motion. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, uh, please respond to the roll call. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. Councilor Fubelkorn. Yes. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Yes. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Councilor Feeblecorn, R92. Thank you, Mr. President. This is R92, approving the Manal Metropolitan Redevelopment Area Plan. I move a due pass. Second. Second from Councilor Ben, Councilor Fiebelkorn. Mr. President, I believe that we have um, Ms. Fishman and Ms. Morris online to give a short overview of <laughs> this plan. <laughs> and then I think, yeah, there we go. And we have two speakers as well. Good evening, Mr. President and Councilors. Um, I, this is Petra Morris with the, um, City Council Services. I'm very excited to be before you this evening. Um, with the Manol MRA plan. This is um, a project that has been the third phase, third and final phase of this uh, larger project. And um, I know that it's quite late at night. And so with that, I'm going to hand over to Jackie Fishman to do, who's our consultant, to do a quick uh, overview of the contents of the plan. And, and then we'll be ready to answer any questions. And I believe we've also got a couple of folks signed up uh, to speak to the bill. We do, in fact, and so, there we go. Ms. Morris, it's yours. Oh, Ms. Fishman, I'm sorry. All right. Um, thank you, counselors uh, and Mr. President. Uh, this is Jackie Fishman. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to work on this project for the last two years. And like everyone else, I can't wait to see a reverse in the downward trend in this area of Midtown Albuquerque. Uh, as at LUPS, I'd first like to, to thank uh, Councillor Gibson for having the vision to take on this project and Councillor Fiebelkorn for continuing the effort to bring the project here before you all today. Uh, Petra, of course, has been great to work with, as well as other staff from the MR agency, planning department, family and community services, APD and community safety department, transit, solid waste, environmental health, DMD, MAFCA, and then of course the business owners that have come to all of our meetings. Everybody's time on this project has been very much appreciated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Petra mentioned, this has been a three-phase project. Uh, phase one study uh, covered a, a larger area bounded by uh, Candelaria to the north, I-40 to the south, San Mateo to the east, and I-25 to the west. Our phase one report identified and re recommended that a sub area be designated as an MR and the report was approved by city council in November of 2021. Phase two uh, involves creating a designation report for the MR area and that too was approved by city council in April of 2022. Uh, phase three is where we're at right now. Uh, it involves creating the MR area plan uh, which was recommended for approval by the ADC in February and by LUPS a few weeks ago. Go ahead. Uh, this slide uh, simply shows um, our project area uh, for the, the MR um, from 
Uh, I-40 on the south to Phoenix on the north, uh, I-25 on the west, and the North Diversion Channel on the east. Go ahead. Um, this is our vision statement. Um, we developed this as well as supporting goals for the plan, which is basically to bring back the vibrancy and vitality that the Midtown District once had with hotels and commercial retail and services, restaurant, multimodal transportation, and for the first time, multifamily residential. Uh, the MR plan has five chapters. Um, it includes executive summary, area profile, business profile, recommendations, and an action plan, and project financing and funding. Uh, the action plan includes a list of 22 actions. They're divided into three categories, including uh, five opportunity site uh, slash uh, redevelopment projects, 11 infrastructure and transportation projects, and six support actions. I'm going to try to go through these very quickly because I know it's late. Um, this uh, slide that you see right now is Opportunity uh, Site 1. I know there's others that want to talk about this project as well tonight. This is approximately um, just under nine acres. It's one of the largest properties in the MR area and it's under single ownership. Uh, the, the owner has lots of plans uh, that will really revitalize the area, including retail, uh, drive a bike up coffee, um, bike store, multifamily housing units, and so on. I'm keep going. Um, this next opportunity, site two, it's about six parcels. It's um, the infamous, includes the infamous uh, Quonset hut, right at the corner of University and Manal um, that we all hate to see, um, and, and vacant buildings, surface parking, and uh, this property is zoned uh, NRLM. It's at a major entry to the MR area, and we've called for uh, potentially a rezone to this property to allow, uh, to MXM to allow for more flexibility than the NRLM. Uh, next site, uh, opportunity site three, it's three separate restaurant properties or old restaurant properties, the Village Inn, Little Anita's and the Range Cafe, all relatively small. The one that you're seeing right now is the former Village Inn. It's zoned NRLM, it's on the north side of Manal, uh, highly visible and accessible and, and a ripe for redevelopment. This is uh, the former Little Anita's restaurant. It's right at the corner of University in Manal. It's been vacant for a very long time. Uh, and, um, you know, zone NRC, so, so that's a good thing and, and also ripe for redevelopment. Uh, this last um, site is uh, the former Range Cafe. Um, it's also zone NRC. It attracts a lot of negative activity like the other uh, former restaurants from the south side of Manal. It's also surrounded on two sides by an extended stay motel, which uh, we've identified this uh, both sites as um, uh, you know appropriate for redevelopment as one cohesive mixed use project. Okay, uh, hotel and motel conversions. We talk a lot about this in in the plan. Um, we call for it as an implementation uh, action. This slide just shows uh, several different uh, conversions that have happened around the city in the last you know, several years. Uh, most of the hotel properties in the MR are not zoned correctly. So if any of these were slated for conversion, we would need to have a zone change, okay? Uh, this slide uh, simply shows the number of motel and hotel rooms in, the, in our small MR area, over 1,500, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the Crown Plaza and the Kirky, Kirky uh, Hotel together uh, are 450 rooms, and they are the largest hotel complex in Albuquerque. Go ahead. Uh, increasing uh, public safety is, is a, a big part of the plan. Crime is a huge concern in the MR area, and it, it continues to encourage disinvestment by businesses. We have a lot of different support actions. I have those on, on the screen. I won't read through them, but we've been 
uh, in discussions with ACS and APD and Transit and, and MAFCA about all the various roles that each agency could play in this. We also uh, call for a recommendation for street lighting improvements um, based on safety concerns that we've heard for the last two years. And then we also did a informal lighting survey. Next, um, Manal um, is a, a high-speed corridor. Um, it's got six lanes, a center turn lane, a sidewalk <laughs> at the back of curbs, and 45 mile an hour speed limit. So we call for a traffic study that would examine traffic flow and, and look at ways to, to uh, calm the traffic through there. Uh, we also have two major trail corridors in the plan area. One is the North Diversion Channel Trail and the other the Embudo. Uh, these are major assets and provide uh, really great um, uh, placemaking, lighting, and design opportunities. So we've called for uh, continuing to work with AMAFCA on trail lighting and Parks and Rec on trail sponsorships. Go ahead. Um, we also uh, identify several actions to address transit issues and ongoing efforts with city transit. Go ahead. Um, the plan also calls for working with NMDOT on improving landscaping and wayfinding along uh, the two interstate edges, one being on the east side of the I-25 East Frontage Road, south of Manal, and the other on the north side of I-40 from exit 159D to University Boulevard. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we call for improving buildings, sidewalks, ramps, and parking lots uh, that just uh, continue to show signs of distress and blight. Okay. Um, one of the things we discovered in the late in the planning process is there's two landfills uh, in the plan area um, and the MR plan provides recommendations on how to address the landfills uh, to make sure that they don't become a, a constraint to redevelopment. Okay. Um, next, uh, we, um, the plan recognizes uh, the domination in, of zoning in, um, with NRLM and NRC zoning. Um, and so we've talked about uh, having zone changes that would be needed to diversify uh, the zoning in here. Um, we also um, sort of late in the process, this came out of ADC, call for a evaluation of Manal as a major transit corridor that would be a, a comprehensive plan amendment potentially in the future. Next, um, we call for the creation of a dog park with electric vehicle stations. Uh, this is what would be on land um, that is owned by Applebee's restaurant and also adjacent to AMAFCA. AMAFCA brought this recommendation to us. We thought it was a good idea. This, this could serve hotel guests in the area, trail users, and also workers in the area. Okay, next. Um, the plan recommends addressing the empty signs along the corridor. There's, there's certainly a lot of them. Uh, the city was approached by the Friends of the Orphan Signs Group regarding adding public art uh, to these empty sign structures, and we, we thought that was a good idea. So that's identified. Um, one of the support actions that we've identified is to have council services and or economic development uh, to continue dialoguing with uh, existing business owners over their concerns and make it be known that the city, um, you know, is, is concerned with the, the problems that they're having in this area. Next, um, another support action is to create a small visitor center. Uh, that would be an initiative from the private sector. Uh, that came from, from the general manager of the Crown Plaza, who hopefully will be here tonight to speak. Uh, the last chapter of the plan is project financing and funding sources. We've organized these by type and, in, and the intent is, is to provide a wide range of op options to pursue. Uh, not all of them will be available for every project, but we've 
uh, really try to have a comprehensive list in the plan. This is the last slide uh, that just continues the same kind of listings. Uh, with that, um, uh, counselors, I, I urge your support. Uh, we appreciate this process and um, I stand ready for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Fishman. And Ms. Morris, Counselor Siebelquist. Um, thank you, Mr. President. So I just want to thank Councillor Gibson for starting this process nearly two years ago and Ms. Pet, uh, Ms. Morris and Ms. Fishman for all the work they've done on it. And the many, many people who are business owners um, and other folks that live in that area that have participated in a two-year long process, I'm just honored to be able to come in here at the end and help push it across the finish line and support the great work that these folks have been doing. So with that, I urge your support. Well, we have a couple of commenters really quickly, I, if they've hung on this long. Councilor, if that's okay. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Joni Jones, followed by Ronald Bohannon. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Council President and Councilors. Um, good evening. Um, I, my, for, my name is Joni Jones. I'm the general manager at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Um, my first employment encounter began in 1993 when the Crown Plaza was known as the Hilton Albuquerque. During that time, I was the director of sales and marketing. My hotel complex has 450 guest rooms we sit on 14 acres of land. We are the largest hotel in the city. At the time, the neighborhood was tourism forward with walkable restaurants, safe bus stops for guests to ride up and down Manal to tourism spots and guests staying at other hotels in the area would walk to our hotel to enjoy our food and beverage and our nightlife, as well as many local people. There are more than 1,500 hotel guest rooms in the MRA, representing 17% of the hotel rooms in Albuquerque. Tourism is the city's second largest private industry. Tourism and hospitality is, this, is a significant contributor to Albuquerque's economy. Over 6 million people visit Albuquerque in a typical year. Visitors spend 2.2 billion annually in Albuquerque and approximately 45,000 people in Bernalillo County work in the hospitality industry. Let's bring back the heart of the city and become guest centric like the good old days. It's our hope that the council supports the, and approves the R2292 legislation. Thank you so much for your time. Ronald Bohannon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron Bohannon. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Albuquerque, and I've uh, watched this area uh, rise and fall. Um, I'm here tonight representing Peter Generis, who owns the Opportunity One site uh, that Jackie Frisch, uh, Fishman uh, presented. It's about nine acres. Um, what's important about the MRA is that is one of the sites that has the landfill underneath it. We have finished our phase one on that landfill. We are now actively starting the characterization and the identification of what is in that landfill to start quantifying it, which will be the very first step towards redevelopment. Uh, Mr. Generis has plans for a multifamily, yes, affordable housing. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the very spirited conversation today. Um, but he also has uh, mixed commercial uh, in this area and he's actually gonna take advantage of the bike trail. I use the bike trail on a weekly basis, uh, go by this area quite often. Uh, so we think this is a very important uh, step to re uh, revitalizing the central core of Albuquerque and we urge your support. Thank you very much. That concludes comment. Thank you, Councilor. Anything else? Councilor, seeing no other discussion, would the clerk please call the roll call? Councilor Passan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Yes. 
Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Grout. Yes. Councillor Jones. Yes. Councillor Lewis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councilor, thank you. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Councillors, we're on our last item this evening. Councillor Lewis, R-128. Mr. President, I move um, R-23-128. If you don't mind, I, it's only a few paragraphs. I want to go ahead and read it. It's like less than a page. Sure. So this is declaring a position on Albuquerque Bernalillo County Air Quality Control Board. Uh, whereas this uh, Albuquerque Bernalillo, Bernalillo County uh, Air Quality Control Board Establishing a process to consider a system to initiate a rule making a petition for 2022-2023. Uh, this type of position uh, can carry significant consequences for the community, not only in terms of promoting air quality, but also in terms of balancing economic impacts, enforceability of air quality rules, and the general integrity of the air quality permitting process. The petition as submitted uh, did not proceed uh, through any pre-petition or stakeholder involvement process prior to its submission to and acceptance by the board. Uh, a pre-petition pro process would have provided opportunities for the public to comment through public listening sessions, public meetings, gathering of written comments, and the opportunity for corresponding revisions. Uh, the petition includes unprecedented mandatory denials of air quality permits under circumstances that do not appear clearly defined, and such process could result in a significant harm to the welfare of the city and the region due to its overbreath. And whereas the city's air quality program has identified that it's unclear how the proposed rule would fit in with the existing air quality permitting rules, and the process and includes ambigu ambigu ambiguities that may render it unenforceable. Uh, so be it resolved by the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, uh, that the city declares that petition 2022-3 uh, could be harmful to the welfare of the city due to the lack of stakeholder involvement that went into its submission and acceptance by the, by the, by the board and due to its potentially broad impacts on the availability of air quality permits based on unclear standard. And Mr. President, whether, I mean, agree with those, with implementing those um, uh, that rule or not, uh, this is a statement, just be a statement by the council about um, uh, of, of following uh, some pr procedures that, um, that uh, the air quality, the federal air quality um, actually recommends. And, um, and in comments, I can read that to you a little bit later. It's actually in the staff write-up. In fact, let me just mention that, um, that the Air Board Rulemaking Guidebook actually explains that uh, persons proposing their own rules may wish to consider the following. It said air quality agencies in the United States typically undertake a number of steps prior to proposing new regulations to a regulatory authority such as the Air Board. And these steps often require months or years to complete. They include obtaining access to technical and legal expertise, performing necessary technical and legal research, writing a draft proposal regu re regulation, sending the draft to affected stakeholders for comment, and revising the draft based on stake, stakeholder comment. So I won't read all of it, but um, uh, the re recommendations of the Air Board's own rulemaking guidebook um, encourages them to take a good long time, uh, a lot of stakeholders involved in this, um, a, a long process uh, for implementing uh, such a, a rule such as this. Um, and, and, and it's clear, I think, with the, the timeline of this and the um, that uh, that may not be the case. And so this gives us an opportunity to make a statement in that regard. I know we have uh, some folks here to speak on this tonight. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Robert Wood, followed by David Otowski. Excuse me. Good evening, Mr. President, council members. Uh, my name is Robert Wood. I'm the president of Albuquerque Asphalt. So we're a local uh, asphalt paver. We do city streets and state highways and stuff. Um, so I wanted to voice my, my opposal of this regulation that's before the Air Quality Board. But the purpose of bringing this to you, you're the city council. Um, this proposal has lots of ripple effects. It's going to affect 
not only my permits uh, on technical revisions, uh, new permits for, for other, other businesses, it's going to impact uh, industrial and commercial property values. It's going to affect zoning, long-term land use. It's going to affect economic development. I want to call you back to the, present, the first presentation tonight. There was a chart. If you, as a city council, look at this chart, I mean, it's, I mean, you're the city council. If that doesn't scare the heck out of you, I don't know what does. This, this thing was not, not planned out. They had no input from industry, none. And it's, it's got lots of ripple effects and we need, to, we need to slow this thing down and get input from Montrose, from other permit holders, um, people that have invested millions of dollars in, in land uh, that's zoned a certain way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. David Otoski, followed by Robert Caldwell. Council President and Council Members, I'm Dave Otoski with Mountain States Constructors, <clears throat> and I'm in full support of this regu regulation. I feel it's extremely important for the future of Albuquerque and Bernalillo County that the Council Members unanimously approve this uh, regulation. Comments were made earlier that all affected stakeholders were afforded the opportunity to participate in the design of the regulation, and that's not true. We've been a permit holder for probably 30 years in Albuquerque, and we were not contacted when this regulation was put into effect. And we're in agreement that things need to be looked at, but at least we need to be afforded the opportunity to have our input, and that was not, uh, that never happened. In fact, I would say the majority of the stakeholders were never contacted when this regulation was proposed. Therefore, I am asking that the full council approve this regulation. Thank you. Robert Caldwell, followed by Jim Garcia. Good evening, council members, president. Um, I'm here, uh, my name is Robert Caldwell, and I'm a uh, owner of uh, Black Rock Services, which is a commercial, commercial aggregate and asphalt producer. Uh, I am in support of resolution R23-128. Um, you know, the process of obtaining an air quality permit is incredibly extensive. Um, I have recently obtained a new permit, and it, took, it was a two-year process. Um, it requires, you know, as you guys heard earlier, uh, Montrose Environmental provided um, a uh, presentation, and, and it's highly technical, and operators and owners of these air quality permits, um, they're pivotal to our industry. They're pivotal to the survival of our organizations. If you look at this uh, simple little chart here that Montrose Environmental put on, if, if the proposed regulation is actually approved as written, we will see a percent decrease of 83.2% of commercial industrial zoning properties. So why do you care? The established rulemaking process and procedures were not followed. The same regulatory processes established by Air Quality Board, industry stakeholders were not notified for input of the rulemaking process until after the Air Quality Board voted to accept to hold a hearing regarding the proposed regulation. Businesses cannot operate under the proposed regulations. New businesses cannot come into our economy that utilize air quality permits to include Sandia National Labs, Kirtland Air Force Base, it will affect hospitals, it will affect numerous industries that rely upon air quality permits. It leads to a loss of taxable revenue. It creates a lack of competition, which drives up all costs that ultimately cost the working New Mexican. Thank you. Jim Garcia, followed by Antoinette Cedillo-Lopez. 
on Zoom. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Jim Garcia. I'm the Executive Director of the Associated Contractors of New Mexico. I represent the heavy highway, heavy civil contractors that build roads and highways in New Mexico. The, pro the proposed regulations are likely to prohibit new or modified facilities in most of all, in fact, all of Bernalillo County. Any prohibition of new or modified facilities will surely have a substantial negative impact on industrial property values and direct economic impact. <clears throat> the proposed regulations will have a definitive impact on schools, hospitals, small businesses, and the entire hospitality community. The air quality proposal has no stakeholder involvement in the process. The permit denials were unclear, and the rules may, are ambiguous and may be unenforceable. We supporting this resolution uh, with Ms. from Mr. Lewis because we think this is the right thing to do to have City Council put some eyes on this. With that, Mr. President and City Council, I ask you to support the petition tonight before you, and I thank you for allowing us the time to speak this evening. Thank you. Antoinette Cedillo Lopez, followed by Xavier Barraza. Good evening. I'm the attorney for the city of Albuquerque Bernalillo County Air, Air Quality Control Board. And the chair of the board has asked me to speak this evening about the, uh, the board's role and why it would not be a good idea for the city council to weigh in on the pending rulemaking. The board was created by state law, which delegates rulemaking authority to the board to regulate air quality in Bernalillo County. Only the Air Quality Control Board may regulate air quality here. Uh, based on federal and state standards. The State Environmental Improvement Board has no authority to regulate air quality in Bernalillo County. While the mayor, the council, and county commission appoint members of the board, they have no oversight authority over the board. The Air Quality Control Board is intentionally independent of local government and is an example of cooperative federalism in that EPA regulations and policies provide federal guidance to the EHD and the board. The EPA evaluates the state's performance under federal law, which can affect federal funds flowing to the state, county, and city. Before this petition was filed, the board announced, about a year before this petition was filed, the board announced at three meetings that it was creating a cumulative impacts committee, and that committee was open to anyone who wanted to participate. EHD staff participated. The committee met for eight months. It produced and shared materials which were posted online, but did not produce a proposed regulation. The board's rules allow any person to propose a regulation to improve air quality and to protect public health. The board has given all parties and the public opportunities to weigh in on the process. The board is designing a pre-hearing process that will encourage the parties to come to agreement on the rules. The board may adopt the proposed regulation, no regulation at all, or an alternative regulation based on the evidence presented at the hearing. Thank you, the your time is up. council resolution also seems to favor a side. When the Ms. City Ms. Lopez, I, I appreciate you, but we have to follow our rules this evening, and I, I hope you'll share that the rest of those comments with us by email. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, we appreciate you. It's good to see you. Mr. President, Council Lewis, Let's move to um, suspend the rules to expend the meeting to 11:30. So we have a motion to extend till 11:30. Is there a second? Second from Councilor Bassan. Any discussion? Seeing none. Will Council. the clerk call? Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. Councilor Benton. Aye. Councilor Fiebelkorn. No. Councilor Grout. Yes. Councilor Jones. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. For the last time, yes. That passes on a seven to two vote. Mr. Right. President. Go ahead. Just a point of order, order. I would just ask that this council would give the people that uh, that waited here for almost six hours and also online the same respect that we gave every single everybody else tonight so, so, thank you here and we have their time so mr. Cornelius next 
Xavier Barraza, followed by Sofia Martinez. Hello, Council President and Council uh, Council Members. My name is Xavier Barraza, and I'm with Los Jardines Institute. Um, we do a lot of social, economic, and environmental research, and its implications on policy, health, and wealth outcomes. And uh, if this resolution is intended to kind of set a narrative for what this regulation is trying to do, it really does that poorly, and it doesn't equip. Um, the residents, uh, the citizens, or this council with really reliable or accurate information as to the developments of this nature of this regulation and the other components that Mr. Dio Lopez outlined regarding legal authority, right, and, and, and what's really happening and, and how the board is absolutely um, operated within its legal authority. Um, and really, anyone who votes to support this resolution beyond the fact that there's really a poor lack of evidence of any cumulative impacts regulation developments, even though they've been heard by the Air Quality Board actually several years ago um, regarding some of the facts around that. Um, I hope council members are asking themselves, what, what is the availability of healthy air and healthy water in the city? And the American Lung Association says that we're failing. Our ozone grade is failing. That's a recent grade. Um, and, and the resolution's inaccurate in saying it's establishing a process. This process has already been established. Um, and, and in fact, if anything, it's trying to clearly obstruct it because it doesn't provide any underlying evidence as to why any of the claims are true or as to any of the significance of the importance of really what's trying to be outlined, which is what I really think the intent is, is to show the significance of this regulation. And it's pretty you know, interesting to think that there's a desire for additional stakeholder input when the hydrogen fuel cell assembly, which is a half billion dollar operation working with metals and chemicals, um, there was never a mention or motion from anyone on this council around looking for additional stakeholder engagement and its impacts, considering most of the river and communities downstream are already disproportionately impacted. Finally, the White House Council on Environmental Justice, on behalf of the president, says that cumulative impacts are a top priority. Hope to for this city as well. Thank you. Sophia Martinez, followed by Marla Painter. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, Chair Davis, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee and the public, my name is Sofia Martinez. Um, uh, bill number 20, R23-128 is a disingenuous political move by industry to Councillor Lewis. We ask that you do not support this industry tactic. Andrew Tree has used this narrative which mirrors the language of this bill in the last several months in fighting this hearing process. I find it industry that I find it interesting that industry is taking the position that the community has always been in. We as community are never contacted by this regulatory processes. We rarely know about these kinds of processes until we have a polluting industry in our communities. The scare tactics outlined by Councillor Lewis in this bill too are disingenuous and telling. Industry has at least three lawyers right now challenging the Air Board, attempting to disqualify board members and their process, pretending that somehow they have been wrong, pushing scary economic scenarios that are not, uh, and, and that they have not been involved in the public process, et cetera. The Bernalillo Albuquerque Air Quality Board has been addressing the idea of cumulative impact in their agendas before and finally announcing on their website and available to all the public an invitation to participate in a stakeholder process to discuss this issue. Many responded and participated in this process. Industry, like I say, which now has three lawyers has attempted to disrupt this process, going as far as to challenge the integrity of members and the board and attempting to have some members removed from the board. I don't think the council would appreciate these kinds of moves. The Albuquerque Bernalillo Air Quality Board is an independent body, as has been stated, and as such has the right to schedule and develop their agenda and work, just as does the city council. A regulatory process will allow all parties to state their position, relying on the board to make an educated and objective decision based on the evidence presented to them and resulting in an or ordinance that will protect our environment and address issues of climate justice and change. The hearing is a rulemaking process. I don't understand why council, the council member Lewis would want to disrupt a democratic process where all parties can participate. Thank you, ma'am. Ultimately, this is about protecting our health and the health Thank of Thank you. We have to move on to our next speaker. We appreciate your comments. Thank you. Marla Painter, followed by Richard Moore. 
Good evening, uh, Chairman. Um, I'm sorry, President. I'm used to the County Commission. Uh, President Davis and Councilors. Uh, my name is Marla Painter. I live in the Mountain View neighborhood in the South Valley in the county. I'm president of the Mountain View uh, Community Action, a recognized county neighborhood association, and also a member of the Mountain View Coalition. Um, we are feeling like this is so outrageous that the city council would interfere with a democratic process, an official democratic process, with some kind of a um, official resolution that is um, interfering with um, a legal process. And those hearings, as was mentioned, those are the public process. We have had numerous meetings over the years, and this has been, we followed all of the things that Councillor Lewis suggested. We've been working on this for years and years. And um, we have to address a very crucial health situation in our neighborhood and in other vulnerable communities in the county, including in the city. Most of you know very little about the reasoning and the science behind this, behind this regulation because we haven't ha yet had the public hearing to present our case to the Bernalillo County Albuquerque Air Quality Board so, and to the public. So without having been involved in the development of this proposal, how can you possibly presume to understand how it would work and impact and the impact it would have on the well-being of the people who, do, who some of you represent, some of you do not. Um, it appears that you're acting as agents and lobbyists, those of you who, who support this resolution, for air polluting industries, industries that we have invited over and over for many years to join us to develop a remedy to this problem. I encourage you not to support this resolution. Richard Moore, followed by Terry Storch. Yeah, good evening, uh, council members. Uh, my name is Richard Moore. I'm co-coordinator of Los Sardinas Institute. Uh, Los Sardinas Institute is a citywide and uh, statewide environmental and economic justice grassroots organization. Um, uh, our, our team, the Los Sardinas team, along with our volunteers, our supporters and our allies, have been working on civil rights, environmental, economic, health, social and racial justice issues for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. Uh, it is our experience uh, that we have only seen in a few cases uh, where industry contacted the community before applying for a permit to get the, 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 the community's input um, into uh, the process of that permit. We talk about democracy and this was talked about earlier, uh, but the resolution will take away our right to participate in a democratic process. Had, has industry been cut out of the process? No, unless we're imagining things. Uh, we just attended a meeting at the Mountain View Community Center several weeks ago uh, where industry had the opportunity to ask questions, uh, participate in, in a dialogue amongst parties and so on. Um, so again, upon again, upon again, um, if, if you all um, agree to support uh, 23128, you are taking away our democratic rights to for full participation in this process so thank you and uh and have a blessed evening terry storch followed by sophia jenkins nieto hey um thank you mr president and city council members i'm terry storch and i live in the near north valley in city council district two but i go to the area of Mountain View, um, visit the Valle del Oro, friends who live there. And frankly, anything that has to do with um, healthy air quality is of interest to everyone in the city and everyone in the county. I found myself wondering how usual it is for the Albuquerque City Council to attempt to pass judgment on or influence the business of an independent agency and one that is a city and a county agency like the Air Quality Control Board um, before the board has even acted. Um, it seems that it's not even ripe for the city council to pronounce on it. I see resolution 23128 as an attempt to do just that. Um, Councilor Feeblecorn, Speaker Alan Marks, and others have all voiced many of the obvious points about why this resolution should be rejected. First, it's much ado about nothing. The citizen proposed regulation was legitimately brought before the Albuquerque Control Board. Industry was invited to participate early on, but regardless of whether they did, 
there will be public hearings where they will have an opportunity to participate and have their experts testify. The regulation as written may very well be modified. So the resolution's implication is that somehow this is a done deal, which it's not. So the best that can be said about this resolution is that it is indeed an attempt to somehow influence the outcome or the actions of the Air Quality Control Board. Second, if the resolution is meant to influence them, then it doesn't seem to do a good job about it because it's very dismissive of the board's expertise and professionalism in holding a hearing and making um, informed decisions on technical issues. The um, Handle with Care resolution passed by the board positively endorsed this resolution should not be ensconced as something denounced by the city council. Please vote against it. Thank you. Sophia. Oops. Almost. Sophia Jenkins Nieto. Good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Sophia. I live in District 6, and I also work with Youth United for Climate Crisis Action. I'm here to ask you to vote no on this resolution. The resolution undermines and ignores the work that has been done to put together the Health, Environment, and Equity Impacts Regulation. I've participated in public comment. The, the community has been very involved with the public procedures, so the claim that there is no stakeholder involvement, like others have said, seems to me like pandering to industry. There's historically been an oversaturation of air quality permits being approved, and it's extremely important that we look into all impacts that communities are facing before we place more burdens on them, before we approve more air permits. The people on the front lines of air pollution have spoken up for a long time, asking for basic protections. The regulation is a major step in the right direction for protecting the health and, envir and the environment in the city of Albuquerque, and I can't emphasize that enough. I don't care if it's difficult for industry to obtain an air quality permit. It should be difficult. It's more difficult for our community, for elders and children to have high rates of asthma, to have constant noise in their, in their neighborhoods from industry, and to have more and more of that in their communities. The EPA has been doing research on cumulative impacts since 1979, and this is nothing new. Another major concern of mine, which has already been mentioned, is that this resolution is trying to override democracy. The Air Board has their own jurisdiction and can make their own rulings, and the EIB has declared this as well. The correct process was followed, as previous speakers have stated. I urge you to vote no on Resolution 128 tonight. Thank you. Alejandria Lyons. Good evening, President and members of the Council. Um, thank you all for hearing us tonight. My name is Alejandria Lyons. I'm the Coalition Coordinator with New Mexico No False Solutions. Um, I'm here tonight to kind of give some background uh, why I oppose um, this resolution. Um, back was when I was with the Southwest Organizing Project, um, we actually worked with members of um, San Jose community and Councillor Ike Benton to get cumulative impacts um, in the IDO. And we had the same kind of pushback from industry then. And I think this is you know, pretty telling. I would like the city to take another look at this because over the last 50 years, we've seen an increase in air quality permits. And that's really the reason why there is a lack of availability, right? But and on the other hand, communities like San Jose, like in the county Mountain View have been dealing with the pollution. And we have done our research. Um, the Air Quality Control Board has the right to promulgate rules. And this is overstepping democracy, this resolution. Uh, we've done a lot of research so much so that there was even a Title VI complaint filed back in 2014 by the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. And the EPA has done investigations on the city. And I think that all the counselors have a job to do in looking at this because this is part of the discrimination that environmental justice communities have been standing up and saying, hey, we need cumulative impacts. This has gone from the alternative dispute resolution when we were doing the EJ task force. And I just hope you all see the need to um, vote no on this resolution and really look into the history um, as well as looking into the legal piece about how this is really truly overstepping the air quality control board. So thank you all for hearing us tonight. Mr. President, that concludes public comment. Thank you, Council Lewis, we're back on the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Certainly respect everyone's you know comments tonight and. Um, thanks everybody for um, staying and waiting through everything to 
here this last bill. Um, I believe this really promotes democracy, and that's certainly the the intent of it, and that's what it does. I mean, that's it's it's asking for um, for us to. I mean, we we are a part of the democracy. That's a part of these decisions that are made, and so uh, d democracy is us being able to weigh in on it. <laughs> Uh, give our opinions on it, as well as everybody else having the hearing tonight before this. And so, uh, in fact, this is about transparency. It's about full participation. Um, you know, voting for this resolution is not uh, a vote for or against that regulation or that rule. Um, it's really just three things. It's, it's recognizing that there wasn't a pre-petition uh, stakeholder involvement process, um, that, that the rule does include these unprecedented uh, mandatory denials of air quality permits that uh, the circumstances aren't clearly defined there. Um, and then that there's some ambiguities that may make it unenforceable. And so it recognizes some things about it. Um, and uh, uh, it's an opportunity for us to be able to weigh in um, and certainly promote more transparency, full participation, and a whole lot of democracy in the process. Thank you. Councilors, any questions? Councilor Feeblecorn. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I had a couple questions for the um, Environmental Health Department, if the director is still available. He's still here. Thank you for staying so late. Um, so it's my understanding that, well, let me, start, let me back up. As a person that worked on a proposal for this board last year and worked very hard and had it rejected, I do know that individuals and, and citizens and nonprofit groups can propose their own roles, rules um, if the Air Quality Board is not doing what they think is the right thing to do on an issue. Is that your understanding, Director? Um, yeah, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Fubelcorn, that, that's correct. So Anyone the, can present a petition to the Air Board. So the only difference between the petition that I did that got rejected and the petition that was accepted by the Air Quality Board is that there's probably was better written and more uh, meaningful in some way. Um, so can you... Mr. President, can you, can, can you explain to me why the city of Albuquerque didn't propose a rule on this issue? Um, we have a, a frontline community that is definitely a Justice 40 um, type of place that has been living with serious environmental impacts on their health and on the health of their children for decades. And we did not act. We left it up to the citizens who live there to propose their own rule. Why didn't the city do that? Um, yeah, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councillor Fubelcorn. Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't exactly that that happened, essentially. You know, when I got here, I've been here a year. Um, you know, the mandate to me from the mayor was actually to get out to the streets and find out, talk to the communities, talk to the businesses, and then really talk, you know, begin the dialogue on environmental justice issues. You know, so we did do that, you know, and we, we stayed in, active throughout the uh, this whole year with them. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, you all gave us some money last year, like $300,000, and asked for that money to essentially gather the data and the information about, you know, where our, you know, worst areas were uh, as far as underserved and overly impacted by environmental stressors, you know, because I think you, you can take a look at the county and have a cursory understanding, but in order to make a regulation, that data, you have to have it presented and it has to be enforceable and you have to essentially be able to reference that. So we spent a lot of time doing that. You know, around August, um, you know, as, as they were talking about, because there, there was workshops, EHD was involved, and then we had started talking to some of the industry, some of the permit holders, you know, like PNM and some of the bigger ones, about the concepts and essentially their, their feelings about environmental justice. And they understand that this is here to stay. It's not going to go away. So generally speaking, you know, we didn't get negative feedback from them. So the process continued. About August 1st, you know, I met with the groups and I said, okay, if you guys don't have something together, you know, EHD has begun putting together their own regulation. And so there was a parallel process. Um, you know, what happened essentially is that the community made, you know, the first jump at the petition prior to us. You know, and so essentially that's what we have here. Um, you know, and, and, and it, um, if that makes sense, I mean, they, so the petition was heard by the Air Board, it was accepted, and then they did um, agree and voted that they would provide a hearing for, for the petition. And so essentially now we're, we're probably, we're in this holding pattern now. Um, I've never presented a dual petition, you know, to the Air Quality Control Board. I'm not actually sure how that would even work, you know, having um, dueling petitions and arguing, you know, one side, you know, pro and the other side, you know, against, and then, you know, switch it over. You know, so essentially what, you know, what we're looking at right now, EHD, is that, 
you know, and we understand the intent of the resolution. We really do. I mean, you quote some of our comments on there about the regulation within the petition. But while we understand the intent, you know, um, we kind of disagree with some of the language, essentially because, uh, you know, because it references the petition and not necessarily the regulation. And the petition is monumental in the sense that it was brought by the communities. You know, and so when we started looking at the data, I mean, really the tale of two cities is what happens south of I-40 and north of I-40. You know, people essentially south of I-40 have been impacted tremendously over the decades, you know, through the permitting process and what have you. And so, you know, there is concern with that. So to us, you know, it's monumental that the communities brought this forward and it's important to them, you know, and so for us, as, you know, we're in support of that aspect of it. Obviously, you know, we're gonna be a party as the hearing happens. So to us, I think, you know, a more productive way of presenting maybe a resolution would be to essentially push the Air Board to hold the hearing a lot faster because it's been five months since the petition was presented and there's no date for the hearing. So we think that those discussions need to happen sooner than later because that petition's in place, you know, unless the community withdraws it, it's gonna have to be heard. So for us, the sooner we can get to the, to the arguments and the discussions, you know, I think the better and then everybody gets their opportunity to, uh, to participate in the process. Thank you, Mr. President. Couple questions, a couple more questions, sorry. Um, I just wanna reiterate what I heard you say. We went out to PM and to other large industrial permit holders and asked them how they feel about environmental justice. Correct. Is that really a necessary step? I, well, seriously, you know, it, it, and it, let me just finish my sure. thought. Um, we have a Justice 40 group that has been formed in the city of Albuquerque. Um, the federal government has said that we have to do um, all we can to incorporate environmental justice into all of our work. And our mayor has, has backed that up and formed a Justice 40 initiative in the city of Albuquerque. Um, I'm not sure that wasting the time of asking large industrial users how they feel about environmental justice is what we should have been doing. I feel like we should have been developing a rule so that we would not be in this position that we're in here tonight with a rule that could have been staved off by a, by a middle ground rule from the city of Albuquerque and we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Um, so can I just ask why we are not going to move forward your rule within this case? Um, this rulemaking can have um, proposals included in it that are slightly variances on, on the rule that was proposed by the community. Why wouldn't we do that? Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn, I, I think it's where we are in, in the process. You know, the petition's there, so we would have to submit a separate petition. The merits of the regulation haven't been discussed. You know, while we've read it and we've made initial comments on, on what we think are, you know, somewhat serious deficiencies within the regulation, you know, the open discussion for the, of the merits hasn't, been, hasn't happened yet. And so that needs to happen. When that happens, then we would be able to bring up all these issues in a more technical manner and you know, and essentially explain where the where we think the deficiencies are, and what, where we think things can be fixed. But it's where we are in the process. So the sooner the hearing happens, the sooner those arguments can begin. Thank you, Mr. President. So I am one hundred percent sure that you can submit your petition within this rulemaking. Um, it's been done before. There's no reason that we couldn't do it now. When this rulemaking begins, the city of Albu Albuquerque should present their petition to the Air Quality Board. Uh, is that your plan? Mr. President, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn, you know, I've never seen it done with the Air Quality Control Board. It's, 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 different. it's a different setup. They have a very rigid regulatory review structure. It's not like, say, the legislature where you can start at the Senate and, and you know, the, the, the House and then essentially something falls off or essentially how it goes to the City Council. Their process is very different, you know. It's very singular in, in nature. So I've been talking with legal and how essentially you know, dual, you know, dueling sort of petitions would work with the Air Quality Control Board because they don't have the same process as the city council nor the legislative bodies. Mr. President, it, this is not a question. I'm telling you that this can be done. I urge you to speak with the Air Quality Control Board um, officials to make that happen so that we are not continually in this position of we're going to go through this rulemaking that no one likes um, and then we're gonna have to go through it again. There is a rulemaking process that has been started, quite frankly, because the city of Albuquerque didn't start it for them. And it is time that the city move 
propose something that works and get involved in this process. Thank you, Mr. President. Councilors, other comments before we go back to the sponsor? Let me just add my two cents and I'll be done. Um, I just don't think this is our fight. We don't have jurisdiction. It's not our thing. I mean, we do have a voice. I'm not, the, the, the resolution in my opinion is not improperly brought. I just don't think this is our forum. Um, there is a forum for this and the Air Quality Board is independent of us. It has its own rules, its own jurisdiction. Um, like we don't have a fight here and I'm uninclined as one government to tell another government what to do in their own jurisdiction when we don't share that authority. Um, so for that reason alone, I will vote to oppose this. Um, and, but I share some of Council Feeblecorn's concerns that I think we've really missed the opportunity to be the leader on this. Um, and Director, it's not under, it started before you, we're, we're long term into the second term of an administration who's been Supposed to have an environmental justice plan since the first day, um, and has in some respects really made some some progress and helped us uh, in many ways. But I think this is a conversation that I know has been going on with that neighborhood, in particular for yeah, she says a decade. I was thinking a little longer than that, um, and it's a real missed opportunity for the city to be a leader on that issue. And so I do think we're here because of that. So, Councilor Lewis, hey, Mr. President, and uh, this is um, no certainly worth the discussion tonight. So uh, thanks for allowing us to have this. Um, uh, this is not making a decision for the Air Quality Board. Uh, it's weighing in entirely appropriate. I think if we asked our legal and they'd say over and over again, this is absolutely appropriate uh, for us to be weighing in on discussing and certainly given, you know, a forum for, you know, folks at, in our city to be able to uh, be heard on this. And Director, uh, thank you. I, I, I think what I heard you say tonight is that uh, uh, that your department in the city of Albuquerque did not propose this rule. Uh, I guess, you know, the Council of Corn was trying to make the case that you should have, uh, but the fact is you did not. Uh, and because I don't believe that uh, you believe that you should. Um, I think you also believe that there are some, some very serious problems with this rule. Um, and which is also why I'm not going to ask you uh, to specifically tell me which words in this resolution that you disagree with because honestly sir I don't believe you disagree with anything in this resolution because I think that your bosses would probably be um, a little concerned about that you know um, if you took a stand uh, for this, these rules or if you took a stand I guess against them you know but the fact is is that you didn't propose it because you don't truly support it you know um, but the fact is this resolution is not saying whether we support this or not it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's weighing in and saying, hey, uh, these are some some pretty big uh, rules uh, that are pending, uh, and let's put the right uh, transparent process in place, and we encourage the board to do that. So I urge your support. Councilor, seeing no other discussion and the clock being so close, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Benton. No. Councilor Fubelcorn. No. Councilor Grout. Yes. Yes. Councilor Jones. Councilor Lewis. Yes. Councilor Pena. Councilor Pena. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Councilor Davis. No. That passes on a five to three vote. That being our last item of business this evening, this meeting is adjourned.